Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. President, a committee has lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, and the question, uh, call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, appropriation bill number one, 2022-23, and two related bills, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McGrath. President. I rise to speak on the Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2022-23, Appropriation Bill No. 2, 2022-23, and Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2022-23. The Opposition will support the passage of these bills to ensure the continued functioning of government and so Australians can continue to benefit from the essential services that the Commonwealth provides. However, the Opposition is deeply concerned with the government's first budget. In short, it was a missed opportunity. It left Australians shortchanged. In a cost of living crisis, the government couldn't find a single policy, not one that would deliver immediate support to Australians doing it tough. In fact, by Christmas, the average Australian family will be at least $2,000 worse off under this Labor government. Before the election, Anthony Albanese was clear with the Australian people, and I quote, I'll say this very clearly. They, Australians, will be better off under a Labor government than they will be under a Morrison government. End quote. This budget, with the names of the Treasurer and the Finance Minister on the front in blue and white, pr proves that that was a lie. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, it will see electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 for households by 2025. End of quote. That quote that promise was said 97 times, but this budget proves that that lie was a strong lie by Mr Albanese. Instead, we can see in this budget that electricity and gas prices will skyrocket over the coming two years. Retail electricity prices by over 50 per cent and retail gas prices by 40 per cent. And perhaps most relevant this week, as the government is forcing its job-destroying anti-small business and industrial relations reforms through the parliament, this budget confirms that under the government's policy settings, including its IR legislation, Labor's forecasts reveal that real wages will fall over the coming years. Put simply, this government demonstrates that you cannot trust anything that Labor says. They are a party of broken promises. And we should not be surprised. A leopard cannot change its spots, and Labor will always cost you more. As the Treasurer said, this is a standard bread and butter Labor budget. But Labor's bread and butter is higher taxes and higher spending. And it is evident here. 
Under Labor, the tax paid by Australians will increase by $142 billion over the Ford estimates, and there will be a new $555 million tax on retiree investors. The, the tax to GDP cap of 23.9 per cent, which the former coalition government put in place to ensure that Australians weren't hit by the invisible thief bracket creep, goes out the window. And Labor has exceeded its pre-election spendathon. Instead of spending an additional $18 billion on new policies, not one of which will provide immediate cost of living relief to Australians, Labor actually has hit $23 billion. Again, higher taxes, higher spending, and that is all that Labor knows. This is a $23 billion spend on that will push up inflation, forcing the Reserve Bank Governor to use the only tool available to him, and that is to increase interest rates. This government's reckless spending is forcing the RBA to ratchet up interest rates, and mortgagees are feeling it. Rate rises every month since this government has come to power, each one making it harder, Mr Deputy President, for Australians to pay their mortgage, buy groceries, pay their bills, all thanks to this Labor government. The opposition acknowledges that the October budget includes some measures that we will support and, indeed, have already supported through this parliament. Assistance to victims of devastating floods, reducing pharmaceutical benefit scheme co-payment to lower the cost of medicines. There are others outlined in the opposition leader's budget address and reply delivered in the other place. However, when taken as a whole, this budget fails the test. Indeed, it even fails Labor's own tests set by themselves. This budget breaks many of the promises the government made before the election. It lets Australia down. Australians were promised cost of living relief. Sorry, Australians were promised cost of living relief, but just in time for Christmas, they see that this government has no plan to help them. So the opposition will be supporting the appropriation bills, but we remain committed to holding the government to account over the promises it made to the Australian people. Australians expect it. Australians deserve it. Thank you. Senator Cox. In the Albanese Labor government's first budget, there was over $40 billion in fossil fuel subsidies, over $1.9 billion for the toxic petrochemical plant as part of the Middle Arm precinct, and $2 billion for new gas. Labor is showing Australians their love for dirty fossil fuel projects, and they're in fact no different from the coalition. It's far from being sustainable and the so-called Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct in the middle of Darwin Harbour is planned to be a gas-fed petrochemical hub that poses serious environmental and health risks to those surrounding in the surrounding area. The industries that this government has slated for this development at Middle Arm include petrochemicals, gas processing, critical minerals processing and carbon capture and storage, which we all know is a bit of a myth. So don't let the name of this precinct fool you. It is, in fact, a fossil fuel project. The Petroni report estimates that the industrial hub itself could increase the Northern Territory's emissions by 75 per cent. But worse, it will increase the demand for some of the most polluting fossil fuel projects in Australia. Fracking in the Beetaloo Basin and drilling the offshore Barossa gas field, this dirty gas is required to drive the petrochemical development. And these onshore and offshore projects in these fields will be exploited with gas running through those pipelines direct into Middle Arm. Exploiting the Beetaloo Basin alone could increase Australia's total emissions by 20 per cent at a time when we need to be transitioning to net zero. Comparable petrochemical precincts in the US, such as the one in Louisiana, have been dubbed Cancer Alley. That's what they are called. Now, modelling shows that Middle Arm could increase industrial air pollution by over 500 per cent in both Darwin and Palmerston, resulting in $75 million of additional health impacts. Direct links, no different, not separating them. This project is only three kilometres from Palmerston, where locals will be inhaling toxins produced at Middle Arm. And this project could increase industrial cancer hazards in Darwin and Palmerston fourfold. We see an 800 per cent increase in carbon monoxide being released into the greater Darwin region and significantly increasing releases of other harmful chemicals that have been linked to both heart disease, respiratory conditions and, in fact, strokes. 
Middle Arm, just like many other projects that this government is throwing money at, is a dirty fossil fuel project that does not deserve the Australian public's money. When many Australians are struggling to pay their rent, their mortgages, put food on their table and fuel in their car, this government is now handing out public funds to foreign-owned companies who will destroy our natural environments and wreck our climate. When many Australians, in fact, can't afford to um, access health care, this government is lining the pockets of billionaires who are making us, in fact, sicker and needing that health care. So while the government loves to give money to billionaires and much of that investment in Australian fossil fuel projects comes from overseas investors such as Japan and South Korea. Now, the resources minister from the other place was in Japan recently uh, assuring foreign companies about their investment in Australia's fossil fuel is warmly welcomed here in Australia as part of Middle Arm Precinct is one of those 114 fossil fuel projects that's currently in the pipeline for expansion. Public money for Middle Arm amplifies the public money for Beetaloo and the Barossa basins to in fact be fracked and those gas fields to be opened up. These projects all depend on each other. They are may all in fact making and achieving net zero fantasy in this country. Both the federal and the territory governments have committed large amounts of public money to middle arm already. Of the money that has already been spent, it's gone directly into the pockets of these fossil fuel companies like Santos, for instance. Now, Santos have received $100 million in the previous federal government budget for carbon capture and storage. So I'm not even going to get into that yarn because we don't even have enough time today. But the previous federal government announced the $1.5 billion for this precinct in April. And the current resources minister couldn't wait, in fact, to get on a helicopter sponsored by Santos and head up there in the first few weeks to support this funding continuing. This is what we hear from the locals. She didn't even have the decency to contact her Labor colleagues from this jurisdiction to let them know she was flying in on this wonderful helicopter. The Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development Minister, Minister King, said on October 25 that while the funding commitment to the Middle Arm industrial area was previously committed by the Coalition, Labor would be funding it not as a potential defence project but rather to get hydrogen and other goods in. It's a very, very vague comment from the Minister. So it may be for hydrogen, maybe, potentially, possibly are all those scenarios that she's floated. And it's one of the things that's been talked about only as a possibility. What she wasn't talking about is the fossil fuel that this project will actually support and use. So the Labor government wants an equity fund for this project, and they want a com the Commonwealth to have a stake in it. The Northern Territory government claims to be developing a globally competitive, sustainable development zone for low emission petrochemicals, renewable hydrogen, carbon capture and storage and minerals processing. And all of that language is greenwashing, all of it. Because I don't even know how you get low emission petrochemicals when I've just outlined the health impacts for people living in Darwin and Palmerston who are less than three kilometres away. So this government today has a very important decision to make. Do they continue to throw billions of dollars at projects that wreck the climate, destroy the natural environments and the cultural heritage of this precinct, and ultimately make Australians sick who live in the direct area? Or do they commit with the same intensity to use public funds to transition this country to a cleaner future with renewable energy? Australians are demanding a green future. They, in fact, are sick and tired of governments using greenwash language and continuing to use the Australian public's money to prop up a dying industry in this country. Thank you. Well, go on. Okay. Minister, please sum up the debate. 
Thanks, Deputy President. Um, I want to thank everybody who's contributed to uh, the debate on Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2022-2023, the Appropriation Bill No. 2, 2022-23, and the Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2022-2023. The bills seek authority from the Parliament for appropriations from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for endorsed March 2022 budget measures, 2022 election commitments and other decisions taken by the government in the October 2022 budget. They build on the appropriations already provided in the first set of the 2022-2023 Supply Act, containing broadly five twelfths of the 2022-2023 annual appropriations to support the ongoing business of government and the additional 2022-2023 supply bills containing the remaining seven twelfths of the 2022-2023 annual appropriations for the ongoing business of government. In introducing these bills, the government has already highlighted some of the more significant measures provided for in these bills. The total of the appropriations sought through these three bills is approximately $13.6 billion. These are the principal bills that underpin the 2022-2023 October budget. It is indeed the first Labor budget in nearly a decade, a budget that builds a better future and a budget that I and all who sit on this side of the chamber are extremely proud of. It is a responsible budget that delivers on the Albanese government's election commitments, delivering targeted cost of living relief and investing in Australia's future. Uh, I understand that there is uh, an amendment to come. Uh, we'll, of course, deal with that uh, amendment uh, in due course. Let me just say that there is a very, uh, very good reasons for um, the, uh, this party of government uh, and other parties to support a consistent approach uh, to supply bills. Uh, and I know that um, one previous senator here was fond of, uh, for a period, of uh, moving uh, amendments to uh, these bills to make. Uh, political points and partisan speeches, um, and of course, uh, people have got a right, uh, indeed, to do that. There is an important set of principles here, though, uh, and um, speeches and um, you know posts for Facebook are one thing. Um, actually, making sure that that supply bills make their way through here in a way that's consistent with the institutional arrangements is actually pretty important. Uh, for, the, for the proper functioning uh, of government. Uh, so we'll go through those debates. When we go to those debates, I commend uh, the uh, appropriations bills uh, to the Senate uh, and, uh, and look forward to the Senate support. I put the question that the bill will now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2022-23, Appropriation Bill No. 2, 2022-23, Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2022-2023. Honourable Senators, an amendment has been circulated in relation to Appropriation Bill No. 2. We will now go into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. We have an amendment standing in the name of Senator Cox. So I give Senator Cox the call. I move the amendment on sheet 1770, standing in my name. Do you wish to speak to it? Yes, please. This, this was a very clear opportunity for this government to do the right thing by Australians. As I said in my speech, this is their first budget, six months into their first term, after being nearly a decade in opposition. Listening to the coalition hand out money left, right and centre to their mates in big business, in fossil fuel companies, to shore up their donations 
for every election to make sure that that continued. And the Australian public thought that at this last election they had an opportunity to put a government in place that would look after them, that would see public money go into public services for the benefit of Australians, not for public money to be propping up fossil fuel projects. When the world is saying, do not open any up any more coal or gas projects, this government are deaf to that. They are continuing not to listen to the science, not to listen to the experts, not to listen to anybody, and to continue the legacy of the, of the opposition. Those opposite who, who gave out all the money to start with, they just came into government, sailed in in May and continued their legacy, continued to give out our money, the public's money, to these fossil fuel companies and then take the language off their website so that no one will question that, greenwash the language to continue the dirty fossil fuel industry that is continuing to thrive when their own cabinet minister says the gluttony of greed is what's driving the gas prices in this country is what's happening. So we've got the good cop, bad cop scenario happening over here at Labor because we've got one cabinet minister saying one thing and another saying a different thing. We want net zero. Well, when? When are you going to transition this industry? When are you going to put renewable infrastructure in place and you have an opportunity to do that by not continuing to expand fossil fuel projects in this country? And Middle Arm is the prime example of that. We have an opportunity today to vote for the Australian people who want to see their public money used in the right way. They want to hold Labor to account. And that's what we're doing here on the crossbench, is making sure that those folks watching out there understand the amount of money that is being provided in this equity fund to Santos and other companies who have record profits in the first quarter of this year. And we've got government still giving them our money. Are you happy for me to go to the opposition? Yeah. Yeah. Senator McGrath. Uh, th thank you. The opposition will not be supporting this amendment. This is typical of, of the Australian Greens. In, in a budget delivered by Labor that shows gas prices and energy prices will rise, the Greens want to reduce the supply of gas. Uh, the Greens talked about doing the right things by Australians. Well, the right thing to do to stand by Australians is to make sure they have affordable electricity in 2023 going onwards and, and stopping the development of, of gas supply in this country will mean that electricity and power prices will go up. The Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct is a resource-rich area that can deliver additional energy and minerals through a new gas reserve, critical mineral reserves including copper and lithium, which are necessary to build the batteries that will assist in the supply of renewable energy. It will also have optimal carbon dioxide emissions opportunities. This is what this project is about. This is a project that was, was pushed by the former coalition government. It is an idea that was pushed by, by the ministers and by the, 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 the CLP in the Northern Territory as something that will benefit all of Australia. So it is disappointing that the Greens are so detached from reality. They, they are attempting to torpedo a project that presents an opportunity to create jobs and will assist in securing Australia's energy supply into the future. We will not be, we will not be supporting uh, this amendment. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for that. This, um, the government will provide $1.9 billion in planned equity to support the development of the Middle Arm Precinct. Um, we will do that uh, together with regional logistics hubs along key transport lists. This is not a subsidy for, for, for fossil fuels. This is, this is a serious commitment 
to uh, industrial infrastructure uh, in that region. Now, uh, the difference between us and the Greens political party on these questions is that what the government, what the government sets out to do is to reduce emissions consistent with the targets uh, that we've that we've set, uh, the targets that we took, the targets that we took to the election, um, the targets that we have a mandate uh, to introduce, the targets that were supported by the most uh, sophisticated economic modelling done by an opposition party coming into government. Now, what, what we intend to do is, yes, to reduce emissions, yes, to put downward pressure on the price of power, but the, but the thing that's missing from the Greens party's position here, one of the key areas of difference, of course, is that we intend to press on with the industrial diversification of the Australian economy. That means that means more blue-collar jobs in regional areas. That means Senator Cox, more Senator industrial Cox, diversification. You can rip a charge. So that means me minister, me minister. more Senator factories. Cox, you can rip a charge on your, when I give you the call. Thank, thank you. That means more factories, more manufacturing. That means investing in the technologies and the industrial infrastructure that, we may, that mean we have the capacity to export green hydrogen. Uh, that we have the capacity to feed into global supply chains. Now, you can't have it both ways. Um, what we intend to do is to invest in this kind of infrastructure that supports that kind of industrial development. Now, I know some people don't like industrial development. They don't like factories. They don't like manufacturing. But this government is determined to press on uh, with this, and on the basis on that basis but also on the basis that I uh, outlined uh, in the summing up speech at the end of the second reader uh, debate, uh, I urged uh, the Senate to reject the amendment. Senator Cox, do you want the call? Does any other honourable senator wish to make a contribution? I'm, I'm intending to put the question, so if any honourable senator wishes to make a contribution, please do so now. No honourable senator has indicated they wish to make a contribution. I'm going to put the question. I'm putting the question that the amendment be agreed to. The amendment is the amendment moved by Senator Cox. It will stand in the name of Senator Cox on amendment number one on sheet 1770. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is the division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that the amendment standing the name of Senator Cox on sheet 1770 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Those for the no to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator McKim, and teller for the no, Senator Scar. Senators, there being 13 ayes and 24 noes, it's passed in the negative. Does any honourable senator have a further contribution in the committee of the whole? I intend to put the subsequent questions. Senator Roberts, uh, senator Roberts yes. Th thank senator you, Cook. Chair. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, the people who make up our amazing Queensland community, I speak to these appropriation bills and make these comments and ask a few questions. After six months in power, this government has earned a solid C for chaotic. Bills are being brought forward, then dropped. Then they're back. Amendments are flying around faster than cash, Australian cash at a G20 meeting. Sitting hours seem to be nothing more than a mission statement. This is amateur hour. Queenslanders have every right to ask what good is having a Labor Prime Minister and a Labor Premier in Anastasia Palaszczuk when the Premier allows the Treasurer to take money from Queensland and use it to buy votes in Victoria. Now that Dan Andrews has been re-elected, can I please ask the Treasurer for Queensland's money back, please? Can Queensland have the $5 billion funding back for Hellsgate Dam, $500 million for Urana Dam, funding for Hewan and Agricultural Area and the $120 million for Emu Swamp Dam, so that our wonderful farmers in Queensland can have the water they need to grow food and fibre and feed and clothe the world. Seriously, what has this government got against farmers, against people wearing natural fabrics and eating good natural food, healthy food, clean food? No funding for new dams? Really? That doesn't pass the pub test. When growing food to feed the hungry is a noble occupation, this government is treating farmers like a problem. Ideology-based, city-centric policy is the problem. Farmers are not the problem. Hellsgate Dam will secure Townsville's water supply and ensure the growing precincts of Abbott Point and Murrumbah will have the water they need to make all that beautiful steel to build the world over the next 30 years. Can Queensland have the $800 million back for the Rockhampton Ring Road, a project that was going ahead with land purchased, equipment purchased, people buying houses to work in Rockhampton on this ring road project, suddenly the, wool, the rug gets pulled from, out, out from under them. 
Northern Queensland is a booming economic powerhouse, and constraining access through Rockhampton is both dangerous, hazardous, and, to put it simply, bloody-minded stupidity. Can Queensland please have the $800 million back for the Rockhampton Ring Road that was stolen and taken down to Dan shore up Dan Andrews in his election campaign? Minister, has this government done the sums on how much Queensland pays in taxes to the federal government, including in GST, and how much we're getting back? It does not seem to me like the people of Queensland are getting a fair go as compared to other states, especially when Queensland, we are the lion's share of our national economy's number one export income earner, coal. The question is that the bill stand as printed. So those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Report from Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered The committee has considered the appropriation bill number 2, 222 to 2023, and has agreed to it without amendments. I now call the minister. That the bill be read a third time. I move the bill be reported. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Appropriation Bill number 1, 2022-23. Appropriation Bill number 2, 2022-23. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill number 1. 2022-23. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Australian Crime Commission Amendment, Special Operations and Special Investigations Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and I rise on behalf of the opposition to support the second reading debate of the Australian Crime Commission Amendment, Special Operations and Special Investigations Bill 2022. Uh, in terms of what this bill actually does, the bill amends the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 to provide greater certainty regarding the Australian Criminal Intelligence, Intelligence Commission, otherwise known as the ACIC, board's powers to authorise special ACIC operations and special ACIC investigations. The ACCC Act establishes the ACIC Board and it may make determinations authorising the ACIC to undertake special ACIC operations or special ACIC investigations. However, uh, the existing provisions in 2022 in the Act include key definitions which cross-refer to other definitions that are central to the process for making determinations. This layering of definitions adds unnecessary complexity to the process in making determinations. The bill addresses this issue by repealing the current definition of federally relevant criminal activity in subsection 4.1 and replacing it with a new definition of federally relevant crime. The current definition of relevant crime in subsection 4.1 is also amended. These changes reduce the multi-layered definitions that currently exist, which add unnecessary complexity. The bill also makes some minor consequential amendments to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement Act 2010 and Telecommunications Inception, Interception and Access Act 1979. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, which was formerly known as the Australian Crime Commission, performs without a doubt a vital function of our law enforcement agencies. 
State and Commonwealth agency heads come together to form the board that provides input and directions around special operations and special investigations. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission does excellent work in looking at some of the incredibly serious systemic criminal issues uh, that occur here in Australia. They are also given extraordinary powers. Uh, and of course, we should always be apprehensive and cautious that when we give agencies particularly coercive powers, we are doing it for a very good reason. Uh, it has certainly been evidenced by the performance of the Commission over a number of years now that these powers that they have are extremely important and do assist the Commission in undertaking some of their special operations and investigations. These investigations have been, as we know, into some very significant areas within, for example, drug trafficking, issues with the migration system and uh, issues with organised crime, to name but a few. Uh, without a doubt, the opposition want to support the Australian Crime Commission. Uh, now known as the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, which is what the bill before us does. What it does is ensure that the proper legislative framework is in place for them to continue to do, and as I've outlined, the, in particular, the areas in which they undertake this work. And when, again, when you look at drug trafficking, issues with the migration system, but in particular issues around organised crime, they need to be properly equipped with the powers to tackle these issues. We need to ensure that, in particular in 2022, and in fact we're looking forward to 2023, that they have the proper legislative framework in place for them to continue the important work they do uh, with important oversight and restraint of power. Coercive powers are very significant because, in some cases, they provide evidentiary discovery capacity well beyond what could actually be admissible in trial. Things like the compelling, the giving of evidence and not allowing for the right of silence. Some of those issues may or may not come up at another time in debate uh, on another bill regarding corruption. These powers that are given to the ACIC inform the work that they do and allow them to stop the bad criminal activity that occurs in our nation. So where it is justified and appropriate, and on top of that, we have the proper protections and safeguards in place, we accept the need for that, and we are happy to support improving the legislative framework. In particular, we're in 2022, as I said, looking forward to 2023, where new forms of criminal enterprise and activity may be identified. New technology provides an opportunity for criminal activity that was not envisaged within the original legislation. Due to that, we find ourselves in a situation where the proper powers are not necessarily now in place for entities like the ACIC to do the job that we so desperately need them to do. We as a parliament should always be responding to that and making those changes that, of course, we need to be comfortable with and we need to ensure they are reasonable and legitimate. In the case of this bill, the opposition believes that these changes are appropriate and that they do support the ACIC to do the work that they need to do in the modern world that we live in. I certainly, on behalf of the opposition, commend the ACIC uh, on the work that I do. And as I said, the opposition commends the bill to the chamber. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate we won't be opposing the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Special Operations and Special Investigations Bill. Um, this is a bill to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act um, and to, to provide um, greater certainty, but really just 
procedural amendments and drafting amendments with respect to the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission Board's powers to authorise special um, ACIC operations and special ACIC investigations. Um, special ACIC operations and investigations are tools used by the, the ACIC to obtain information that um, that the ACIC determines would not otherwise be able to be obtained um, without the use of those coercive powers. Um, those powers are primarily being used to collect, assess and then disseminate to state and territory um, uh, policing and intelligence agencies, intelligence and policing information about serious and organised crime. The, design, the intent being to have a kind of national picture of the threat to Australia for organised crime. We know from a series of um, responses we've had from the ACIC in estimates and in the Oversight Committee that overwhelmingly organised crime in this country is funded by illegal drugs. Uh, in the most recent Oversight Committee hearing with the ACIC, the ACIC estimated that the illegal drug market in the country is some $10.4 billion. Um, which doesn't include um, the illegal cannabis market, which they didn't really have a grip on, the size of the illegal cannabis market. But that $10.4 billion plus is the primary source for organised crime in this country and is then, of course, often filtered through, uh, um, through real estate agents, through lawyers, through poker machines, through casinos, um, and is the primary source um, for illegal funds for organised crime in this country. The ACIC um, has now, for, for a number of years, been reporting on its success in disrupting that market, the illegal drug market, primarily using the special operations and special investigations tools that are the subject of this bill. And um, it's unfortunate to say that it hasn't been successful. Um, I think in the last two years the ACIC's intelligence um, was in part at least responsible for the seizure of approximately $1.4 billion in each year. Um, that's the street value um, of illegal drugs. And of course by the end of the year and each year that made absolutely no difference to the availability or price of illegal drugs in the country. Um, and that is because the obscene uh, profits that are made by organised crime through the sale of illegal drugs in this country. In the evidence that they gave to the committee just last week, um, the ACIC's estimation was that for organised crime to purchase a kilo of cocaine, for example, in South America, um, costs about $1,000 a kilo, but the, the sale price um, here in, the, in, in Australia, when they land cocaine and sell it in Australia, is somewhere between $180,000 and $250,000 a kilo. And with that kind of markup, um, losing 10 per cent of that, if organised crime loses 10 per cent of the cocaine and, and, and other drugs that they bring into the country, it's, it's not even noticeable in terms of their end of year profits. Um, so for all of the work that the Australian Crime Commission, the, 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 the ACIC does, uh, for all of the integration that they do with state and territory police, um, for all of these coercive powers, when it comes to the primary industry they're seeking to disrupt, um, they have proven incapable, and they'll continue to prove incapable, given that gap, given that gap between the cost of these drugs and the precursor chemicals on the black market internationally, and the price that's obtained by organised crime selling them in the country. The model that we have now on the war on drugs is fundamentally not working, and the ACIC's um, um, results, notwithstanding substantial effort and investment, um, are proof that the war on drugs is not working in this country. Uh, when it comes to the specific provisions of this bill, uh, um, we have separately satisfied ourselves um, that it makes um, no harmful changes to the oversight of special operations and special investigations. Um, it would be fair to say, though, we haven't been assisted 
by the information provided in the second reading speech on behalf of the government or in the explanatory memorandum. Um, um, to, to quote from the expl explanatory memorandum, the bill makes clearer the process for the board to make and frame determinations to undertake a special ACIC operation or special ACIC investigation. It does this by reducing the multi-layered definitions that exist in the ACC Act, simplifying the determination drafting process and making the determinations easier to understand. The amendments ensure the board can continue to make necessary determinations to authorise special ACIC operations and special ACIC investigations to occur. That sheds more darkness than light on what the bill does. Um, and unfortunately, that is the nature of the explanatory memorandum and the contributions we've got from the government behind this bill. But as I've said, we've separately satisfied ourselves that it does no harm. It does appear to provide some marginal streamlining and clarity for how these special investigations and operations are authorised. To the extent that there's greater clarity about how these coercive powers are authorised, we hope that will provide for uh, greater opportunities for the law to be followed in the letter and the spirit, and for those reasons we don't oppose the bill. Senator Ayres. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank colleagues for their uh, contributions uh, to the debate on the bill. Um, the measures in the bill are certainly technical uh, in nature. They enhance confidence, certainty and trust in the authorisation process uh, for the Australian Crime uh, uh, intelligence Commission's uh, work and the board's capacity to determine special uh, crime intelligence commission operations and special investigations. The measures are essential to ensuring uh, that the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission is able to fulfil its statutory functions as Australia's national criminal intelligence agency without interruption. The bill will support its capacity to continue to effectively target and disrupt the illicit activities of transnational serious and organised crime groups and to appropriately and lawfully take the fight to serious and organised crime in Australia. And I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill's now be, bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? Uh, no. Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum is not present. Ring the bells.
present. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to make the third to move the third reading. Uh, I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 3, Privacy Legislation Amendment, Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to speak in favour of this bill, but to also make a number of points. Uh, with respect to how uh, we believe that this, the opposition believes the bill can actually be enhanced. And I actually sat on the inquiry into this legislation uh, as Deputy Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs uh, Committee, and there were a number of concerns that were identified during the course of considering this legislation. And I note um, Senator Shoebridge also. Uh, attended and was part of those hearings, so we'll also be familiar with some of these issues. This bill proposes a substantial increase in the penalties that will be applicable to body corporates that engage in what is referred to as a serious or repeated interference with privacy uh, obligations. And the first point to note is the bill is lacking the bill is lacking a clear description of what serious or repeated means in this context. So if you are applying, if you are applying a $50 million penalty on a body corporate, or in fact a penalty that could be upwards of 30 per cent, 30 per cent of a company's turnover, a body corporate's turnover, in the context of a serious or repeated interference with privacy, then we need to clearly define what serious or repeated means. That should be clearly defined on the face of the bill. So there is a lack in that respect because there is a lack of that definition as to what serious or repeated is. Is repeated twice? Is it three times? Is it four times? What is serious in this context? Those who are going to be impacted by these laws and have obligations to discharge under this legislation need to be given a clear and concise definition of what serious or repeated means in this context. The second point I want to raise in relation to the penalty clause is it's prepared on the basis, on the presumption that there's an actual benefit which is received by the body corporate that has breached its obligations in this regard. Now we know, we all know, that there are a number of scenarios in relation to which these privacy obligations can be breached. The first scenario is where a big corporate player actually intentionally, willfully breaches our right to privacy, the right of the people whose information is kept by these large corporations. So you can have a willful breach where a body corporate is exploiting that information for its own commercial benefit, in which case there is an actual benefit which is uh, yielded from the breach. Or in the second case, you can have a passive actor where a body corporate is hacked, and we've seen that recently, and the issue for the body corporate is it had insufficient safeguards with respect to protecting uh, the data which it keeps. Now, those are completely different situations. Completely different situations. The first situation where a body corporate has intentionally, intentionally exploited private data for a commercial use and has obtained some benefit. In the second scenario, where a body corporate has actually been hacked itself, where, where the criminal intent is, uh, or malicious intent, the intent to interfere with people's rights of privacy is held by an outside actor. An outside actor. Now, those are different situations, but the problem with this bill as it currently stands is there's no distinction that those are different situations. And in fact, the first point I'd like to make in that regard is that the, the structure of the clause itself assumes that there is a benefit, because in subclause B it refers to the benefit. It doesn't refer to any benefit, it actually refers to the benefit. So it's assuming that the company has actually 
received a benefit from the interference, serious or repeated interference with privacy obligations. And that's not always the case. We know that. So that needs to be made clear. It should also be recognised that this penalty provision would apply to the largest of multinational corporations, which should, which should be able to put in place the best and most robust uh, safeguards to prevent hacking, but it also applies to, say, a medium-sized business or a charity which doesn't necessarily have the same resources as the multinational company. The same penalty provision applies. The same penalty provision applies. And there's a major issue with respect to a regime that imposes the same type of penalty in relation to the largest of multinationals that should have sophisticated cyber defences in place, as opposed to medium-sized enterprise or even a charity that gets hacked by a malicious actor, in many cases foreign actor. But there's no distinction on the face of this penalty clause to those different circumstances. And that's a major failing in terms of this penalty clause. And this issue has been raised by the Law Council of Australia, all sorts of associations representing civic society with expertise in this area. So the government should be addressing this obvious issue on the face of this legislation. The government really should be addressing this obvious issue on the face of the, of the, uh, of the legislation. We, uh, thirdly, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner should, especially given the nature of the penalties which uh, increased under this legislation, should issue clear guidance material addressing the application of penalties and also provide guidance with respect to especially those medium-sized enterprises, uh, charitable organisations, etc., with respect to what best practice means. So people who are operating this space actually know what they need to do in order to discharge their obligations in this space. Uh, the last point, uh, and this is a point which became clear through the course of the, uh, the committee looking at the legislation, is we need to make sure we need to make sure that the office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the Australian Cyber Security Centre uh, are adequately resourced and staffed to carry out their important obligations. There is a mountain of work. There's a mountain of work on this front. It gets more and more complicated each day. The number of malicious uh, cyber attacks is increasing. So we need to make sure that the resourcing and staffing levels for the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the Australian Cyber Security Centre are fit for purpose and they're resourced to such an extent that they can actually discharge the obligations which are imposed upon them. So with those, with those points of concern, uh, I, we, we do support the legislation, but we believe that there are uh, a number of issues which I have outlined in the course of my remarks where the legislation can be enhanced and improved. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Shoebridge. Yeah, um, Acting Deputy President, I rise on behalf of the Greens um, to indicate we will be supporting with reservations the Privacy Legislation Amendment Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022. And I, um, um, and I, I want to acknowledge the contribution of Senator Scar, who um, sat with me on that committee where we reviewed this bill and, and many of the observations that Senator Scar has made about the inadequacies of the bill um, and the adequacies of how it fits into the overall privacy protection regime, um, I, I also acknowledge. Uh, this bill amends the Privacy Act 1988 and the Australian Information Commissioner Act, as well as the Australian Communications and Media Authority Act, to increase penalties under the Privacy Act. It also provides the Australian Information Commissioner with greater enforcement powers, and it provides the Commissioner and the Australian Communications and Media Authority with greater information sharing powers. And just, just stopping there, one of the concerns we had from multiple stakeholders was we're passing a bill that's meant to be about keeping our data safer and, and increased protections for our data, but at the core of it were provisions that made it easier for our data to be shared amongst government agencies. That's, a, that's a, an irony at the centre of this bill um, that many stakeholders pointed out and, and that I haven't yet heard the government address. And we do have concerns. I want to be clear. We do have concerns about that. Um, but the, the headline for this bill is that it increases the penalty under Section 13G of the Privacy Act for serious or repeated interference with privacy from the current about $2.5 million penalty um, um, 
um, to, um, to a maximum penalty that will not exceed the greater of $50 million or three times the value of any benefit that's obtained by a corporation or, if the court can't determine the value of the benefit, up to 30 per cent of their adjusted turnover in that financial year. Um, and I'll have more to say on that penalty regime in, in a moment. The bill also provides the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner with additional um, enforcement powers, modest though they are, that include expanding the types of declarations the Commissioner can make in a determination after an investigation is done, um, amending the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the Privacy Act to ensure foreign organisations that carry on a business in Australia must meet the obligations under the Act, even if they do not collect or hold Australians' information directly from a source in Australia. And we know, for example, at the moment that Meta is in the High Court challenging the existing provisions based upon the, the, the law's current requirement to have a direct connection between whoever breached the data, uh, the privacy rules, and the obtaining of the data from Australia. And, and, and that High Court challenge has pointed out a flaw in the bill, which, uh, in the law, which this bill seeks to um, remedy. And, and we, indeed, we, we, we wholeheartedly support that element of the bill. It also provides the Commission with new powers to conduct assessments, subject to having the resources, and provides the Commission with new infringement notice powers to penalise entities for failing to provide information in the course of an investigation. So not in relation to a privacy breach, but in the course of an investigation without having to go to court. It also strengthens the notifiable data breaches scheme um, to, to provide the Commissioner with more knowledge of the information comprised in an eligible data breach. Um, in relation to enhanced information sharing powers, <coughs> the bill uh, gives the Commissioner's increased ability that gives the Commissioner increased ability to share information by clarifying that the Commissioner is able to share information gathered through the Commissioner's information, information commissioner functions, freedom of information functions and privacy functions. And it also provides the Commissioner with the power to disclose information or documents with an enforcement body, an alternative complaint body or a state, territory or foreign privacy um, regulator for the purpose of the Commissioner exercising their powers or performing their functions. It also provides the Commissioner with the power to publish a determination or information relating to an assessment on the Commissioner's website and to disclose certain information acquired in the course of exercising their powers if it's in the public interest. Um, it also provides some other um, more technical amendments to the ACMA Act. Um, there was, um, as Senator Scar noted, there was significant concern amongst stakeholders and witnesses regarding the structure of this new proposed uh, penalty regime. Uh, while there was near universal support um, for having a substantially increased penalty, and indeed an increased penalty in the scale of $50 million for the most serious and repeated breaches, the lack of any tiered penalty regime and the manner of the drafting of the amendments to Section 13G of the Privacy Act exposed significant weaknesses in the government's proposed model. The proposed model seeks to, lim to link the maximum penalty for breaches to some benefit received through the privacy breach, and that was modelled on competition laws. Now, there is some common sense in linking maximum penalties to the benefit received when the offence is a question about breaching competition laws. The manipulation of markets or other anti-competitive practice can often see extraordinarily large returns in the hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. And for that reason, in the competition space, a fine that's linked to the benefit received by a corporation has a large amount of sense to it. And in fact, it may be the only way of discouraging large-scale anti-competitive behaviour amongst corporate Australia. And we've seen it in other jurisdictions around, around the globe. But in the privacy space, the benefit that corporations may obtain from privacy breaches is in fact far more ambiguous. Um, and for many entities, and we're seeing this play out in real time at the moment with uh, Medibank and Optus and others, for many entities there's actually a net loss from privacy breaches. You know, if you think for a moment about that reputational damage that's been done to Optus and Medicare for their data breaches, 
They may have some notional benefit in having underinvested in IT and other support mechanisms in the past. Maybe that's a notional benefit. It's unclear from the bill whether that's the kind of benefit that's been discussed, that's, that's been referred to in the proposed new 13G. It'd be interesting to hear from the government what their views on that are. Um, but that may be their benefit. But then they've had a huge disbenefit in the reputational damage and the harm to their customer base. Um, that's come about from these data breaches. And it appears in neither of those cases was the privacy breach intentional. So the benefit is at best that historical underinvestment in cybersecurity. How does that work with the proposed new 13G? It would it, it, be fair to say that after the committee hearing, um, how that works is as clear as mud. Um, and the, 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 um, it's also not clear from the drafting if, if the, as I said, if the benefit is some kind of net benefit, you have to weigh up the positives and the negatives. Um, and it's also not clear um, how the proposed alternative maximism, ma maximum fine of up to a third of the annual turnover will be engaged, where that benefit is hard to determine. So you may get this bizarre situation where a corporation that may intentionally and deliberately breach the privacy laws and may enter into a contract, some kind of deal to breach the privacy laws for maybe a, a $20 million payment. Deliberate, intentional, noxious breach of our privacy laws. They get $20 million for that, and they may be a very large corporation with a billion dollar turnover. Um, well, you can identify what that benefit is. It's $20 million. So in that case, the, tiered, the, 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 the third element of the proposed new 13G which says, well, you can't determine the benefit, you use 30 per cent of the turnover as the maximum, which if your turnover is a billion dollars, could be up to $300 million in that case. That corporation, which had a, a very noxious, intentional breach of the Privacy Act, has a capped maximum of, in this case, $50 million, because it doesn't go above the, the first element of the proposed new 13G. Whereas another corporation that may have had no malice, but just some kind of negligent breach of the Privacy Act and had their data hacked because they didn't put the proper measures in place, um, well, if they had a billion dollar turnover, perhaps the benefit they got was an historic underinvestment in cyber. You can't really work out what the value of that benefit is. Well, that corporation with a billion dollar turnover um, may face a maximum penalty of up to $300 million. So we have the corporation with a noxious, deliberate um, breach of privacy in that instance, having a significantly lower penalty than the corporation that was negligent and didn't intend to, but did have a serious breach. That makes no sense. And we're yet to see from the government some kind of explanation about how that's going to work in practice. Um, and, and those difficulties arise from taking provisions that are designed from one part of the law, in this case competition law, and just unthinkingly cutting and pasting them and whacking them into privacy law. So there is a very real need for the government to closely consider these drafting issues and do it as a matter of urgency. Also, um, we, own, we, we have, um, with these amendments, just one penalty. And I'd describe it as the nuclear option. The, the only penalty that can be imposed for the breach of privacy laws after these amendments succeed is the $50 million maximum. Or as we discussed earlier, potentially an even greater maximum penalty for corporations which lo with large turnovers. Um, and there's no subtlety or nuance in the law. By removing that existing penalty and having a one-size-fits-all offence with a maximum penalty of $50 million leaves the regulator in an, in an almost impossible situation. What say there's a, there's a charity which may have a, a, a $25 million annual turnover through the charity? And they've breached the privacy laws. And it might be quite a serious breach. They failed to invest in the necessary IT measures, and there was a serious breach. They were put on notice and they breached. What does the regulator do? Does the regulator bring a penalty with a maximum $50 million fine against a charity which has a $25 million annual turnover, and just by dint of bringing the prosecution, effectively kills the charity? Or think of a small business with a similar turnover. If you're a director in a small business and you get whacked with a penalty which may carry a maximum $50 million fine, I tell you, you'd be having a chat with your insurers, you'd be having a chat with your lawyers and thinking, well, can we continue business the day after we get the fine? 
There's no subtlety. And how is that going to make our privacy any safer? Um, as the majority of contributors to the inquiry made clear, there's a need for a far more nuanced approach with tiered penalties. And for that reason, there's real benefit in agreeing to the larger maximum fine for serious or repeated breaches than keeping the existing penalty for lesser breaches which are not necessarily serious or repeating. And the Greens will have an amendment to do just that in the committee process. And, and I also indicate we'll be moving a further amendment to the second read to provide another enforcement measure, one that's been waiting decades to happen in this country. And I move that second reading amendment that's been circulated, which urges this parliament, urges this House to insert a new statutory civil cause of action for the serious invasion of privacy in the Privacy Act, modelled on what the Australian Law, Law Reform Commission did in its 2014 report entitled Serious Invasions of Privacy in the Digital Era. And I'll finish by saying this. When it comes to resourcing, one thing was abundantly clear from the inquiry and from other, other investigations we've had in budget estimates. The Office of the Australian Information Commission is grossly underfunded. Um, and as the Commissioner noted in her evidence on this inquiry, her UK equivalent has as 10 times the staff of the Australian Office of Information Commissioner, 10 times the staff. The Commissioner also noted that the $5.5 million obtained to undertake her investigation into just one breach, the Optus breach, fairly represents what a complex investigation under these new penalty provisions would cost. So it's fair to ask how the office will properly investigate the raft of other data breaches that we've already seen, not least Medibank, or what else happened this morning before we came in here um, um, to speak in the chamber. With a total budget of just over $33 million annually, from which all of the FOI and privacy work must be undertaken, and we know the FOI work is chronically underfunded, there is an obvious lack of practical capacity for the Information Commissioner to undertake any more than one serious privacy investigation at a time. And that lack of financial capacity um, is, as I said, even clearer when you look at how chronically delayed and underfunded the FOI aspect of the Information Commissioner's work is. <coughs> the end result is that the parliament might agree to these tougher penalties, and it looks like they will, but the government has starved the regulator of the funds to seriously enforce them. And we might, at the end of this, have a Pyrrhic victory uh, for data security. We get a headline, we get a new penalty, we get a penalty that's almost impossible to use because of the size and the scale of it, and we give it to a regulator which barely has the money needed to keep the lights on, let alone br br bring an actual prosecution in this phase. Thank you, Senator Shrewbridge. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise just to make a brief uh, contribution so that I have the opportunity to move the Coalition's second reading amendments. Uh, and in doing so, I want to commend Senator Scar who articulated the Coalition's position more broadly on this bill, which is that we support the bill but we are concerned with some of the drafting of the bill. Uh, and I want to commend Senator Scar and also Senator Shoebridge for their work on the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee which inquired into this bill. I find myself, in addition to obviously agreeing with my own colleague Senator Scar, in strong agreement with Senator Shoebridge about the drafting and design issues of this bill and the risk and the potential for unintended consequences because of the way in which this has been done. I particularly commend the committee for the work they did in the very limited time that they were allowed to do it. Uh, they were asked to report very quickly and nonetheless, even in that short time, have identified a number of serious issues with this bill. Um, the Coalition's approach to this issue uh, is going to be by way of a second reading amendment. The reason for that is that we believe this is a very complex issue and it would not be assisted by amendments on the fly in the chamber from the opposition or the crossbench. It really is a matter for government to get these uh, things right. And we also don't want to stand in the way of the passage of uh, these increased penalties because we do agree that increased penalties are necessary. Uh, Australians certainly feel that way after their data has been lost by major companies who should have been in a better place to defend their data. And we do need to send, send a very strong signal to corporate Australia that we have high expectations of them when they collect sensitive data from Australians. But like uh, Senator Scar articulated and Senator Shubridge has articulated, we are concerned about the definitions, um, particularly uh, the meaning of serious and repeated in relation uh, to the Act. We do agree that a tiered penalty re uh, regime would be preferable, which would allow us to take account of those less severe breaches uh, and those more serious ones and take into account that companies who have been uh, negligent uh, in, in their handling of data where, compared to those who have taken all reasonable steps. We agree that um, it's important for the uh, 
Australian Information Commissioner and also the Cyber Security Centre have adequate resources to make sure they can actually implement this in practice in an adequate way. And we also believe that the Australian Information Commissioner, particularly in light of any legislative amendments which clarify those definitions, should be providing um, some guidance material which makes it very clear to companies uh, about how uh, they're supposed to comply with this law. Um, so just to sum up, we are supportive of this bill, we will be supporting it and we'll be moving a second reading uh, amendment uh, to articulate those concerns, particularly those raised by uh, industry, including the Tech Council uh, and independent third party submitters like the Law Council, which we think were, were points well made in the inquiry process. Uh, so I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1765 circulated in my name. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this bill makes a number of piecemeal amendments to our privacy legislation. It gives some more power to the Australian Information Commissioner and increases penalties for interferences with privacy. The Labor Party wants to look like it's doing something about protecting privacy, yet this bill is the equivalent of putting a band-aid on an amputated leg. Let's start with the Australian Information Commissioner. This agency is clearly not fit for purpose. It doesn't matter how much information sharing power the Commissioner has or how big the penalties are, if the cop on the block is so busy with a legacy caseload, it can't be expected to protect Australians. So let me give you an example of how the Commission is currently broken. The Commission is responsible for dealing with appeals in relation to freedom of information requests. We heard shocking evidence in Senate estimates from the Commission. In 2021, 670 applications to review freedom of information decisions, more than a year old, had not been resolved. At estimates, we heard that as of November, 2,042 applications for review were outstanding, with 1,055 older than 12 months old. I'll say that again. More than 1,055, more than 12 months old. Concerningly, 60 appeals from, for more than four years old are still outstanding. This blowout represents a 150 per cent increase in freedom of information appeals over 12 months old. Freedom of information is about timely access to documents the government wants to keep secret. This is not acceptable. The government is supposed to serve the people. Instead of getting on top of its current responsibilities, the Commission is being snowed under at a rapid and increasing pace. This is the Commission that this bill is giving more powers to and that we are meant to be relying on to protect Australians' privacy. Their track record does not inspire confidence that they will be able to do that. Nothing in this bill addresses one of the greatest perpetrators of data breaches from hacks in this country, the government. Worldwide, the greatest breaches of privacy come from governments and come from big tech. So I'll say it again. Nothing in this bill addresses one of the greatest perpetrators of data breaches from hacks in this country, the government. If they thought the Optus and Medibank hacks were the main story, they're just the tip of the iceberg. ABC reports this morning indicate that logins for Australian tax office accounts, medical and personal data of thousands of NDIS recipients, the login details of individual MyGov accounts and confidential details of an alleged assault of a Victorian school student by their teacher. This is among terabytes of hacked data being openly traded online. This is government data that the government gathers, that the government stores, that has been hacked and leaked, sometimes destroying lives as well as destroying privacy. Will this bill ensure the government is held to account for that? We need a much larger conversation around privacy than this bill allows. The hacks of government databases show it shows that nowhere is safe from hacking, least of all government. If we're going to improve privacy protections in Australia, we need to oppose the trusted digital identity. The digital identity will centralise all Australians' private, sensitive, data into one place. It will be a hacker's one-stop shop to steal sensitive information. We will support this bill and note it's completely inadequate to ensure Australia's privacy 
while the Information Commissioner continues to fail its current responsibilities and the government pushes a centralised digital identity that would be a hacker's paradise. We need much more than this bill offers. It's a, it's a first step, but we need much, much more to secure people's privacy. We have one flag, and it's above this building. We are one community. We are one nation. And the individual's secure privacy, freedom and sovereignty are fundamental to a strong nation. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I will be going to uh, the minister. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thank all honourable senators for their contributions to the debate on this important bill. I'd also like to thank the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, who have carefully considered the bill and recommended it be passed. Uh, the detailed work um, uh, that was undertaken by that committee was also reflected in a number of uh, the more thoughtful contributions in this debate. The government also accepts the committee's recommendations that the Attorney-General's Department, as part of its Privacy Act review, should firstly consider amending Section 13 capital G of the Privacy Act to define the terms serious and repeated interference with privacy, and secondly examine whether it is appropriate to provide for any additional Australian link to the extraterritorial jurisdiction provision. I'd like to thank the Chair uh, and Deputy Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, Senators Green and Scar, the members of that committee and all those who made submissions and gave evidence to the committee's inquiry. This bill is a priority for the Albanese government and sends a clear message that entities must take privacy, security and data protection seriously. Recent data breaches have caused considerable distress and alarm for millions of Australians and have the potential to cause serious financial and emotional harm well into the future. Increasing penalties for a serious or repeated breach of privacy will incentivise entities to take strong privacy and cyber security measures to protect the personal data they hold. Setting these penalties at a higher level will accord with Australian community expectations about the importance of protecting their personal data and the significant impact caused by serious privacy breaches. The maximum penalty, while operating as a statutory cap, does not otherwise constrain the exercise of the court's discretion to impose a penalty that is appropriate to the seriousness of the misconduct and harm or potential harm in the particular circumstances of the case. Uh, this uh, discretion that a court would have would deal with the hypothetical example uh, uh, characterised by Senator Shoebridge relating to an, an NGO and the potential effect on them. That would be a matter for the court's discretion, and we think that that actually provides some protection against uh, an uh, overwhelming fine against an NGO. This measure is complemented by a range of targeted enhancements to, to the enforcement powers to equip the Australian Information Commissioner with the tools necessary to take effective and efficient enforcement action where necessary. I note the calls that have been made by a number of senators for adequate resourcing uh, for the Commissioner. Uh, and this is a matter that is being considered as part of the government's broader review of privacy uh, rules and legislation. Greater information sharing arrangements for privacy and telecommunications regulators will also ensure Australians are informed about emerging privacy issues and will ensure these regulators are able to work together to take prompt action to minimise harm to Australians. The bill is an essential first step of the government's agenda to ensure Australia's privacy framework is fit for purpose and responds to new challenges in the digital era. Further reforms will be considered next year following consideration of the Attorney-General's Department review of the Privacy Act. This bill is an important and pressing reform that will make sure penalties effectively deter the misuse of Australians' personal data and will ensure Australia's privacy regulator has the enforcement tools necessary to resolve privacy breaches efficiently and effectively. The bill is a reflection of community expectations and demonstrates the Albanese government's commitment to keeping Australians' data protected. Uh, now, I think now is probably also the appropriate time for me to respond uh, to the second reading amendments that have been moved both by the opposition and by Senator Shoebridge. Uh, just dealing with the opposition's uh, second reading amendment to begin with. The government does not support this amendment as it is appropriate to await the Attorney-General's Department review of the Privacy Act. The bill that we are debating here is a targeted and proportionate response to the recent data breaches. 
The government is acting now to increase the penalties as the current maximum penalties are inadequate. The penalties need to be increased to incentivise entities to have appropriate privacy and cyber security settings and reflect the harm that data breaches can cause. Reforms to clarify key definitions in the Privacy Act, develop a tiered penalty regime, provide greater clarity on the application of penalties and enhance security guidelines are being considered through the Privacy Act review. It's appropriate that these reforms be considered holistically in this process, given the range of complex and interconnected issues and other work across government. This will also allow the necessary time to carefully consider the need to balance potential new privacy obligations with any regulatory burden on entities. Uh, in the October 2022-23 budget, the government provided the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner $5.5 million over two years to investigate the Optus data breach, including undertaking preparatory work to support any future legal action. And we also confirmed $17 million over two years to ensure the office is adequately resourced to meet the increasing complexity and potential increases of privacy complaints in the digital age and take strategic enforcement action that was announced in the March 22-23 budget. The government will be carefully looking at the resourcing requirements of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner as part of the Privacy Act review process. In 2023, there will be an overhaul of the Privacy Act and it will be important to consider the resourcing needs of the office in that context. In relation to Senator Shoebridge's uh, second reading amendment, which effectively seeks to introduce a statutory tort uh, in relation to privacy, the government does not support this amendment as it is appropriate uh, to await again the Attorney General's Department's review of the Privacy Act. As part of this review, the, gov the Department is giving consideration as to whether a statutory tort of privacy should be introduced. Uh, we should not preempt the outcomes of this review. It is appropriate that broader reforms be considered holistically in this process, again, given the range of complex and interconnected issues, including whole of economy implications. Uh, a statutory tort would allow private citizens to seek remedies for serious invasions of their privacy and may create a more effective framework for individuals to seek compensatory damages for invasions of privacy. Uh, but this, along with the matters uh, raised in the opposition second reading amendment, are things that we think are best dealt with through the review of the Privacy Act uh, that is now underway. Thank you, Minister. There are, there are two second reading amendments. I will deal with the one that was moved by Senator Shoebridge first. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Uh, close the doors. The question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shrewbridge be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan teller for the noes. The result of the division is uh, ayes 12, noes 31. The question is resolved in the negative. I call Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1765 circulated in my name. So the question uh, before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Patterson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. I have it. D division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Yeah. Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Patterson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. There being 30 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is received in the affirmative. So the question now is that the second reading, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to privacy and for other purposes. My understanding is that there are amendments for the uh, committee stage, so we will move into committee. Just down to, just down to is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole, there being no objection is so ordered? The question is that the bill stand as Printed, and I'm looking around the chamber. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move Government Amendment uh, PC 128. Uh, so this amendment inserts a new subsection 13 capital G, subsection 1 capital A, to make it clear on the face of the legislation that section 13 capital G of the Privacy Act is a civil penalty provision and triggers part four of the Regulatory Powers Standard Provisions Act 2014. This technical amendment expressly clarifies that the increased penalties proposed in this bill are civil penalties. The amendment will enable the updated civil penalty provision in section 13 capital G to be enforced under the Regulatory Powers Standard Provisions Act, uh, and I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendment to be moved to this bill. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The opposition will be supporting these amendments which go to drafting issues in the bill. Um, and all I will add in, uh, to that is that, of course, it's not the only drafting issues identified in the bill through the committee process articulated by Senator Scar and Senator Shoebridge in their contributions. Um, uh, it is our view that those other drafting issues should have also been addressed at this opportunity, but that is a matter for the government. If they don't think that these are problems and they won't materialise in, in practice, we hope they're right and we'll be supporting these amendments. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Shoebridge. I oppose this amendment, but it's not the issue. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, if there's no further contributions, 
The question before the chair is that Amendment 1 on sheet 128 moved uh, by Minister Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I move. Oh, I seek leave to move amendments numbers one and two on sheet 1736 the, as circulated. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move both of those amendments. Um, as we noted in the second reading contribution, uh, the, the amendments that have been um, presented by the government, which are going to be agreed to the Privacy Act, are going to create a one-size-fits-very-few um, penalty regime where the only penalty available um, to the, the regulator um, is a minimum, if you like, minimum maximum of $50 million for a penalty and then, the t and then potentially a, a higher penalty if a corporation has a turnover um, um, that, would, that would trigger the higher penalties. So um, this amendment seeks to put in a, a new 13GA into the Privacy Act, which would provide an entity contravenes this subsection if the entity doesn't act or engages in a practice that is an interference with the privacy of one or more individuals, and it seeks to retain the existing civil penalty of 2,000 penalty units for that breach. Um, it also has a consequential amendment that provides there's no retrospectivity in relation to that um, uh, proposed new uh, provision. Um, what, what, what the proposed new Section 13 GA would do is remove the necessity for repeated or serious from the offence provision and provide for what pretty much every stakeholder said we need, whether it was Electronic Frontiers or Digital Rights Watch um, or even the business reps that came before the, um, the inquiry that we had, put in place a tiered approach. If the Greens amendment was, uh, was successful, um, it would allow the regulator to have at least some nuance in how, they go, in how the regulator goes about enforcing privacy. Um, that if they see a breach, um, and it, it may well be a, a quite disturbing breach of the privacy laws, it doesn't have to be serious or repeated, but could be. Um, but if they see a breach of the privacy laws, uh, instead of having to go and press the nuclear launch button of the $50 million penalty, they'll be able to um, um, seek a penalty um, which has a maximum value of some 2,000 penalty units for a corporation, um, which, which, is, uh, which, which would not see small, medium businesses, charities, potentially going to the wall um, when the regulator takes action. Without this, we're going to see no realistic way of enforcing the uh, privacy laws against small and medium business or against the charity, charitable and not-for-profit sector. If, if the only tool to hand for the regulator is a $50 million plus penalty, maximum penalty, well, that's not going to be able to be used in any practical way against small or medium business or against NGOs and the not-for-profit sector. It just won't be. And we're going to pass a law here today which is actually going to mean less real power less real capacity for the regulator to enforce our privacy laws. That's what the Greens Amendment does. It fills that gap. It puts in that tier, which is a realistic penalty um, that could actually be used by the regulator and, and, and would therefore have a meaningful way of keeping our data and our privacy safe. Because without this, let's be clear, for 99.9% for, for, for of uh, privacy and data breaches, the regulator won't have the resources and it definitely won't have the political will to whack an entity with a, with a, with a $50 million maximum fine. It just won't happen. Um, so this is about sensible, measured, nuanced regulation. It's what pretty much every stakeholder said we should do with this bill, and I commend it to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. Um, as Senator Shoebridge is aware, this issue is can be considered more broadly as part of the Privacy Act review, uh, and that's why we will be opposing it at this point in time, so that the review can do its work. 
The powers that are currently available to the Information Commissioner in this area are based on an enforcement period, uh, pyramid approach to regulation. The Act initially relies upon the Information Commissioner encouraging compliance and then determinations and enforcement in the courts if that is not successful. For the most egregious interferences with privacy, Section 13 capital G of the Act provides for the Information Commissioner to take civil penalty action against the entity in the federal court. The question the review is considering is whether the regulatory options available are too limited to target the different levels of seriousness with which interference with privacy occurs. It's con the review is considering two additional categories of civil penalty provisions that cover less serious conduct than that in Section 13 capital G, but that still might warrant enforcement action. The first new category would be a new mid-tier civil penalty for any interference with privacy with a lesser maximum penalty amount. The second new category would be a series of very low-level civil penalty provisions for administrative breaches of the APPs with attached infringement notice powers for the uh, Information Commissioner. Given these proposals are about it creating entirely new civil penalty provisions, it's appropriate that these issues are considered thoroughly as part of the review. However, the increase to the maximum penalty of the existing provision of the Act, which we are in the process of putting through this chamber, is a targeted amendment to ensure the maximum penalty available reflects the fact that is the, that the most serious enforcement action that can be taken by the Information Commissioner where there has been a serious breach of privacy. Thank you. Uh, Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, while the opposition supports in principle the amendments moved by the Greens and it in fact inc included a similar call yeah, for this uh, regime in our second reading amendment, which the Chamber has just agreed to, um, as I articulated in my second reading speech, we are concerned that we should not be doing complex amendments to complex legislation like this on the fly in the Chamber. Um, there is a risk of unintended consequences. I do welcome the Minister's statement that the government will consider this as part of their wider reforms. That is important because Senator Shubridge is right. It will be very difficult to apply a $50 million penalty to a very small entity and uh, it will be very difficult to apply it in the instance of an um, inadvertent uh, breach rather than a serious one. And We are concerned about that and industry and stakeholders in, and third party groups in the inquiry process made that very clear. As Senator Shoebridge uh, has explained to the Chamber. Um, but we ha as a matter of principle, we think uh, the government is in the best place to address this issue with the access to drafting resources and expertise they have through the department. The only concern I want to finish on and put on the record is that that process not take too long. Um, because if between the passage of these increased penalties and the more comprehensive privacy reforms that the government is talking about, too much time elapses. I think Senator Shubich is right that we will not have made any meaningful improvement to the cyber security uh, and privacy of Australians. And it is important that that more comprehensive reform come forward as soon as possible to address these more uh, wider and complex issues. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Shoebridge. Um, well, I, I, I thank the minister for the contribution. And um, and I note the minister says there's a, peer, a pyramid of um, enforcement measures. If, if it is a pyramid, it's, it is um, absolutely built on sand um, with minimal actual enforcement measures. I, I think most of us, if we're honest, would accept that you know cranky letters or rude notices or you know um, uh, uh, angry reports from the information commissioner have not worked in the past to keep our privacy safe, and that those kinds of existing remedies will not work going into the future to keep our privacy safe. So if that's, if that's the pyramid the government thinks has any kind of um, utility or use, well, I, I think reality um, and, and what everyday Australians are feeling on a day-in, day-out basis with the privacy breaches they've been suffering would suggest otherwise. Um, that being said, I, 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 do, I, do, I do acknowledge the government is, has now given that commitment to move to have a tiered approach which is what I understand the minister was saying, that the, the, the intent is to deliver a tiered approach, which will give some capacity for the regulator to actually use the powers. Um, but I would be interested to know from the minister what the time frame is to deliver that tiered approach, because the longer we go without it, the longer we go in basically having lawless provisions, no real enforceable provisions for privacy. Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, the report from the Privacy Review will be handed down and provided to the Attorney-General by the end of this calendar year. 
Um, so I would anticipate then that we'd get moving on this in the new year. Senator Shoebridge. Um, thanks, Minister. Is there a commitment from the government to make that report public? And if so, what's the time frame for that? Minister. Um, I'm probably not in a position to make that commitment at this point, Senator Shoebridge. I know that uh, the review and the report will be also considered by Cabinet, so I guess it will be a matter for Cabinet as to what is uh, publicly released. Senator Shoebridge, do you— oh, I, on, on a different point, if I may, to the minister, yes. um, is, is it the government's intention that, that the concept of benefit in the proposed new subsections 13G 2 and 3 is a net benefit? Or, or is it any benefit that would trigger the provisions of 13G 2 to 3? Minister. Uh, it will be any benefit. Senator Shoebridge. So, um, Minister, in those circumstances, is it true that if a, if a corporation got their data hacked and they put measures in place but not sufficient measures and, and maybe therefore had had a kind of you know, hard to determine but fairly modest um, benefit from an underspend in the IT, yet they may have suffered a huge commercial loss with customers leaving and remedies being put in place as a result of a, a, an attack on their, their IT and therefore be potentially tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in the red. Um, that they'll be perceived as having a benefit, having received a benefit, and therefore will be potentially liable for the 13G3 penalty. Minister, thanks, Deputy President. Um, Senator Shoebridge, it's a little difficult to comment on uh, any possible hypotheticals that you are putting forward, but obviously it would be a matter for the court to determine whether a company has had a benefit and whether its actions or inactions warrant uh, any type of penalty. Senator Shoebridge. Um, Minister, will the government be engaging with the not-for-profit and charitable sector, who are very, very concerned about this maximum penalty being in place? Will you be engaging with the charitable and not-for-profit sector and potentially as part of that, engaging with them in guidelines for the Information Commissioner about how this new penalty provision will be used? And secondly, are you intending to provide some additional resources for the charitable and not-for-profit sector so that they can effectively meet their privacy obligations, given what may otherwise be a ruinous penalty being delivered to them under this new regime? Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, I'm advised that the government will be uh, consulting and engaging with non-government uh, organisations uh, because, as you say, they do have legitimate concerns uh, and we, it's in our, everyone's interest to assist NGOs to meet their uh, obligations in this space. And I'm also advised that guidelines and other information material will be provided to uh, NGOs so that they can comply with their legal requirements. Senator Shoebridge. Minister, is any part of that plans on behalf of the government to provide charitable and not-for-profit sector with the kind of funds they're going to need to meet their obligations. We're passing a bill now that's saying if they have a repeat or serious breach, they may face up to a $50 million penalty. Are you going to provide them with the kind of funds that they need to meet their privacy obligations? Um, because the, the anxiety in the sector is very real. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Um, those matters around funding, Senator Shoebridge, will be considered as part of the implementation uh, of the Privacy Act review. Senator Shoebridge, do you have any other matters you wish to raise? Does any other honourable senator, senator wish to raise any, uh, any issues in relation to the amendments? Because I intend to put the amendments, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge. I put the question that the amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1736, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. no. I think the noes have it. Is division required? Yes. 
Division is required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that the amendments one and two on sheet 1736, standing the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the eye, Senator McKim, and teller for the nose, Senator Scar. Yes, we have the time.
Honourable Senators, there have been 12 ayes and 31 noes. It's passed in the negative. Does any honourable senator wish to make a further contribution at the committee stage? No honourable senator has indicated they wish to make a further contribution. I intend to put the further questions. The question is now that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Privacy Legislation Amendment Enforcing and Other Measures Bill 2022 and agreed to it with an amendment. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I move that the bill be read a third time. Put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to privacy and for other purposes. Government business order of the day number four. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures Number 2 Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Deputy President. The Coalition will be supporting this bill, the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 2 Bill 2022. This bill implements a number of sensible measures of the previous Coalition Government. For a number of these measures, their implementation was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This bill provides effective changes to, to support small businesses in handling their affairs with the Australian Taxation Office, providing them with additional supports in the event of inadvertent breaches as opposed to financial penalties. It provides small businesses additional support in dealing with the ATO appeals process and removes tax barriers that support sole traders and individuals looking to upskill. It supports gig economy contractors and companies to manage their tax obligations and ensure that the ATO has the data it needs to ensure accurate reporting. And it puts in place important reforms to support the Coalition's election commitment to support Australians over 55 to downsize their properties and contribute to their super. This bill builds on the Coalition's strong record of supporting small businesses, retirees and sensible reforms to super, as well as supporting the housing market. Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you very much, um, Deputy President. Uh, well, <laughs> what we're seeing in Australia at the moment is a redef redefinition of class. Because it used to be that if you worked hard, if you studied hard, if you spent your pennies wisely, you could actually set yourself up for a good life. But that guarantee no longer exists in Australia. The egalitarian social contract upon which we once prided ourselves as a country has been torn up. Nowadays, the thing that is most likely to determine your financial success through the course of your life is the extent to which you or your family own land. We've gone from being a nation of a fair go to being a country that resembles a new feudal order. And this is no accident. This is the direct result of 30-odd years of economic policy that, instead of treating housing as a human right that everyone should have access to at an affordable rate, has instead treated housing, housing as a financial asset designed to enrich those who own the most of it and designed to enrich the banks whose business model is predicated on land price inflation. Through tax policy, through monetary policy and through prudential regulation, the Australian economy is designed to enrich landholders and to enrich the money lenders. And by that design, 
we have torn up the social contract that our country used to be based on, which is in part an understanding that if you did work hard, study hard, spend your pennies wisely, you could set up yourself and your family for a dignified life. Which takes me to Schedule 5 of this bill. Schedule 5 of this bill reduces the eligibility age from 60 years to 55 for people to make so-called downsizer contributions to their superannuation. I say the so-called downsizer contributions because this policy is actually just one of the latest and increasingly more Byzantine ways in which tax law is being rigged to favour those whose land holdings are worth the most. The Australian Financial Review very helpfully set out just what, what a rort this scheme is at the point that it was introduced by the then Treasurer, uh, Mr Morrison, I might add, in 2018, and when the eligibility age was actually 65. The following is from an article instructively entitled How to Put More into Super When You're Not Really Downsizing. The article states these contributions, known as downsizer contributions, present an opportunity to top up your super even if you're otherwise unable to contribute due to your age, work status or the amount that you've got in super. But don't let the name fool you. The, uh, the article says, to make a downsizer contribution, you could be selling your home to buy a bigger one if, in fact, you buy another place at all. You could be moving into your investment property, holiday home or even into aged care. You don't even have to sell the place you're living in. You could be selling another property, which was once the family home. To make a downsizer contribution, you don't have to even buy another place." End quote. So there you have it. Don't let the name fool you. Despite all the rubbish flowing about around reducing the barriers to downsizing, more effective use of the housing stock, freeing up larger homes for families, this policy is nothing more than an opportunity for those with the most expensive homes and those with the most excess wealth to load up their superannuation accounts so they can get even more public subsidies in the form of superannuation tax concessions for their estate planning. Because, to quote again from the AFR, while the downsizer contribution has broad application, people likely to benefit most will be self-funded retirees who have a level of income and assets that precludes them receiving any means-tested social security. There you have it, plain and simple. What we are debating now, brought in by a so-called Labor government, is a public subsidy for the wealthy. It's exactly the sort of policy you'd expect from Mr Morrison and a Tory government. And you know what? That's actually exactly what it is. Mr Morrison's Tory policy brought forward by the Australian Labor Party, the so-called great friend of the working and the less well-off in our society. The Labor Party who will not increase the rate of New Start, but who are quite happy indeed to bring in a massive public subsidy for the already very wealthy. This was Tory policy when Mr Morrison introduced it as Treasurer in 2018. It was Tory policy when the eligibility age was reduced from 65 to 60 while Mr Morrison was Prime Minister, and it's Tory policy today, which is why when the Australian Greens introduce an amendment in the committee stages to strike out this part of the bill, it will be voted down by, that's right, you guessed it, the political duopoly in this country, the Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics, who will vote together to ensure 
that the rich get yet another public handout in Australia, while the poor continue to struggle <coughs> and starve because neither major party in the duopoly supports a rise in the rate of New Start. This policy to provide yet more superannuation tax concessions for the rich, when the superannuation system already provides more public subsidies to the rich than it does for anybody else, is an absolute obscenity. And you know what? It was announced by the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, at the Coalition's election campaign launch earlier this year. So here we are, debating a centrepiece of Mr Morrison's bid for re-election, a key pitch by the leader of what the new Prime Minister quite rightly describes as a rotten government, and it's being introduced by the Australian Labor Party. I mean, this is absolutely Alice in Wonderland stuff. The party of the workers coming in here with massive public subsidies for the extremely wealthy. I mean, how good, to quote Mr Morrison, how good is the Australian Labor Party? I mean, what does the self-styled Tory fighter Mr Albanese do when Mr Morrison announces this very policy as one of his landmark campaign policies in the election? Well, he ate it up. Didn't he? That's what Mr Albanese did. He ate it up. He ate it up really fast because he didn't want to get wedged. How good is the Australian Labor Party? We all know Labor would have never come up with this policy on its own, but they are such a gutless shadow of their former selves that Tory policy is now Labor policy. And here they are with Schedule 5 of this bill. Yet another handout of public funds to the super wealthy and the very well off in this country actually legislating Tory policy. Once again, like the stage three tax cuts, this is Mr Albanese adopting Mr Morrison's legacy. And I say to the Australian Labor Party, you need to find yourselves again. You need to find out. You need to have a good look in the mirror and find out exactly what your values are. Because you're in here by winning the election. Is that, well, I'll take that interjection from uh, Senator Gallagher, because that shows it was all about winning the election and nothing at all about good public policy. Nothing at all about good public policy. Nothing at all about good public policy. And um, I say to the Australian Labor Party, you do need to have a good look in the mirror. And you do need to try and um, return to the values that actually led to your establishment um, all those decades ago, because you've got to face it that you're no longer the party of the working people, first and foremost. You're now, um, you're now joining the Tories as being a party of the landowners, first and foremost. And I do encourage progressively minded people to understand this. When you say uh, when, when, when progressively minded people hear the Albanese government say that they won't get rid of negative gearing or the capital gains tax concessions, that they can't afford to build the amount of social housing that we actually need, when they say they're going to proceed with the stage three tax cuts for the super wealthy, when they say that they won't introduce a rent freeze, when they say they're going to proceed with the provisions in this bill for yet another public superannuation subsidy for those at the top end of town. What people are actually hearing is the Australian Labor Party confirming that they represent the interests of the landowning class over and above the interests of working Australians. That's what the Labor Party is seeing, is saying, and that's what people should hear when they hear the Labor Party talk about those things and when they see the Labor Party introducing legislation such as this. So, um, Deputy President, I do give notice of my intention to move <coughs> the amendment on sheet uh, 1632, um, circulated in my name, which would strike out 
uh, Schedule 5 um, from this bill, uh, I do commend uh, that amendment to the chamber, but I hold out no hopes that it will succeed because the duopoly in this place is going to once again uh, work together, um, collude to ensure that the interests of the landed class in this country have primacy and that the interests of those who are less well off are once again ignored. Senator Ayres. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, before I uh, deal with the bill, I mean, I just want to respond to some of Senator McKim's. Um, I'm not quite sure what the right word is. Um, point, point, I'm not sure pointed is the right word. I mean, of, of all weeks, of all weeks to claim that there's a sort of duopoly, of, of all weeks, of all weeks, of all weeks to say, to say that, you know, that there's Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics. I mean, this is a week that's going to demonstrate a couple of things. Firstly, that there's a very big difference, a very big difference between what we stand for in the government uh, and what the former government did and stood for, to the extent you could say that they stood for anything apart from their own interests. And I think it's going to demonstrate there's quite a bit of a gulf between us. I mean, we, we are going to deliver this week what we said we were going to deliver, and this is part of that agenda. National Integrity Commission, industrial relations reform. Last week it was childcare. I mean, the problem with this silly hyperbolic rhetoric is, is, is in order for political rhetoric to be effective, it has to have some relationship with the truth. Now, I, I listened to Senator McKim's account of the terrible things that this was, things that this was going to do, and, and, and I thought I'd better check for myself. I mean, this doesn't sound very good. But it turns out, well, downsizing is not a bad thing. We should, we should have more of it. People who live in big homes, and there's only a few of them, they should give them away. And people with lot, big families should move into big homes, and people with little families should move into little homes. And there should be a little bit of support from government from that. And I had a look at the budget impact. Not very much. Not very much. Now, you can, you can claim to be opposed to you know, extreme rhetoric on the other side of politics you know, and all the engagement with the characters who inhabit that end, but you've actually got to be a little bit measured in terms of what you say yourself. I mean, Schedule 5 is very clear. Downsizing is good. The budget impact is tiny. And, but I mean, in this week of all weeks to try and claim these things, I mean, I think this week should have a trigger warning for Liberal politicians. They, you know, we've got, we've got the weekend, last weekend, I, mean, I can't wait for next Saturday, but last Saturday, hubris. last Saturday, hubris. hubris, I don't even know what that means. I didn't do Greek at Glen Innes High School. I, 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 I was flat out passing English. But the, 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 the idea that after a week that begins on the Saturday, where the sort of creatures who inhabit the Victorian component of the Liberal National Party out here were cohabiting with these extremists and sort of loons on the, on the far right of Victorian politics, you know, who were vaccine denialists and conspiracy theorists, when we had senior former and current Liberal politicians saying, what about Dan Andrews' stairs? I mean, hanging out with, with utter extremists, enabling violence at polling booths and thought that they might surf through to a victory got comprehensively flogged last Saturday. Uh, and you would think that there'd be a moment of self-reflection. But what we're seeing is the same stunts from over here. We're about to see another one from Senator Bragg this afternoon, the greatest game of insider baseball you'd ever see, his MPI resolution. We're lo looking forward to that debate. And then you've got hyperbolic claims from this lot. Well, on this side, we will just do sensible reform. We'll do it carefully. We'll do it methodically. We'll do what we said we were going to do, and we'll do it in a straightforward, sensible order. And I commend uh, the bill to the Senate. Uh, there were 
two other speakers on the whipping list. We're happy to go. We're happy to go to the summing up of the debate. Minister, please sum up the debate. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, senators who have contributed to this debate this morning. Schedule one of the bill makes it easier for businesses to understand their record-keeping obligations. If a business is genuinely struggling to keep appropriate tax records, the Commissioner of Taxation will be allowed to offer them a choice to undertake a record-keeping course rather than paying financial penalties. The Commissioner cannot offer this course to businesses who are disengaged with the tax system or deliberately avoiding their obligations. Schedule 2 to the bill extends existing third-party reporting requirements to operators of electronic platforms in the sharing economy. Platform operators will be required to report to the ATO information regarding certain transactions and payment details. This information will assist the ATO in its administration of the tax system and ensure sellers on these platforms are meeting their tax obligations. Schedule 3 to the bill uh, reduces compliance costs for individuals claiming self-education deductions by removing the exclusion of the first $250 of deductions for prescribed courses of education. Schedule 4 to the bill allows small businesses to seek orders from the AAT that stay or otherwise affect ATO debt recovery actions while the small business is disputing the underlying tax assessment in the Small Business Tax Division of the AAT. Applying to the AAT instead of the courts will save small businesses money in court and legal fees and as much as 60 days of waiting for a decision. These orders will be sub, uh, subjected to integrity checks intended to prevent aggressive taxpayers without genuine disputes from receiving stay orders sought with the intention of frustrating the recovery of genuine tax debts. Schedule 5 to the bill expands eligibility for those aged 55 years and over to make downsizer contributions into superannuation. This will allow more Australians to consider downsizing to a home that better suits their needs, thereby increasing the availability of suitable housing for Australian families. And I commend the bill to the Senate. I put the question that the bill now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Amendment has a clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. An amendment has been circulated. Uh, we, are, we will go into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. As I uh, indicated during my, um, uh, my second reading speech, I, I do have an amendment, and as, um, as you've also indicated. Uh, and this amendment is to um, strike out the so-called downsizer uh, provisions from uh, this legislation. Uh, I just want to very quickly use this opportunity to um, respond to a couple of comments made by Senator Ayres, um, who, who, who took issue with, um, uh, with what I'd said uh, and then proceeded to give us a little homily on the importance of downsizing, but clearly he hadn't listened to my speech because my <laughs> one of the absolute uh, primary premises of my speech uh, is that actually this is not about, this is not about downsizing. Uh, at all. It's just about a, a further subsidy for, uh, for the landed class and the very well off uh, in this country. So, um, Chair, uh, I uh, thank the Senate um, and I move the amendment uh, standing in my name circulated uh, on sheet 1632. Senator Smith. Does he, has he moved both by lead together? Uh, the Coalition will not be supporting this amendment moved by Senator McKim. Uh, this bill implements a number of sensible measures of the previous Coalition Government. For a number of these measures, their implementation was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Coalition supports the bill in its current form. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the government won't be supporting Senator McKim's um, amendment. The expansion of the downsizer scheme will allow older Australians to consider downsizing to a home that better suits their needs earlier, thereby increasing the availability of suitable housing for Australian families. Lowering the eligibility age from 60 to 55 recognises that some people choose to downsize earlier 
and may wish to contribute these proceeds to superannuation in order to boost their income in retirement. The government is dedicated to both supporting older Australians but also, importantly, growing the housing supply. That's why we're also committing to developing an ambitious housing and homelessness reform agenda, bringing le national leadership and a strong focus on stable and affordable housing. We've also committed to the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund, a national help to buy shared equity scheme, a national housing supply and affordability council, a national housing and homelessness plan. And uh, this, this um, schedule in the bill is an important part of our overall housing approach, and we will not be supporting the Greens amendment. Just confirm that he's moved. Uh, Senator McKim, I just need confirmation that you've moved one and two. If so, you need leave. Well, I do seek leave to move uh, yeah. one and two together, Chair. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I so move. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone have a further contribution on the amendment standing in the name of Senator McKim? Uh, so the first question that I put is, and I'm just rehearsing this for the benefit of the chamber, is that Schedule 5 standards printed. So if you support the position of Senator McKim, you would vote no. And if, you're, if you do not support Senator McKim's proposition, you vote yes. And then, depending on the outcome of that vote, we will move to whether the amendment be agreed to. Does any honourable senator have any queries in relation to that course of action? So I put the question that Schedule 5 standards printed. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. <laughs> so therefore I'm not required to put the second question, which is uh, indicated. So unless any other honourable senator has a contribution in the committee of the whole, I'll put the I intend to put the, question, the following questions and take us out of committee. No honourable senators indicated they wish to speak. So I put the question that the bill now stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I put the question now that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 2, Bill 2022, and agreed to it without amendment. Minister. Thank you. I move that the report be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move the third reading put, yeah. of the bill. Yes, thank you, thank you Minister. <laughs> she says confidently. I put up the question that the bill now be read as a third time. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number five. Treasury laws amendment 2022 measures number three bill 2022 and two related bills. Resumption of second reading debate. Uh, I just I don't have a just bear with me for the moment. I don't have a whipping list in front of me. Who I'll go to Senator Smith, but I've noticed that Senator McKim wishes to speak also. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. The Treasury Laws Amendment of twenty twenty two measures number three bill collates a number of miscellaneous Treasury measures. Schedule one of the bill amends the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act to double the maximum financial pen penalties for contraventions of provisions that re relate only to residential land. Schedule 1 to the bill amends the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act to double the maximum financial penalties for contraventions of provisions that relate to residential land, as I said. Foreign investment plays an important and beneficial role in the Australian economy. 
However, it is necessary to regulate certain kinds of foreign investment to ensure that proposed investments are not contrary to Australia's national interests. The Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act provides that a foreign person must seek foreign investment approval before, requiring, before acquiring an interest in Australian residential land and imposes obligations of a foreign person who acquires an interest in that residential land. The Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act contains specific penalties for contraventions of residential land provisions. The amendments double the maximum financial penalties in the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act for contraventions of res residential land provisions. The purpose of this increase to in financial penalties is to ensure that these penalties effectively deter foreign persons from contravening the residential land provisions. Non-compliance with the residential land provisions may have a significant impact on Australia's housing stock and housing affordability, and foreign persons can make a significant financial gain by obtaining an interest in Australian residential property. Foreign investors that break the law absolutely should be punished in the view of the coalition. And it is appropriate that the costs of administering our foreign investment scheme be borne by investors and not Australians. To the extent that this measure boosts housing supply and supports Australians getting into a home, the coalition welcomes it. The coalition has a strong record in delivering more housing and more Australians into homes. We have a strong record of helping first home buyers enter the market. Around 60,000 Australians have purchased a home or reserved a place under the coalition's home guarantee schemes. To support even more Australians into home ownership, the coalition more than doubled the home guarantee scheme to make available up to 50,000 places each year. As part of the 22-23 budget, the coalition promised to expand the first home guarantee by providing 35,000 places each year from 1 July 2022, up from 10,000 per year. In addition, expand the family home guarantee with 5,000 guarantees made available each year, enabling single parents with dependents to purchase a home sooner with a deposit of 2 per cent. And finally, establish a new regional home guarantee with 10,000 guarantees available each year to support eligible home buyers in regional areas. These measures follow the successful Home Builder Program, which supported over $33 billion of residential construction activity through the pandemic by providing grants for new homes and substantial renovations. Over, 130, over 137,000 Home Builder applications had been received as of the last budget. Danita Warren, the CEO of Master Builders Australia, has said, and I quote, without home builder, thousands of small builder and tradie businesses would have gone under and hundreds of thousands of jobs would have been lost. In the last term of parliament, the coalition supported more than 300,000 Australians into homes. The coalition also recognises the importance of access to social and affordable housing for those vulnerable Australians. The coalition announced in government additional low-cost financing for community housing providers to support social and affordable housing by increasing the guarantee of the liabilities of the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation by $500 million. This is expected to allow the Housing Finance and Investment Corporation to support another 2,500 social and affordable dwellings, in addition to the 14,000 dwellings they have already supported in just three years. So while the coalition does not oppose this change, we do note that the impact of this policy appears to be incredibly modest. Schedule 2 of the bill amends the Tax Administration Act of 1953 to allow protected information to be disclosed to Australian government agencies for the purpose of administering major disaster support programs approved by the Minister. Schedule 3 of the bill amends Schedule 5 of the Coronavirus Measures No. 2 Act. This amendment will extend a temporary mechanism for responsible ministers to make alternative arrangements for meeting information and documentary requirements under Commonwealth legislation, including requirements to give information and to produce witness and sign documents in response to the challenges posed by COVID-19. The amendment extends the date that this mechanism sunsets to 31 December next year. Schedule 5 to the Coronavirus Measures No. 2 Act is a general instrument making power that enables the minister to make a determination adjusting arrangements for meeting information and documentary requirements under Commonwealth legislation in response to COVID-19. This mechanism has been included in Schedule 5 to the Coronavirus Measures Act as a temporary measure terminating at the end of 31 December this year. In light of the ongoing nature of COVID-19, both in Australia and globally, and its effects on the ability of individuals to move freely, the power to amend arrangements for meeting information and documentary requirements remains 
necessary. Schedule 3 to the Bill amends Schedule 5 to the Coronavirus Act to extend the temporary mechanism and to provide determinations made by a responsible minister do not operate under after the sunsetting arrangements. The Coalition implemented this measure as part of our response to COVID-19. The Coalition continued to support sensible and measured responses to manage the risk that COVID-19 provides, while noting that the environment we are operating in today is significantly different from just two years ago. When COVID-19 first broke out, there was no vaccine, there was no knowledge of the risks of the virus, and around the world we saw hospitals overwhelmed as the disease spread rapidly. In Australia, it was estimated that deaths could be in the tens of thousands and the economic impacts could be severe, with unemployment projected by the Treasury to reach 15 per cent. The Coalition's pandemic response put Australia in good stead for today, saved lives and supported our economic recovery. Measures like this played a crucial role in keeping government going through this uncertainty. Measures like this worked alongside our economic support package to keep the country moving forward despite the challenges of the pandemic. Our economic support through COVID-19 kept Australians in job. Australian householders and businesses have been supported by a range of measures announced since the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm confident that in hindsight people see them as necessary and proportionate. So the Coalition welcomes this measure. Finally, Schedule 4 of the Bill and the Income Tax Amendment Labor Mobility Program make amendments to reduce the tax rate on certain income earned by foreign resident workers participating in the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme from marginal rates starting at 32.5 per cent to a flat 15 per cent. Schedule 5 of the Bill amends <coughs> a federal Schedule 5 of the Bill amends the Act to provide for an alternative annual performance test also for faith-based products. APRA may determine that a product is a faith-based product if a trustee for the product provides APRA with a valid application. The bill contains a number of worthwhile measures. Indeed, the most important part of this bill, we believe, is the income tax amendments to facilitate the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme, which are a coalition initiative and one that we are proud of. However, the coalition does, not, does wish to raise some concerns with Schedule 5 of this bill, which implements a Labor election promise to exempt faith-based superannuation products from the Your Future, Your Super performance test. A faith-based super product that fails the performance test will be reassessed by APRA through a secondary test that is adjusted to reflect the fund's faith-based investment strategy. If the fund fails the secondary test, it is subject to the same process as any other fund under the Your Future, Your Super performance test. If it passes the secondary test, it has no further obligations to disclose its performance to its customers. Australia's $3 trillion superannuation system is the fourth largest in the world and is responsible for managing the retirement savings of over 16 million Australians. Your future, your super measures were about modernising and improving the superannuation system to ensure, it work, to ensure it is working harder for Australians. This included the performance test measures designed to ensure that funds are held to account for underperformance and to protect customers from poor outcomes. The performance, test holds, the, the performance test holds funds accountable for the outcomes they're delivering to their members. Its measure, it, is a measure, it measures a fund's net investment performance against an objective benchmark tailored to their investment strategy and measures their administration fees against their peers. That is the Coalition's contribution. And I might just add that the Coalition does intend to move a number of amendments, one in my name and one in Senator Kim's name. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I want to uh, many of the provisions in uh, in uh, this bill are uh, uncontroversial uh, and do uh, enjoy the support of the Australian Greens, but I do want to make a few observations around the matters contained in Schedule 5 uh, of this legislation, which is um, reforms around faith-based superannuation funds. And I want to specifically uh, make some observations on the current uh, superannuation performance testing regime, which is problematic because it does not encourage um, people or superannuation funds to take a truly long-term perspective when deciding where and how to invest retirement savings in Australia. 
And in fact, by singularly focusing on financial returns, the current regime risks undermining people's quality of life in retirement. So financial markets, um, unfortunately, do not take into account that uh, the state of the environment uh, or social harmony are likely to have a large bearing on people's quality of life in retirement. Uh, it is truly a debased system. If the thing you are, you are invested in to maximise financial returns is going to make the world a less habitable and happy place by the time you're old enough to enjoy those returns. I mean, we've got $3.3 trillion in retirement savings in Australia, and that money, to the greatest degree possible, should be invested in a way that protects the planet's life-supporting climate system and our planet's life-supporting ecosystem. And it should be invested in such a way, to the greatest degree possible, that fosters a more caring world for the people who live here and a more inhabitable world for the people who live here. I mean, those are the things that we should aspire to deliver to the greatest degree possible by using our $3.3 trillion retirement saving scheme. Now, this will require making reforms to the superannuation performance testing regime to encourage people and superannuation funds to make a proactive choice to invest money to further environmental and social aims. And further, the performance testing regime should acknowledge that for some people, the pursuit of environmental and social outcomes is actually more important than monetary returns, and it should accommodate and must accommodate their willingness to invest accordingly. Now, Schedule 5 of this bill uh, is narrowly scoped, but it is in accordance with some of those things that I've just spoken about. The problem is it begins the task in a restricted and inequitable way that is likely to undermine the pursuit of these broader goals. This inquiry, uh, the inquiry into this bill that was done uh, by uh, the Senate Economics Committee uh, heard evidence that the nature of the carve-out provided for in Schedule 5 of this bill is, in effect, a form of religious discrimination. And I refer senators to the submission of Associate Professor Scott Donald uh, from the University of New South Wales, who said this, as a practical matter, minority faiths are unlikely to be able to satisfy the requirements, depriving them of the opportunity afforded more affluent mainstream religions to use the supplementary test. And uh, we also heard evidence from uh, Dr Martin uh, Fay around uh, the technical impediments to establishing an alternative um, performance test. But what the inquiry did here is consistent evidence that was summarised in the Chair's report that instead of adopting a selective carve-out for faith-based funds, the government should establish a holistic framework for the performance testing of all values-based superannuation investments. And there is a lot uh, being said and done in the world of ESG at the moment, the world of environmental, um, social uh, and governance uh, issues where uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of corporations, a lot of superannuation funds make a lot of claims about, um, about uh, uh, their ESG frameworks. Uh, and not all those claims, it has to be said, stack up uh, in reality. And one of the, the biggest uh, ESG problems in the, country, in the country, by the way, is uh, the massive flaws in the current carbon offsets scheme, which the government has acknowledged uh, by commissioning a review um, of that scheme. What the Greens um, want to see is the issue of uh, how the performance test should uh, apply and what its provisions should be for values-based 
uh, superannuation funds, including faith-based funds, but not limited to faith-based funds. We want to see that um, uh, determined comprehensively through the current Your Future, Your Super review. And I do understand that the minister is going to make um, a couple of comments on that uh, when she sums up on uh, the second reading debate. Uh, we know, because, um, because I asked them, that Treasury officials um, uh, have, have said that uh, performance testing of broader ESG funds and products are within the scope of the Your Future, Your Super review. So that was made clear um, uh, during uh, the Economics Committee's inquiry into this legislation. It is of critical importance that the establishment of alternative performance tests for values-based investment is done properly and done properly from the start. The integrity and sustainability of the system must be ensured, as well as the opportunity for the entire population to participate. $3.3 trillion, to state the blindingly obvious, is an extremely large pool of money. To the greatest degree possible, this massive pool of money should be directed towards investment into things that actually move our economy to a more sustainable economy and a more low emissions economy. Those are the things that we need to do if we are to address the, the twin crises of the breakdown of our climate and the collapse of our planetary ecosystems. Colleagues, we are living through those things today, and those things are killing Australians at the moment. When we see floods and fires like we have seen the country inundated and burning in recent years, we cannot pretend that climate change is not driving those events to be more frequent and more severe because it is. And we are going to have massive challenges coming down the line, and one of the many things that we need to do to make sure we address those challenges is start directing a greater proportion of that $3.3 trillion in retirement savings in this country out of uh, infrastructure and investments that are either unproductive or counterproductive in terms of addressing the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis and directing more of those investments into areas that are productive in terms of addressing the breakdown of our climate and the collapse of the planetary ecosystem. So we believe that Schedule 5 should not proceed uh, in this legislation, uh, and that is because the issue of how performance tests um, uh, relate to faith-based funds is a small part of a far broader issue that the government has to grapple with, which is how performance tests, uh, how they are couched, how they apply to uh, the entirety of values-based funds, including, most importantly, ESG funds. That needs to be um, considered as part of the Your, Fu Your Future, Your Super review. And we genuinely hope that the government uh, will take those matters on board as part of the review and bring out of that review provisions um, around amending the performance test, uh, its framing and its application for values-based funds that will actually deliver on ensuring that, to the greatest degree possible, we see investment out of that $3.3 trillion into uh, things in our economy that are productive in terms of addressing the breakdown of our climate and the collapse of our ecology. Thank you, Senator um, McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank senators who have contributed to the debate this morning. Uh, Schedule 1 to the Treasury Laws Amendment uh, Measures No. 3 Bill amends the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act 1975 to double the maximum financial penalties for contraventions by foreign investors of provisions that relate to residential property. The Foreign 
Acquisitions and Takeover Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 2022 amends the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Fees Imposition Act 2015 to incorporate the cumulative total of indexation to date in the legislated maximum fee cap. This will align the indexation process in the FATA Fees Act with the indexation process in the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Fees Imposition Regulations 2022. Schedule 2 of the bill amends the taxation secrecy provisions to enable the ATO to share taxation information with the Australian government agency, including states and territory governments, for the purposes of administering major disaster support programs. These amendments will improve Australia's disaster readiness by cutting at red tape and improving the efficiency of disaster recovery processes to simplify and speed up payments to disaster victims. Schedule 3 of the bill extends the operation of a temporary mechanism in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which allows arrangements for, the, for complying with information and documentary requirements to be altered under Commonwealth legislation, including requirements to give information in writing and produce witness and sign documents. The temporary mechanism responds to the ongoing challenges posed by restrictions on movement for individuals during COVID-19. Schedule 4 to the bill, along with the Income Tax Amendment Labor Mobility Program Bill 2022, sets out the income tax arrangements for the foreign resident workers participating in the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility or PALM scheme. The amendments specify that foreign resident workers participating in the PALM scheme will pay a final withholding tax of 15 per cent for each dollar of income earned under the scheme from the 22-23 income year. Workers who are Australian residents for tax purposes will continue to pay ordinary resident tax rates. The government, and I will foreshadow, will be moving an amendment in the committee stage to remove Schedule 5 of the bill, which would have introduced a supplementary performance test for the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority against which to benchmark faith-based superannuation products. This was an election commitment of the government's um, to ensure that Australians of faith have the freedom to choose a fund that invests their super in line with their religious beliefs. But it is clear that the support for that section of the bill or that schedule of the bill isn't here, and we need to talk further with members and senators of this place about how to proceed uh, with that part of the bill. Um, we will look at um, we will let other processes and consultations continue, such as in, with the Your Future, Your Super review. I know there is a lot of interest from senators about the outcomes of the your, your Future, Your Super review. This review will consider the broader question of value-based investments, including, for example, ESG investments. And I would like to thank and acknowledge Senator McKim's um, contribution, his remarks he just made then, but also in his representations to the government on this matter. This is a complex question, and so the review is the appropriate place to give um, a proper consideration to whether there are any reforms needed uh, to avoid unintended consequences. To Australians of faith, we will uh, look at how to deliver on our election commitment and hopefully be able uh, to bring other senators uh, with us um, to make sure that that reform um, can be implemented, but it's, uh, it's clear it doesn't have the support of the Senate at this point in time. And I commend the bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that this bill will be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022, Measures No. 3, Bill 2022, Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 2022, Income Tax Amendment, Labor Mobility Program 2022. You do. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think I will need leave if I move my amendments together, won't I? I seek leave to move government amendments um, 1 and 2 on sheet ZA193 uh, together. Is leave approved? Yes. Leaves approved. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I think I uh, thank you, and I thank the Senate. I think um, 
uh, as I just foreshadowed in the second reading speech, um, that this amendment would be to remove Schedule 5 uh, from the bill, pending further discussions with, with senators about how to proceed uh, with that amendment. Oh, sorry, and I table the supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government's amendment to be moved in these bills. Senator Smith. Hmm. Um, can the minister confirm that the amendment that she's just moved on sheet ZA193 is exactly the same as the opposition's amendment uh, that are recorded at sheet 1732? Um, thank you, Senator Smith. I, oh, sorry, Minister. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry, I jumped too quickly. My understanding is it is. Um, but I, I was unaware you were moving. The government was unaware you were moving that amendment. Certainly, I was unaware you were moving that amendment, and we had ours um, amended ahead of that. Senator Smith. For the record, the opposition's amendment was circulated last week, so it was well aware to the to the chamber. So my second question is, um, why has it been necessary to change the government's position um, from its position in the House of Representatives, where it voted against? the opposition's amendment, which is now your amendment, to its position in the Senate this morning. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, we've uh, changed our position in light of consultations with senators. Senator Smith. My apologies, Senator Gallagher. I didn't hear that. Oh. <laughs> Minister. We, I was, we, we made that decision based on further discussions with senators in this place. Senator. Just oh, wait for the call, Senator Sorry. Smith. Which Senator Smith? Minister. Sorry, Senator Sorry. Smith is still standing. <laughs> I was trying to he work is. out what was going on. Um, well, I can't speak on behalf of the minister, but I'm aware there were discussions um, with senators across across the Senate. I'm certainly aware of discussions that I've had um, with um, Senator McKim and others. Senator, just wait for the call, Senator Smith. Senator Smith. Could you take it on notice and report back to the chamber um, exactly which other senators were consulted um, before the government chose to copy the opposition's amendment? <laughs> Minister, uh, I'll see what I can do to assist the chamber. Uh, Senator Smith. In your in your remarks uh, prior to introducing. Uh, your amendment, which copies the opposition's amendment, which has been circulated for some time, uh, you gave a commitment uh, around further consultation. Can you provide some additional detail to the Senate about what that consultation will entail and with who? Minister. Uh, so, in my second reading speech, I referred to um, the Yours Future Yours Super review. Um, so, I expect those con consultations will be finalised shortly with a report to the minister, um, but uh, for some time early next year, first quarter of next year. Senator Smith, is the government leaving it open to weaken your future your super arrangements? Is the government leaving it open to weaken uh, your future, your super arrangements? Minister. Um, no, that's not the intention, but um, you know, I think we need to wait for that review to be complete. I think it's very difficult for me to stand here and, and answer what would be the outcome of a review that hasn't been provided to the government. Sen uh, Senator Smith, just wait for the call. You can jump, but then you vote for the call. Senator Smith. Um, Government senators, won't government senators be embarrassed to be supporting an amendment in the Senate this afternoon, which House government House members were forced to oppose against, vote against, just Minister. last week? Uh, thank you. Um, no, not at all. And I think you've seen from this government our um, the approach that we are taking as a government, which is to talk and consult and um, and respond. Uh, accordingly, and that's what you've seen with this amendment. It wasn't going to be supported by the Senate. Um, that was clear. Um, and if there is another way that we can address the concerns that the opposition have in respect of this part of the bill, along with uh, concerns um, 
that uh, the crossbench have had with that part of the bill. And if there's a way that we can bring people together and reach agreement on, on that, I think that would be a good thing. Senator Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, why didn't the government use the committee inquiry process and the Senate economics report to advise the Senate and stakeholders more broadly of its intention not to pursue Schedule 5? Minister. Well, the government is always mindful and watches um, Senate committee inquiries and reports, so I have no doubt that um, that fed into some of the minister's considerations as he was resolving this issue. Um, but you know, it's a source of information. It's not the only source. Uh, and further discussions was had, and the government's taken the decision to amend the bill in light of those discussions. Senator Smith, why? Did the consultations happen only after the bill was introduced to the parliament? Minister? Well, I don't think that's necessarily an unusual way of, of doing things. I mean, quite often we um, develop legislation and then that legislation is amended after further discussion with um, MPs and senators. So, in that respect, this is a very un unsurprising. Um, amendment. It happens regularly. It happened when you were in government. Uh, it will continue to happen, in, when, particularly when you're in a chamber, uh, a minority chamber, where the government, you know, can't act alone. We have to work across the chamber. We try to work collegiately. I think as much as we can in this place, and this is just another example of that. Um. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to rise to uh, foreshadow that I'll be voting for the amendments moved by both the government and the coalition. We Australians all deserve to be in a high-performing superannuation product, and if they're not, they at least deserve to know that they're not and they should be armed with as much information as possible. I support the coalition amendments to put back into place the annual member meeting notices and to move them into primary legislation. I think this is an important step as the current uh, regulations, as I've said previously, are not ideal. And, uh, in amending the regulations, the parliament had limited time to provide scrutiny before they came into effect ahead of the reporting season. So we've effectively had most of the super funds report and not had to disclose at that level of transparency. Um, when it comes to faith-based super, uh, I have real concerns about those sorts of carve-outs and believe that that should be uh, address as long as, as uh, alongside um, sort of more ESG or, or uh, ethical focused fund as part of the broader review and and and, and pleased to see the government introduce uh, an amendment um, as as we know the the coalitions uh, would have would have got up on on the numbers so I really think more transparency is, is crucial when it comes to superannuation. Members deserve to know how much they're paying in fees and how, how their super, um, super company is paying directors, making donations to, to, to various bodies, and will support any measure in here to increase that transparency. Thank you, Senator Pocock. So I'll put the question in regard to clause two and schedule five, that schedule five stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. Uh, I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, I'll put the question that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Senator Smith, I heard that. Um, I'll put the question again. 
that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. We won't move to that. So, um, under the circumstances, we won't do uh, move the opposition um, amendment that's listed, and we, but we will move to cross two at the end of the bill. Sorry, um, Senator Smith. Move amendment. I'll now move amendment on sheet one seven double three. Um, sorry, Senator, Senator Smith, Hume's I just hand. need to give you to seek leave okay, for you. So is leave granted for Senator Smith? Yes, leave's granted. Thank you, Senator Smith. I'm going to move uh, sheet, uh, move the amendment on sheet one seven three three that's been circulated in Senator Hume's name. Uh, the government won't be supporting this amendment. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, Chair. Look, I'll just uh, inform the Chamber that the Australian Greens also will not be um, supporting this amendment. It's our view that the matters uh, dealt with in, um, in this amendment are uh, uh, matters best left to regulation, not uh, inserted uh, into legislation. Um, in recent times, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, about uh, the transparency regime for uh, super funds. Senator Pocock has been an active participant in, uh, in those discussions, uh, and of course that's a good thing. Uh, but in the view of the Greens, um, we've got a situation where uh, there are currently uh, regulations introduced by, uh, by the government um, post this year's election. Uh, those are regulations that currently um, uh, have had uh, two disallowances moved, one by me on behalf of the Australian Greens and, uh, and one by Senator Lambie. And it's, um, it's strongly uh, the view of the Australian Greens that uh, that, that is um, the appropriate um, forum for uh, discussion and decision rather than um, the uh, way forward proposed by this amendment, which is uh, effectively to legislate rather than to regulate. No other speakers? Um, I'll put the motion that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? No. I think the noes have it. Division? Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments one and two on sheet 1733, standing in the name of Senator Humes, and I think is moved by Senator Smith, be agreed to. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, against to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye Senator Scar and teller for the no Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 34 noes, it's passed in the negative. <laughs> Does any honourable senator wish to make a further contribution in the Committee of the Whole? I intend to put the final questions before we report on the committee. The question now is that the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 3, Bill 2022, as amended, be agreed to and the remaining bills stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 3, Bill 2022 and two related bills and agreed to them with amendment. Minister. I move that the report be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. I put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clerk. Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 3 Bill 2022, Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 2022, Income Tax Amendment. Labor Mobility Program Bill 2022. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Corruption Commission Bill 2022, National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> uh, Deputy President. Sorry. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Thanks, leave is granted. Now, shortly to go to two-minute statements, I ask members to prepare themselves. We have now reached the hard marker. Senator Van. I have just come from a hearing into the Iranian regime, and what we have heard loud and clear is that this government is absolutely useless when it comes to taking actions against authoritarian regimes. Then, them to keep on talking about their concerns and not doing anything about it is disgusting. There is a protest going on out the front right now, people calling on this government to do more, to take sanctions, put sanctions against authoritarian regimes. When we were in government, straight after the invasion of Russia, we imposed sanctions on Russian authoritarian members of the Duma and, uh, and the oligarchs. There are members of the Iranian Guard that should be, have sanctions against them. There are more things that the Australian government should be doing. I heard one of my friends that I met in Kiev earlier uh, in this year, Inna Sovson, talk about how bad the winter is, how she has no heat, no electricity. Yet this government won't declare Russia a terrorist state. The EU has, and rightly so. I call on this government to put sanctions on the Iranian regime. I call on this government to, put, uh, to declare Russia a terrorist state in line with international law. There is so much that we can do. There is so much that we should do. Yet this government is doing nothing. All we hear is rhetoric. All we hear from the Prime Minister and from the Foreign Minister is, oh, we're concerned, oh, we condemn this. But they're taking absolutely no action. People out there, people out in front of Parliament House right now, want this government to take action now. Senator Smith. Acting Deputy President, the gig economy is both responding to and shaping our changing world. But as the economy changes around us, too many workers are being left behind. Indeed, some of the global businesses benefiting most from this change have some of the worst industrial conditions of all. And some aren't just profiting from insecure work, they are actively championing need. Convenience for consumers matters, but not at any cost. Last Friday was Black Friday, a huge day of spending for consumers around the world. But it was also Make Amazon Pay Day where workers, unions and activists across our world stood together in the fight for justice and fairness within the gig economy. These workers, in partnerships with their unions like the SDA and the Transport Workers' Union back here in Australia, are calling for an end to poor working conditions and low wages, especially for Amazon workers. Workers like Simadeep, a gig economy worker from Adelaide and proud member of the TWU in South Australia, who recently took the time to share his story with me. Simadeep has worked in the gig economy for over a year because he wanted the flexibility the work might be able to offer him. He decided to try out Amazon Flex, attracted to their promises on working conditions, flexibility and pay. But after just one shift, these promises had completely fallen apart. And his story is not unique. The Americanisation of wages and working conditions in Australia cannot be allowed to continue. And that's why I'm proud to stand alongside workers and their representatives in the SDA and the Transport Workers Union who have been working tirelessly to protect all that workers and our union movement have fought for over generations. A secure job with a fair wage does not have to be a thing of the past for Australian workers. 
because no degree of convenience is worth that sort of price. Senator Little. Thank you. In the Senate Education and Employment Committee, experienced union delegates admitted the Albanese government's union-inspired industrial relations legislation will likely increase membership. In South Australia, my home state, yesterday an Adelaide tram rolled past completely wrapped in CFMEU slogan, a union of opportunity. The membership drive has already begun. Yes, the unions know the significant changes to Australia's industrial relations system is a gift because they imagined it, developed it, and the Albanese government, with the support of Senator Pocock, will likely deliver it. It is bad for business and bad for workers with no evidence that it will result in higher wages or increased productivity. That matters to South Australia, where the construction industry is a major employer of nearly 75,000 people, equivalent to 8.6 per cent of the total workforce and contributing $8 billion to gross state product in 2020-21. Adelaide property developers are currently reconsidering large-scale projects, and there's already been picketing of construction sites outlawed under the current legislation. In SA, the FF CFMEU is the subject of eight new investigations. The ABCC has issued 1.2 million in penalties in South Australia since 2016. Trade union membership Australia-wide has been in de decline, decline for decades and stands at 14 per cent nationally and in South Australia. Labor governments say they stand for regulation, transparency and women, but not, it seems, when it relates to paymasters. During the SA state election, the state Labor Party accepted, then later returned, a CFMEU donation of some 125000 In the Senate committee, a union-aligned organisation told us it draws the line in accepting donations from the CFMEU because of its treatment of women. That's a shame for all of us. My apologies for misordering the list earlier. Senator Hanson Young. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise today to talk on the topic of greenwashing, a word that should have been made the word of the year. It is everywhere. It's in the products that we buy as consumers, it's in the rhetoric we hear from governments, and of course, it's in the annual reports of big corporations. It is literally everywhere. And the reason it is so prevalent is because Australians and people right around the world know that we have to start looking after our environment desperately before we've lost things for good. They know we need to start reducing pollution before our atmosphere and planet is truly well in, and well and truly choked. They know we need to act, and they want to be able to use their consumer power to do it. They want to be able to buy products that are genuinely environmentally friendly. They want to back companies that are doing the right thing in terms of sustainability. They want to make sure their governments hear their cries for action when it comes to climate change and protecting the environment. Whether it is the spin of what's going on with the Middle Arm project in the Northern Territory, deleting the words petrochemicals on the government's own website to pretend that that project is indeed environmentally friendly, when, of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, we know that it's not. Greenwashing is a scourge, and it needs to be stopped, it needs to be uh, confronted, and governments need to act. The ACCC and ASIC both have inquiries into this issue. I commend them for that. But when will we start to see the regulatory teeth delivered to make sure consumers, voters and people right across the country can know they can trust the information that's coming, not just from corporations, not just from businesses, but from the very government themselves. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Part of my role running through the Kimberley is working closely with communities through uh, the Kimberley, as uh, Senator Sullivan would know my work and his work in Fitzroy Crossing. But Fitzroy Crossing has two surface stations, Nyali Roadhouse on your right hand side as you're coming in, BP, fuel and owned by the Aboriginal Corporation. Then at the other end is the Coles Express, where the fuel comes from Viva. Nyali made the decision, working closely with Nilindingari Health Services, to stop the sale of 95 unleaded, because unfortunately kids were breaking in. I have sat there and watched the kids uh, breaking into the pumps to get the fuel. It was very frustrating because Viva Energy refused to cut off as a community directive, a community request to stop the sale of 95 to save these young kids. 
So I just want to take this opportunity with, and thank a few people because now we've achieved it. We've worked closely with Anthony Collard and his mob at Nilindingari, Senior Sergeant uh, Larry Miller from the Fitzroy Police Station. Larry, thank you very much, mate, working closely with you. And Victoria Bond from Shell, uh, uh, from, sorry, from Coles Express. Magnificent achievement. We're finally we shamed Viva in. They wanted to use all sorts of different locks. They had all these grand plans about cages. They didn't want to take this product out of Fitzroy Crossing for the odd tourist that comes through and wants to get 95. As you and I both know, Senator O'Sullivan, they can go to Willera or they can get it from Halls Creek. Finally, common sense prevailed. So congratulations to the Fitzroy community. Congratulations, Senior Sergeant Larry Miller, on your fine work. And I'm happy to report that now those bowsers have been removed. And I must say, it is very, very comforting and very, re very rewarding to know that I don't have to sit there with Larry anymore and look at footage of kids as young as 11 years of age breaking into these bowsers to desperately get their hands on 95 petrol to sniff. And I don't have to say that the health consequences will follow. So congratulations to Fitzroy Crossing. Senator Roberts. Thank you. At this morning's national prayer breakfast, a young Queensland servicewoman, a vibrant woman, whose name I'll post when it comes through, called on our leaders to show the power of love rather than the love of power. Amen to that. We've seen enough love of power these last three years to last a lifetime. Australians in Victoria went to the polls on Saturday to sit in judgment of the most controversial of those actions. Good and decent Australians chose not to judge the past and instead to look to the future, and we must accept that decision. The research and science now underway will decide the truth and consequences of our COVID response. This must be in the context of a royal commission whose politics can be excluded and truth determined. I hope the parties that introduce these measures will have the courage to allow fair and impartial scrutiny and demonstrate the power of love of the people. No matter the outcome of that Royal Commission, Australia has a tremendous challenge ahead to heal the wounds of our COVID response, tend to the sick no matter the cause, unite families divided physically and philosophically, and to put this country, beautiful country of ours, back the way it was so that we can once again call ourselves a lucky country. The anger on the booths on the weekend and on social media is not helping. The time for vitriol and division is over. One Nation will assist this parliament in framing legislation that makes clear the responsibilities and obligations on each level of government, parliamentary and administrative, the next time our nation is tested. It would be a failure of oversight for the Senate to not sort out the governance. We will offer our vision for bringing Australia back together as a community a vision to build, to grow, to uplift all who call our beautiful nation home. One Nation did record a very strong start to our presence in Victoria, and I thank our candidates and supporters for all their hard work. Thank you. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one nation together. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Transitioning from defence life to civilian life can be a difficult process. Military service is a unique experience and it brings with it a range of skills that can help our veterans navigate their way through civilian employment. Unfortunately, this practical experience and training does not always translate well into recognised qualifications in the civilian world. A review of defence training establishments found that the training provided there was not in line with civilian training establishments. This meant that employment training for many defence members no longer provided the same civilian recognised certificate it used to. For those living, uh, leaving the ADF, the defence RTO can be used free of charge to have their skills recognised, but for anyone still serving full time, they need to pay a civilian run RTO for that service. For members whose military training has not entirely translated into civilian qualifications, it can be difficult for an employer to understand what those skills mean. For places like Canberra, where military service is a boon in a CV, this isn't much of an obstacle, but Canberra's biting winter is not for everyone. Uh, for those who return to a home where the service is not always understood, there are guides to that uh, that, can, uh, that try to translate military skills into plain language, but a decades-long career boiled down to a one-page document doesn't always cut it. To better support the ADF personnel transitioning to the civilian world, more education and resources are needed for employers who may not realise the goldmine 
that they have in an ex-ADF member looking to join their employment. Senator Payman. Acting Deputy President, the 29th of November is the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, and I want to express my solidarity and acknowledge their inviolable rights. Demonstrating my solidarity matters to me, and it matters to many people from my community in Western Australia who hope for peace, justice, and an enduring two-state solution. It is easy to despair at the lack of progress towards these goals and at the steep costs to human life, which are not felt only in Palestine but here in Australia as well. In the West Bank, Palestinian families live under military occupation and all aspects of their lives are controlled. People living in the West Bank should have the right to live in their own homes without the ever-present threat of being forcibly removed, that a bomb will level their home or that they'll be subject to a blockade. The arrest and imprisonment of Shadi Khoury is one example that I'd like to draw to the Senate's attention. The 16-year-old boy was arrested on the 18th of October, taken from his parents without an explanation for his arrest or information about where he was being taken. This is too common for Palestinian families. Israel is the only country in the world that systemically prosecutes children in military courts that lack fundamental fair trial rights and protections. Between 500 and 700 Palestinian children face military courts each year, courts which have 99% conviction rate for Palestinians. Shadi remains in prison inside Israel where his parents can't visit him. A 16-year-old child should not be taken and held like this from, away from his family. Labor has long supported an enduring just two-state solution to the conflict, and I'm proud that this government recognizes the rights of both Palestine and Israel to exist peacefully as two states with secure and recognized borders. Senator Wish Wilson. It's the last week of federal parliament. It's the last week of federal parliament under a new Labor Albanese government. And sadly and frustratingly, Australian a Walkley Award-winning journalist, publisher and citizen Julian Assange still sits in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison in the UK without having been charged. The world's most famous political prisoner. What are we doing to help Julian? The Albanese government said publicly that he's suffered enough and that this has got to come to an end. But what pressure are they exerting on our US allies and UK allies to release Julian Assange? I just wanted to say to Julian, standing in the Australian Senate, that we are not giving up the fight for you. If anything, we are ramping it up. I've just come from a parliamentary Friends of Assange group. With over 35 MPs are now participating. The movie, Ithaca, about your amazing father, John Shipton, and your family and their fight for you is starting to show across cinemas in Germany early next year and across cinemas in the US. The world is waking up to this egregious abuse of power, this injustice. They are waking up to the fact that you only publish the truth. And what you've published has actually helped us understand the systems and the institutions that we're all part of and has helped the world become a better place. We are not giving up the fight for you, Julian. Stay strong over Christmas. Whether you be in Belmarsh Prison or in a US maximum security prison, we are thinking of you and we are there for you. Senator Babbitt. Senator Wish Wilson, I agree with you. Julian Assange needs to be brought back home. Now, Australian education is in crisis. We are failing our students. We are failing the next generation. In international testing, the performance of Australian students has, has been nosediving every year since international testing began, and frankly, it's not good enough. We are failing, failing to fix a system that is obviously broken. Now, one of the problems with our schools is that for too much of every day, students are not engaged in education, rather in indoctrination. Mm. Students are no longer taught how to think, 
but what they should think. They are not being taught to think critically. Our curriculums are crowded with woke programs and alarmist climate indoctrination, which has young, impressionable children living in fear of an impending apocalypse that will never come. Australia also has some of the most disruptive classrooms in the world, with one recent study finding that we rank 70 out of 77 for countries uh, in student behaviour in the OECD. What we need to do, or should do, is take a leaf out of the book of Catherine Burbel Singh, who has been dubbed Britain's strictest headmistress. She turned a school in, for some of London's poorest students into one of the UK's standout success stories. She created a culture where staff are not only respected, but students are performing at an above average level compared to other similar schools. And what is the secret? Instilling good old fashioned values and strict discipline. And most importantly, implementing a back to basic curriculum and an insistence that children behave courteously and work hard. We can turn around our education system and have better outcomes and return to the top of the class if we just go back to basics. Yeah, yeah. Senator Rustin. Um, Madam Acting Deputy. Um, I rise today to speak about the rising flood waters uh, currently impacting my home area of the Riverland in South Australia. Modelling shows that the floods that are about to hit the Riverland are likely to be the highest water levels we've seen in over 50 years, in fact, the highest water levels we've seen since 1956. And I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the community. Um, the SES, the councils um, of all of the people in the Riverland, including our very hard-working local member Tim Whetstone, as they prepare for the flows that are going to inundate our communities over the summer period. And everybody in the Riverland is going to be impacted in some way by these events, from the families who have riverfront shacks, the tourism operators like the caravan parks who will not be able to access their fantastic summer trade as the skiers won't be able to come up to the caravan parks, to the primary producers and irrigators who are likely to be without power for that period, the small business owners who are still only just recovering from the impacts of COVID, uh, and those that will be impacted by road closures, making it difficult for them to get to and from work. And that's why it's so important, as we prepare for this serious event, we need to make sure that tourists to the Riverland are encouraged to still visit. Because despite the media reporting, it is still safe to visit this really beautiful part of my home state of South Australia. And it's an incredible time for them to be visiting. Now is a once in a lifetime opportunity to witness the river come alive. With water flows at record high, our whole river system is flourishing with wildlife. You can also visit the local wineries, the breweries and distilleries, indulge in the spectacular Riverland produce, which is never better than it is during our summer period, and enjoy an, a fantastic climate. But of course, as much of this is as a spectacle, we also need to respect it. So please come to the Riverland and enjoy it this summer. Senator Lambie. Madam Deputy President, it's been three years since I had Tasmania's housing debt waived. I haven't regretted my decision for a minute. I do believe that we need to go back and look at the stage three tax cuts. But if I had to do it all over again, I would. The deal was that the $157 million saved from the housing debt had to go into, back into housing in Tasmania. So I thought I should give you an update on what that money has actually done so far, also thanking the former Premier, Premier Gutwin. And I want to thank the State Housing Minister also, Barnett, for giving me these details, as he does every three months. So far, $58.4 million has been spent, and it's helped to build or support over 300 homes in Tasmania. The money has purchased 32 units in Glenorchy for supported accommodation, the construction of 23 new crisis accommodation units for young people in Burnie. Over $7 million has gone towards buying land for future housing developments and supporting affordable housing projects. $2 million has gone to the private rental incentive program to help more Tasmanians get into affordable housing. This money has made a huge difference in Tasmania, and there's still more money to go. But I also know that our housing crisis is as bad as ever. My office receives calls every single day from people who are home homeless. We're under no delusion about this. People are sleeping in their tents or in their cars or couch surfing. And there are people sleeping rough who, can, who easily who, who can easily afford rent, but there's just nothing available. 
The federal government says they have a goal to build one million new homes. We have no idea what that plan is or when the building will start. Yet we have the housing minister from Tasmania, that's who the Federal Housing Commissioner is, Julia Collins from um, Tasmania. I haven't seen her stand up and give the public any answers, all Tasmanians, on what this policy looks like. So seriously, if you could stand up, give some Tasmanians relief, tell us how many houses we're getting built, when they're going to be built and who's building them, that would be great. It might give us a little bit more stability down there and show you're actually bloody serious. Senator Waters. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Each year for the past decade, the Counting Dead Women Australia researchers of Destroy the Joint have documented the deaths of women killed by violence. Their interrogation of media, police and court reports gives us the only real-time toll of gendered violence. Their work keeps a spotlight on the epidemic of violence to make sure that we do not forget the names of those who have been killed. This is harrowing work that should be done by the government. Shamefully, 40 women have been killed by violence so far this year. Almost all of these women were killed by someone they knew. This is a confronting national crisis and we must not look away. We need cultural change to achieve gender equality, full funding of frontline response and prevention services and respectful relationships and consent education in all schools. Today I honour the memory of the women killed by violence in 2022. Viterina Bruce, Sheena Fairfield, Emily Thompson, Christine Barker, Nadia Louise Spice, Louise Hughes, Barbara Wilshire, Susan Duffy, Lameda Fadlala, Amne Al Hazuri, Tanya Tricky, Flory Corey Rubin, Eileen Liu, Marie Schwartz, an unnamed 82 year old woman, Shireen Kumar, an unnamed 33 year old woman, a woman known as AK, Cheryl Johnson, Shirley Kidd, Phoebe McIntosh, Donna Howe, Chen Sheng, Danielle Jordan, an unnamed 47 year old woman, Linda Simon, Mackenzie Anderson, an unnamed 26 year old woman, Susan Walker, Sharon Simmons, Kylie Griffiths, Cinnamon Bell, an unnamed 52 year old woman, Vanessa Godfrey, Angela Hoita, Amina Hyatt, Christine Stefan, Krishna Kopra, Poonam Sharma, and an unnamed 45 year old woman. They are 40 women killed by a current or former partner, 40 too many. We need to eradicate this scourge of violence against women. Senator Askew. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, standing up in front of people and talking, whether it is for a job interview, a lecture, conference, or even here in this chamber can be daunting. The speaker must be calm, confident and articulate. For some, though, these skills do not come easily. Speaking well can make or break a situation, and this skill is becoming increasingly important for employers when evaluating potential employees on soft skills like leadership, communication and problem solving. To this end, I'd like to highlight the work of Tasmanian Rostrum, which works with people of all ages in my home state to improve their public speaking skills. They are high school and university students, employees, retirees, people for whom English is a second language and even aspiring politicians. All want to improve their ability to communicate with others. There are seven Rostrum clubs in Tasmania, three in Hobart, two in Launceston and two in Burnie. They are part of Rostrum Australia, an association of 95 public speaking clubs around the country that was founded in 1930. Earlier this year, two young Tasmanians competed in the 2022 Rostrum Voice of Youth National Final in Sydney. Isabel Adams from the Friends School in Hobart was a junior finalist, while Oscar Tiernan from Launceston College competed in the senior section and was named runner-up. The Voice of Youth competition attracts more than 3,000 students every year from over 500 schools. So Oscar's achievement is an incredible result. Well done, Oscar. Isabel and Oscar illustrate how Tasmania is punching above its weight in this area. Every human being needs to communicate and be understood. Our ability to speak clearly and with confidence is essential for day-to-day -day conversation and interaction. If you have the opportunity to become part of a club or a community like Rostrum that teaches you a valuable life skill, no matter what your age, then it's an opportunity worth pursuing. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise in solidarity with Terry O'Toole and Flight Attendants Association. Last week, more than 1,000 Qantas domestic flight attendants voted on whether to take industrial action. A resounding 99 per cent voted yes. Qantas flight attendants have suffered a four-year 
pay freeze. After inflation, they have taken a massive real wage cut. They were furloughed during the pandemic, and stuck with, but stuck with Qantas. Their average annual pay is just $48,000. Just $48,000 to be the first and only responder to all in-cabin emergencies. Just $48,000 to be working at all times of the day and night across time zones. And just $48,000 to miss school runs, birthdays and family functions. I'd challenge anyone in this chamber or on the Qantas board to support their families on an income of $48,000 a year. All credit to the SDA, you make more stacking shelves at Woolworths. But what does Qantas offer them? Their offer is longer hours with a shorter rest break between shifts and a below inflation pay rise for future payments of just 3 per cent. This is a slap in the face when Qantas just announced it would make a record half-year profit of $1.4 billion. That's a lovely Christmas bonanza for Alan Joyce and his shareholders, and a fat lump of coal for Qantas flight attendants. So for anyone wondering how the brilliant Qantas leadership made so much profit this year, here's your answer. It's been snatched out of the hands of working mums and dads who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads this Christmas. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, we will now move to question time, and I call Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. And I refer the Minister to an answer he gave in question time last Thursday, when he suggested that one of Australia's most respected business advocacy groups was uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry was misleading its members and was wrong. Has the Minister himself reached out to Aki? in order to address the issues outlined in question time. Thank you, Senator Dunian. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Dunian. Well, hasn't it been a bad weekend to be a Liberal? It's been a bad weekend to be a Liberal. We've had the Victorian election results, all those claims about 15 seconds. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Uh, uh, Madam oh, sorry, President. Sorry, Senator Dunham. I can't hear you for the noise in the chamber. I Senator can't hear Dunham. you, President. Um, look, uh, President, a point of order on relevance. and I appreciate Senator Watts uh, uh, observing of weekend's events. I had a question about a question he Thank answered you. last Thursday. Yes, I will direct the minister to the question. Uh, please move to the question. Thank you. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I have not, as the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry and Emergency Management, I will admit that speaking to Aki has not been my highest priority because we have other ministers who have direct contact with them. Uh, but what I will say is that I've been having a lot of contact with stakeholders in my portfolio lately, and one of the things that they keep saying to me is that they are incredibly relieved to finally have a government that is prepared to listen to them, that is prepared to actually get out there and listen to them on issues like agriculture, fisheries, forestry and emergency management, rather than National Party or Liberal Party ministers that used to walk in, lecture them and tell them how things were going to be without actually listening. So I'm very happy to talk about the relationships I've got with, my, with stakeholders in my portfolios. But as I was saying, it has been a bad weekend to be a Liberal, especially in Victoria. I don't know how Senator Henderson must be feeling after all the, uh, the carry-on that we saw from Senator Henderson in the weeks leading up to the election. But it wasn't just the Victorian election that made it a bad weekend to be a Liberal. We had more revelations about former Prime Minister Scott Morrison um, and all those Senator tricks Watt, he played. Senator Watt, uh, you have drifted, and I would draw your attention back to the question. Thank Tell you, Senator Watt. The the, uh, well, uh, thank you, President. I respect your ruling. I thought I had addressed the question by, by talking about uh, the fact that I'd been concentrating speaking to stakeholders in my portfolios rather than uh, stakeholders in other uh, portfolios. But what is probably going to be hardest for the Liberal Party to accept this week is that the decade of low wages that they presided over is finally at an end. Finally at an end. Uh, because we have reached agreement with Senator David Pocock. Uh, as to our policies about industrial relations, and they are going to get wages moving again, something that we know certain employer groups don't want to support, and we certainly know the Liberal Party doesn't want to support. But those days are over. Wages are going to get moving thank again, you, Minister, and that's going to be good for business too. Expired. Senator Dunian, first uh, supplementary. Thank you, President. Let's try and come back to what I was asking about, and I refer again to the Minister's answer of last Thursday, where he queried, and I quote, so are uh, Aki telling us they're opposed to a wage rise, followed by a sarcastic comment where he said, oh, shock horror. 
Does the minister agree that it's extraordinary for a cabinet minister to so petulantly attack a key stakeholder about their concerns about job creation? Uh, minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I don't think it would be any surprise to anyone that a, a, one of Australia's largest employer groups uh, would not be particularly keen on reforms to an industrial relations system which offers workers the chance of a pay rise. Uh, we, know that, we know that a lot of employer groups uh, supported the former government's industrial relations legislation, uh, and that's okay. They're entitled to their view. Uh, it would hardly be surprising that the union movement is supportive uh, of laws being changed so that workers can actually get a, a pay rise. Uh, so we are totally unapologetic about the fact that we are bringing in laws that will bring to an end the decade of deliberate low wage growth that was at the centre of the former government's economic policy. We understand there will be some people who won't be happy about it. We understand there will be millions of workers in Australia who will be very happy about the fact that we finally have a government that is prepared to put their interests first and give them the pay rise that they've been waiting for over a decade to enjoy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Given the minister has just confirmed that that's his intent and what he said, will the minister now apologise to Aki and to its members for his anti-employer and anti-job creative rant last week. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, if there's one group of people who should be apologising when it comes to industrial relations, it's the Liberal Party of Australia. They should be apologising for the decade of low wage growth that they forced upon every single working Australian in this country. They should also apologise for the low productivity uh, that was delivered to business uh, as a result of their conflict-driven uh, anti-agreement policies that actually hurt the interests of workers and businesses. I predict this week is going to be the week where the full reality of the federal election defeat is going to finally hit home with the Liberal Party. They are finally waking up to the fact uh, that, their, that their decade of low wages is coming to an end because they lost the election, and they lost it to a government that had a, a central platform of getting wages moving again. We are going to deliver on the mandate that we received from the Australian people to get uh, wages moving again. I know it's going to be very, very hard for the Liberal Party, especially those from the Victoria, state of Victoria after the weekend they had, but every worker is counting on us delivering this and we're going to do it. Thank you, Minister. What, Senator Sheldon? And my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Albanese Labor government went to the federal election with a commitment to get wages moving after a decade of neglect by the Liberals and Nationals. How would the government's industrial relations policy agenda benefit Australian workers? Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, the President, and thank you to Senator Sheldon for the question, and thank you and many on this side for their uh, continued commitment to ensuring Australian workers get a decent share. Yeah. Get a decent share, both before they were in the parliament and subsequently. And, and unlike those opposite, uh, we have a different view about the importance of getting wages moving again. Because the reality is, as Senator Sheldon outlined in his question, we had a government. Australia had a government for 10 years for whom low wages were a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. A deliberate design feature of the Australian economy, uh, and they've never resolved from that. They've never resolved from that. They didn't resolve from it in the federal election campaign, where they opposed a dollar, a dollar a wage increase. They don't resolve from it now. They continue. They continue to argue that ensuring that Australian workers get a decent share, a decent share of the economic benefits that this nation produces, is somehow a disaster for the Australian economy. Well, we on this side have a different view, and so too uh, do so many working people across Australia. And with RIR policy and legislation, this is, we are making a choice, a choice to end the era of deliberate wage stagnation, a choice uh, to uh, get wages moving again, uh, obviously, also a choice to work to close the gender pay gap, to take long overdue steps to put gender equity at the heart of our workplace lawyers, a choice to improve job security and a choice to wind up those institutions established with nothing more than a political agenda to promote conflict. It is a bill that will help. It is a bill and a policy agenda that will help real people real people, workers across this country or for too long who have paid the price of the coalition's view that we weren't allowed to get wages moving you, again Senator in this Wong. country. That's Senator Sheldon's first supplementary. Can the minister outline how the government's industrial relations policy agenda 
will benefit Australian businesses. Minister. But those on the other side, to, come, to, to try and distract attention uh, from, from the fact that they actually don't want wages to increase, as demonstrated by the last 10 years, have focused a lot on small business and a lot on a scare campaign, which Senator Watt has very effectively, very effectively shot down in this chamber. I would remind those opposite that rates of bargaining for small businesses have dropped by over 60 per cent between 2010 and this year. That is under you. So, unlike you, we think it's a good thing to support small business participating in bargaining if they want to. Why? Because bargaining can help make a business more productive and flexible. That's why we have the Cooperative Workplaces Bargaining Stream, which is especially relevant to small business. Uh, it ensures that business can opt into relevant agreements negotiated by their industry associated association. And of course, we will provide funding to, fair, to the Fair Work Commission to provide small business bargaining support. You pretend to be Thank the friends Minister, of small your business. Time has expired. But are you? Senator MacDonald. Senator MacDonald. Order. I have a senator on her feet. Thank you. My question is to oh, the minister. Sa sorry, Senator Macdonald. <laughs> I'm way ahead of myself. No wonder you all look confused. Sorry, Senator Sheldon. Second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister outline how the government's industrial relations policy agenda will benefit the Australian economy? Thank you, Minister. Uh, the policy, our, our legislation and our approach makes gender equity an objective of the Fair Work Act, bans pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts, creates panel, two expert panels in the Commission to deal with pay equity and the care and community sector, ensures employers have a duty to prevent sexual harassment, makes the sexual harassment dispute process fairer and more effective, empowers the Fair Work Commission to settle disputes over flex flexible work requests by arbitration at necess if necessary, and pro prohibits Prohibits advertising jobs at below legal minimum wages and, importantly, does what 18 out of 26 OECD countries does, which is to prioritise multi-employer bargaining. You know, those opposite seem to think that the, the sky will fall down. You're behind the OECD, and the reason that so many of our competitor economies are going down this path going down this path is because it's good for productivity and it's good for cooperation. We want to get wages moving again. You Thank are stuck you, in the 10 Your years of wage stagnation. Expired. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, I refer to the Prime Minister's comments on 2 September 2022. When asked if there would be a new mining tax, he said, and I quote, no. That's not on the agenda. Minister, can you guarantee Labor will not implement any new mining tax? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Thank you, President. And um, I, thank, I thank the Senator Order. for the question. And um, I don't recall specifically, or well, I, I don't know everything the Prime Minister said going back to the 2nd of September, but I know he has been consistent in his language in that regard. Uh, and um, I, I have not heard like that is what he's been saying. Um, that is certainly the position of the government. Uh, but we are, can I just say, we are a mature and responsible government that's dealing with a very, very significant increases in prices for energy and an energy system that is creaking and collapsing under the weight of a decade of inaction from those opposite. Yeah, 22 yeah. failed energy policies, never landed one of them. The power was going to go out. The power was going to go out pretty much the Senator day we took, we took office. Since then we've had supply shortages, we've got cost escalation, we had the member for Hume who hid an increase in prices. Uh, so we are dealing and trying to clean up the complete and total shambles that we inherited. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator. I answered the Minister, question. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. It is to relevance. I specifically asked, can she guarantee there will be no mining tax? Uh, the minister is being relevant to the, uh, your question. Thank you, um, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. And I did, uh, I did answer the question up front. Um, the government has no plans for a mining tax. 
Um, the Prime Minister has been very clear on that. The Treasurer has been clear on that. But I am further to my question, further to the uh, information, for the information Order. of those opposite. The government is in this area, in the area of the of energy, which I think has been linked to questions around tax increases. Um, we are cleaning up a complete and total mess that you left us. That's the reality. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. That's the work that we are doing, and we will continue to do uh, whilst we hold the office of. of um, uh, thank while you, we Minister. Were in government. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. Minister, I refer to revel revelations on the 11th of November 2022 that your cabinet was considering implementing a mining tax. Does this mean the Prime Minister is considering breaking this promise? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't know uh, where that comment has come from, and I don't speak about matters that are being discussed in Cabinet, but I refer you to my previous answer that I just gave you around um, the Prime Minister and his commitments. And we are not a government that breaks promises. Um, so as, as hard— Order. As Order. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. We Minister, order, 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 order. I'm waiting for quiet so I can call the minister back to answer her question. Minister. Uh, thank you. We deliver on our commitments. We deliver on our promises. It's why we've delivered an increase in the minimum wage. It's why we've held the Jobs and Skills Summit. It's why our, uh, we're cleaning up the aged care mess. It's why we passed the climate change bill. It's why we're debating the National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation later this week. It's why we passed laws for cheaper childcare. It's why the budget had making medicines cheaper. It's why we passed domestic, paid domestic and family violence leave. Because we are a government that delivers on our commitments, every single Thank one you, of them. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Well, Minister, it looks like it's, uh, it's Labor looks like it's broken its promise on ruling out a mining tax. Labor has broken its promise on a $275 cut in electricity prices. Labor has broken its promise on, on multi-employer bargaining. How many promises will you, more promises will you break? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, thank you. We're a government that keeps out all of our commitments, and as I'll continue to go through them, I'll continue to go through them. You are wrong. You are wrong uh, in the assertion in your uh, question. It's simply wrong. We have abolished the cashless debit card. We have uh, we've started the work on an Indigenous voice to parliament. We've got the plan for an end of violence against women. We've, we're investing in the NBN. We've got the Women's Order. Economic Equality Task Order. Force. We have not stopped. Every single day we come to work is to implement the commitments we took to the Australian people to make Australia a better place for people and to fix up the mess, the destruction, the disarray and build back um, the trust in government after nine years of your systemic failures in almost every single area of government responsibility. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Watt. Following the result of the Victorian election and the disgraceful performance of sections of the Murdoch media, will the government now act on the issue of media diversity in Australia and, in particular, its importance for a robust democracy? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Young Minister Watt. Yes, this one. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, well, I do think that the Victorian election showed that there were a number of commentators on the Victor state of Victorian politics who got it completely wrong. Uh, some of them are sitting in every aisle opposite us. Uh, some of them are sitting in certain media outlets in Victoria who waged a four-year campaign against the Andrews government, uh, promoting hysteria, um, promoting um, conspiracy theories um, with the people who are the noisiest now. Yeah, we do live in a free country, and you know what? Some people are free to get it wrong. 
and you have got it wrong year after year after year about the issues that the Victorian people uh, were concerned about. Uh, now, Senator Hanson Young, uh, as you are aware, our government does have a position uh, of supporting diverse media ownership. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that the minister responsible has discussed these matters with you. Uh, but I do think, in general terms, that the, the Victorian state election again showed that some media outlets, along with some members of parliament, actually need to get out in the real world and listen to what real, real people have to say about these issues, rather than just occupying their own echo chamber. Uh, we have seen some uh, members of the Liberal and National parties, federally and Victoria, operate very closely with some of those media outlets, and what they demonstrated was that they were grossly out of touch with people in Victoria, just as they de have demonstrated that in the recent federal election and in a range of other elections as well. So I do hope uh, that the Victorian state election is a very big wake-up call for a number of media outlets, as it should be also for members on the other side. Uh, otherwise, they're going to keep drifting down the out-of-touch path that they seem to be intent on taking. Senator Hanson Young, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. Does the minister agree that se sections of the Murdoch media were in fact in breach of their own Australian Press Council rules, which state that the media should, quote, ensure that factual material in news reports and elsewhere is accurate and not misleading and is distinguishable from other sources such as opinion? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, of course, we believe that it's important for all media outlets to uh, separate what is fact from opinion, uh, and it is an important role uh, for the media to make sure when, that when they are reporting what are supposed to be facts, that they do, do demonstrate the facts and do, do put out the facts. And then, when they want to have something to say in an opinion piece, then that then go for your life. But there, there shouldn't be a blurring of the two. And unfortunately, we have seen occasions where that distinction has been blurred. I think that's not in the interests of the media in Australia, and I don't think it's in the interests of good public commentary about debate. Now, it's not really for me, uh, as a representing minister, to judge whether particular outlets may have breached media codes. But I would say very strongly to all media outlets, no matter who they are, that the public expects um, that media codes will be followed, um, that factual information will be presented uh, in, in a non-opinion form, leaving opinion uh, pieces for their rightful place in our democracy, but not Thank blurring you, it with fact. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, second supplementary. Given the Press Council clearly cannot enforce its own standards, Australian media is more concentrated than any other comparable market, and the overt political role that some sections of the Murdoch media play, will the government hold an inquiry with the powers of, the ro of a royal commission into media diversity, including the Murdoch press, as recommended by some of your own senators, a former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and some of your own Labor branches? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, as I was saying in my original answer, the Albanese government does support a diverse and sustainable media sector, and we recognise that quality news and public interest journalism plays an important role in the functioning of Australian society and democracy. Uh, it is essential to informing local communities. Uh, Labor has long acknowledged and voiced concerns about the level of media concentration in Australia which is why the Albanese Labor government is focused on supporting and fostering diversity in our media. It's also why the government has affirmed a clear position that a royal commission or judicial inquiry into media concentration is not the way forward for media policy. Uh, there have already been multiple reviews and inquiries into the media and public interest journalism over the past decade, yet the recommendations from these processes have not been properly addressed. Rather than holding another inquiry, we need to be outcomes focused in implementing the backlog of recommendations that already exist. Thank you, our Minister. Um, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please inform the Senate how the government's policy settings in workplace relations and gender equality are benefiting Australian women? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you. President, I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question and for her years of um, representing um, low-paid uh, workers, uh, in particular women, through her, her uh, service through the, the labour movement, through the union movement. This government is committed to gender equality, not as an afterthought, 
because we have a women problem, but because we understand gender equality as a core economic imperative that benefits all of us. And this government recognises that there are structural challenges to achieving gender equality that need structural responses. There has been a decade of ignoring these structural barriers to gender equality, and women have been bearing the cost, including through lower pay, poor conditions and chronic labour shortages in feminised sectors. So we're getting on the job of fixing this through our workplace relations settings, investments in cheaper childcare and modernising PPL schemes, and through reforms to close the gender pay gap and investments to end violence against women. These are the structural reforms to fix the systems that are not working right for, or that are not working in the interests of women. We're putting gender equality at the centre of workplace relations by making gender equality and job security objects of the Fair Work Act and strengthening access to flexible working arrangements. We will also establish a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel in the Fair Work Commission. We will increase pay transparency by providing pay secrecy clauses prohibiting pay secrecy clauses and strengthening gender pay gap reporting. We will prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act, a recommendation of the Respect at Work report, which we are implementing in full. While our workplace relations reforms will lift women's wages, our investment in cheaper childcare will make early childhood education and care more accessible, and our PPL reforms will give families more choice when caring for their youngest family members. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how these policy settings will drive wages growth with women in low-paid feminised industries. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Thank you, President. These important reforms will provide greater access to bargaining for workers in lower-paid and highly feminised sectors. Workers like Jane. Jane, who's been an early childhood educator for 40 years. She works at East Brunswick, Brunswick Kindergarten and Childcare. Incredibly passionate about her job, but it's been a tough industry to dedicate her life and her career to. There are constant struggles with staffing shortages due to low wages and conditions in the sector. Jane and her staff, along with workers in 70 other centres in Victoria, benefit from being part of a multi-employer agreement. They have won wages increases of 15 to 18 per cent above the award. And just as important, they have won things like more time for planning and professional development, which delivers better quality care for the children that they are providing care to. But the process is currently drowning in red tape, and it shouldn't be that hard. Directors in these centres are usually educators. They're not workplace relations or HR professionals, and we're making it easier for people like Jane Thank to you, get Minister. better Senator pay. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister please update the Senate on why this policy agenda is so critical to improving conditions that will benefit women? Thank you, Senator Walsh, Minister. Thank you, President. Thank Senator Walsh for the question. Achieving economic equality for women requires reforms to improve working conditions as well as pay. And we are amending the Fair Work Act to provide stronger access to flexible working arrangements. Women are twice as likely as men to request flexible work arrangements. But the reform is not just important for women. This will help families to share those work and caring responsibilities, which is critical to driving gender equality. Currently, an employee can ask for flexible work arrangements, but if their employer says no, they've got nowhere to go. This, the, the reforms that we're looking at will bring employers and employees together in workplaces in the first instance to resolve requests and gives the Fair Work Commission the power to resolve the dispute if needed. In addition, we will be prohibiting, we're prohibiting sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act. This complements reforms to the Sex Discrimination Act which passed in this place last Friday. Along with implementation of paid family and domestic violence leave, our reforms will make workplaces safer and more Thank flexible you, for women. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change Energy, Senator Wong. With the large-scale penetration of renewables into the national grid over the past 20 years, coinciding with energy costs for Australian households and businesses rising by 300 per cent or more over the same period, is the Albanese government telling Australians the truth when it says renewables are cheaper? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, 
President, thank you to Senator Hanson for the question. And, and yes, we are. And it's not simply our assessment; it's the assessment of those involved in the energy markets, uh, and those assessments are public. And uh, it is the case that the lack of policy certainty over the last decade uh, has meant uh, that we have seen an increase in energy prices, uh, combined with combined with uh, the international circumstances we see, which uh, are well known to everyone in this chamber, including the war on Ukraine and the way in which energy supplies are uh, being utilised as part of that, essentially, uh, essentially part of that conflict. Well, Senator Hanson, with respect. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not simply me saying this. This is what global markets are saying. This is what developed economies around the world are saying. Uh, and if you go to Europe and you understand uh, what is occurring in Europe and what is therefore occur and, and is occurring in global markets, the, the, they are affecting Australia's energy costs, as are being affected around the world. And Senator Rennick, you know, a bit of economic irrationality over there. Fair enough, but it's you know the reality is the market is not where you are. The market is not where you are. Uh, but uh, Senator Hanson, uh, we 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 we, we, de we deeply appreciate uh, how difficult the uh, increase in energy costs is for Australian households. I'm sorry, I don't know how to respond to the interjection from Senator Rennick. Anyway, um, uh, we, we understand how difficult it is. Uh, the government is, is, is very seized of this. Uh, I would make the point to you that the irrational position that was in place over so many years under those opposite meant that we saw supply exit the system. Uh, and we know if supply exits Thank the you, system, Minister. what Your happens time to has price. Expired. Before I call Senator Hanson for her first supplementary, I remind senators on both sides this is uh, crossbench time. They get limited opportunity uh, and interjections are disorderly. And I would appreciate Senator Hanson having the uh, benefit of hearing uh, Minister Wong's uh, responses in quiet. Um, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Thank you. Well, Senator Wong, I don't accept your answer to that question, neither do a lot of Australians, because the war in Ukraine only just started this year and energy costs have been going up for years. My question is, with domestic energy costs predicted to increase by up to 56 per cent over the next two years as more renewables come online and more coal-fired plants are closed ahead of time, will the Albanese government apologise to the Australian people for falsely claiming it would reduce household energy bills by $275 per year? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Watt. Um, Senator Hanson, we are seeking to deal with what is happening in global energy markets and what is happening in the domestic energy markets. Uh, and we inherited, as you will recall, a price increase, the re policy response to which was simply the uh, former minister, Mr Taylor, hiding a price increase prior to the next election. We inherited a system which saw four gigawatts of dispatchable capacity leave the system with only one gigawatt coming in. In relation to uh, uh, the point about renewables, the CSIRO, in their, jet, their, their report in July 2022, forecast that by 2030, electricity produced by solar PV would be two-thirds cheaper than black coal and over 80 per cent cheaper than nuclear. Wind generation would be 50 per cent cheaper than black coal and 80 per cent cheaper than nuclear. The reason the market has not invested in more coal-fired power is because the market is looking at the same predictions Thank that I you, have Minister. just outlined to you. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplement. Maybe they're not looking into it because of the uh, government shutting down coal in Australia. Considering that no human being in history has ever led a carbon-neutral existence, will the minister please explain to the Senate and the Australian people how the Albanese government's policies to bring in more than 250,000 immigrants every year are consistent with its policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43 per cent by 2030. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, well, Senator Hanson, um, we do think that uh, responsible levels of migration are consistent with economic growth, uh, and uh, we also believe uh, that uh, renewables uh, are demonstrably uh, a cheaper uh, energy source than, than those which I have outlined, so uh, coal and uh, 
nuclear, uh, which explains market behaviour over this last decade. Uh, it is the case we will have to transform our economy, uh, and uh, we will have to ensure that we both reduce what we put into the atmosphere uh, and uh, offset that which we cannot reduce. Uh, and in that regard, Senator Hanson, the position the Albanese government is putting is where the ma mainstream economies of the world are. It is where the majority of the global economies uh, are. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin. Hmm. Thank you, yeah. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Gallagher. Um, the distribution priority area classification system has been crucial in supporting the movement of general practitioners to rural, regional, remote areas to address workforce shortages. However, the Albanese government's decision to expand the DPA means that outer metropolitan areas now have the same priority status as rural and remote parts of the country, where critical GP shortages are being felt the hardest. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia has stated that this policy change, and I quote, will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who already suffer poorer health outcomes. Can the minister please explain what advice formed the basis of your government's decision to expand the DPA classifications and whether you consulted with the RDAA, whose members are the ones most impacted by this decision? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President, and I thank Senator Rustin for the question. Uh, I will come back to the chamber uh, on the specifics of the minister's engagement and consultations, but I can say that I know Minister Butler uh, consults very widely and is working very closely with general practice and uh, general practice groups, you know, groups representing particular arms of general practice or healthcare uh, broadly, as he's working through uh, the reforms that we want to implement. On the um, program around um, the designated status or distribution priority areas. Um, we have expanded that because there are shortages in a whole range of areas. That's the reality. Like primary care is under enormous stress, and there are workforce shortages in outer metropolitan areas, in metropolitan areas, and in rural and regional areas for sure, which is why there was a response to rural and regional um, health uh, through the budget in October, um, which had a specific measure, rural general practice package, to make sure that there are innovative models of care being trialled across rural general practice, more training placements under the John Flynn program, and looking at extra incentives uh, for doctors and nurses uh, to go into um, and, and work in rural and regional areas. Um, so we've, you know, we're looking at this across the board. Yes, there are enormous pressures in rural and regional areas. There are enormous pressures in primary care. You just talk to any GP at the moment, and they will tell you how hard it is in terms of workforce, in terms of how that they run their businesses, in terms of pressure um, that we are trying to respond to through the Strengthening Medicare Fund and some of the other responses through the urgent care clinics as well are all designed to assist Thank general you, practice. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. The Warren Bungle Shire Council has previously stated that your government minister's decision to expand the DPA classifications will likely mean people in rural and remote communities will have to travel hundreds of kilometres mm. to receive medical attention. When asked in budget estimates if the government had consulted first with rural, regional and remote communities before making this decision on DPA's classification, Senator McCarthy said no. Minister, can you confirm that the Albanese government did not consult with these communities before making these decisions? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I've already said I will come back on the specifics of the consultation, but I do know um, we've got the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. There's a range of consultative well, there's a range of consultative mechanisms that the Minister Butler has put in place to deal with the pressures, to deal with the pressures that we inherited from your term in, in government. The reality is you can't, you don't just have a primary care crisis that happens over two months. This has been building for years. The workforce shortages have been building for years. We had an inquiry that Senator Green um, 
chaired, I think you chaired it, didn't you, yeah. uh, Senator Green, into this specific matter, which made recommendations in order to deal with some of the, the pressures that experienced under your watch. So there is more to do. There is, there is more to do, but we also have to deal with workforce shortages in other areas of the Thank country you, as well. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, second supplementary. When asked in question time in the House about the number of rural towns who have lost a GP because of the decision of your government to change the DPA classifications, Minister Butler refused to answer the question. Does Minister Butler know the number of rural towns who have been negatively impacted by this decision? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. The decision is about creating additional workforce. Um, that, is the, that is behind the decision, right? So that these other, other areas that are having trouble attracting, attracting um, GPs Order. are able to, to work through that program. So, you know, yes, we accept that there are significant workforce shortages in rural and regional areas. And it's not just GPs, it's in a whole range of health work workers. But we also have them in other areas of the country, and we need to respond to that as well. And part of the reason why we are putting in um, the urgent care clinics, the, the grants, the $220 million grants program for GPs, so that they're able to, to put in place supports in their practices to help meet some of the pressures they're seeing, plus some of the um, other incentive programs is all designed to come at this from a, a number of different ways. There is Thank no you, silver Minister, bullet. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and also the Climate and Environment Ministry, Senator Wong. Today, a report from the Climate Council and Emergency Leaders for Climate Action has reported that the Queensland floods earlier this year cost nearly $8 billion. And extreme weather events over the past year have cost Australian households an average of $1,532. The report says we need deep cuts to emissions this decade to avoid climate catastrophe, something that cannot happen if more coal and gas projects are approved. Rather than propping up coal and gas projects with fossil fuel subsidies, this government should be addressing the cost of living and preparing communities for future disasters. When will the government cancel the $47.2 billion in public money it's giving in subsidies to the fossil fuel sector? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Thank you to Senator Waters for a very lengthy question. Uh, and, uh, well, it was a lengthy question. That's all right. <laughs> She's entitled. She's entitled to a full minute, uh, and I'll. <laughs> They're very touchy, aren't they? They're very touchy. Had a bad Saturday night. Um, uh, look, uh, Sen Senator, uh, this is a variation on a question that you've asked and your colleagues have asked on a number of occasions. Uh, and what I would say to you is, one, we agree with the need to make reductions in the emissions Australia produces. That is a position that I have been arguing and the Labor Party has been arguing for many years. Uh, we sought to implement uh, that in government. Uh, we fought for that in opposition over nine years. Uh, and I am pleased, as I'm sure uh, uh, many people across Australia are, that we not only have a government who wish, wants to act on climate, but have a parliament that wishes to act on climate. So I think all of those points really go back to some of the points you raise. Um, it, I think the question is, what is your diagnosis or your assertion about the test to deal with that. We believe the test is as set by the UNFCCC and as agreed amongst the international community, which is uh, economies over time will make uh, reductions in their emissions uh, what will reduce the emissions they produce. That is why we have an election commitment to a 43 per cent reduction by 2030, which will see the overwhelming majority of energy in the energy sector coming from renewable sources. Now, I appreciate the Greens have a different view. I trust they also have a, a fiscal position Order. that they're prepared to take, which reflects that. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the revenue to the Australian economy by those sectors. But unlike you, we're not going to target workers and one industry. We are going you, to Minister. reduce Your over time. time. Has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, last week, in a case taken by Youth Verdict, 
the Land Court of Queensland recommended rejection of Clive Palmer's Waratah Coal, Wando and Mine. The Land Court found that the mine's contribution to climate change and cultural harm outweighed any economic benefit. Will the Environment Minister apply the same reasoning when assessing the 114 coal and gas projects currently before her and reject those damaging projects? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, that, that's actually a question uh, not in the climate portfolio, as you'd know, but in the environment portfolio, but I'm happy to respond to it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator Payne. Uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, we also don't understanding or to switch portfolios mid-question, but that's fine. I'm happy to take the question. And the, respon the response is, uh, as, I, as I previously said, Senator Waters, uh, obviously those matters that are before Senator uh, Ms Plibersek uh, or whomever holds that portfolio at any time over the past years, those are matters uh, that, uh, that the minister uh, would exercise in accordance with the statutory discretion. Uh, as you know, uh, our view is that any, any project has to stack up environmentally and clearly economically. And I think the reality is, over time, the global markets will uh, reduce the amount of uh, it, the consumption from fossil fuels. I think that Thank is you, demonstrated by a net zero. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Given the environmentally, culturally and economically devastating impacts of climate change, particularly for future generations, when will the government commit to introducing a climate trigger into the EPBC Act to require the climate impacts of all large projects to be considered and to allow the outright rejection of big coal, oil and gas projects on climate grounds? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. I do agree uh, with the characterisation about the urgency of, of action on climate, uh, and I believe our country would have been far better off uh, had we first passed the emissions trading scheme, or second, uh, if we had been able to con continue uh, the uh, uh, clean energy package that uh, Ms Gillard uh, and uh, Ms Gillard's government introduced. Uh, regrettably, that was not the case, and I think we would have been in a more competitive position uh, than we are now in a global economy, which is increasingly prioritising clean energy. Uh, but uh, the, the, the question uh, again goes to a, a policy lever that uh, uh, I understand that, you know, that, that, that those uh, at that end of the chamber have been advocating for. Uh, yeah, some have been advocating for in the community. Uh, we went to the election with a very clear commitment about how we would reduce Australia's emissions and how we would seek to shift Thank our economy Minister, from an emissions intent. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. Minister, how will the Albanese Labor government continue working with the re-elected Andrews Labor government to deliver important infrastructure projects in my home state of Victoria. Minister Watt. Thank, thank you, President. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Senator Ciccone, order. Thank you, President. And it seems that even after the election, the trigger words are still there. The Andrews Labor government. Oh, trigger, trigger, oh, trigger, trigger. Oh, sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to say Andrews Labor government. I thank the senator for the question. I know that he's a proud Victorian, and I would hazard a guess that he personally voted for the Andrews Labor government on the weekend. Trigger warning. There's lots of references to the Andrews Labor government in this answer. I should really give you a trigger warning. On Saturday, the Victorian community came together and emphatically endorsed the Andrews Labor government and their agenda for Victoria's future. I would like to congratulate Premier Daniel Andrews on his success and the significant achievement of a third time in government. Despite what you may have heard in this place last week, it's clear that the Victorian community has strongly endorsed the work that Premier Daniel Andrews and his team have done to date, as well as the work to be done over the coming years. And this was despite an increasingly desperate and personal scare campaign run by the Liberals and Nationals both in Victoria uh, and Watt? in the federal government. Minister Watt, resume your seat. Order. 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 I have a senator on her feet. Order. Order. Senator Rustin. 
Point of order on relevance. I was just wondering whether you might draw the minister's attention to the question. Uh, thank you. I, I will remind uh, Senator Watt. Uh, he has been broadly relevant, but I'll remind him the question was about infrastructure. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. It's always good to talk about the Andrews Labor government. And of course, the Albanese Labor government will continue to work with the Andrews Labor government on infrastructure projects throughout the state of Victoria. Through the 2022-23 October budget, we've gone line by line through the previous government's mess of an infrastructure portfolio and cleaned it up while making sure we continue to invest in important projects for Victoria's future. We've put an end to the fake financing and ideological obsession with the East-West Link, and we're, work to, we're working with the Andrews Labor government to invest in the Barwon Heads Road Upgrade Stage 2, the Ison Road Overpass, the Mel Melbourne Airport Rail Link, the Gippsland Rail Line Upgrade, the Cameron's Land Interchange at Beveridge, and, of course, the $2.2 billion to the suburban rail loop that will be delivered by an Albanese Labor government and the Andrews Labor Thank you, government. Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and I thank the minister for that answer. Uh, minister, how will the federal Labor government work with the Victorian Labor government to deliver important infrastructure projects such as the suburban rail loop? Uh, thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. President, I'm very pleased you asked about the suburban rail loop, which was, of course, a core commitment of the Andrews Labor government, because the suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project that will transform how Victorians move around the state. And while some still don't want to accept the reality of defeat after defeat, the Australian government will work with the newly elected Andrews Senator Labor Henderson. government Senator to honour Henderson. our election commitment to provide $2.2 billion. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Henderson, it is not OK to run a commentary alongside the minister's answer. I would ask you to listen quietly. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, we will now honour our election commitment to provide $2.2 billion towards the suburban rail loop east, which has been yet again endorsed by Victorians on the weekend. Uh, but it's not just urban Victorians who will benefit this, from this project. Regional Victorians from Gippsland and the Latrobe Valley will benefit hugely from this project, gaining fast access to Monash University, Monash Health, including the Children's Hospital, all without having to go into central Melbourne, saving an hour of travel. This is an important project, and yet again, Victorians have endorsed it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Giacconi, second supplementary. Thank you again, President. Again, I thank the Minister. Minister, has the Victorian community expressed a view in relation to the delivery of the suburban rail loop by the state and federal government? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And in fact, Senator Giacconi, it's clear from the results of Saturday night that the people of Victoria have yet again made their view clear on the suburban rail loop, not once but twice this year alone. Communities in Melbourne's east have voted emphatically in favour of this project. Whether it's Bayswater, Glen Waverley or Box Hill on Saturday night or Chisholm and Hotham back in May, local communities have made it clear that they want the delivery of the suburban rail loop. Now, you really would think that the Victorian Liberals would have seen the warning signs after the 2018 election when Victorians backed in the suburban rail loop. Uh, but no, it's like a, a rail line with a big danger ahead sign and Senator Henderson and her friends just charged on. It happened again in the federal election when a government that took the suburban rail loop to the people was backed in. But again, Senator Henderson, Senator Van, Senator McKenzie couldn't hear the warning sides. And now they've driven the coalition train off the track. A massive derailment. Stop digging. We've got tunnelling machines to deal, dig the holes for the rail line. We don't need you digging, Thank but you, you will Minister keep doing Wright, so. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. Order. Order. You have a senator on her feet. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Over the last three months, the Iranian regime has been accused of killing more than 300 civilians standing up for human rights, particularly Iranian women and girls. The Iranian-Australian community has been calling for weeks for the Australian government to hold the Iranian regime to account. Has the government now applied any targeted sanctions, such as those imposed by like-minded nations? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. Thank you, um, President. Thank you to Senator Chandler for her question. Uh, and she uh, and I had a, a discussion about this in estimates, and I would refer her in terms of the action we have been taking to uh, the answer I gave in the Senate last week. 
uh, about this issue. Uh, we have taken action uh, against Iran. We have consistently called out the regime publicly for its egregious actions. And I think everybody in this place, every, as, as much as you might like to play a bit of politics with this, Senator Van, everyone in this place would stand united in our condemnation of the brutal repression Senator of Van. civil and political rights in Iran following uh, the tragic death uh, of Masa Amini. So I would, I would make this point. Uh, in relation to sanctions, the senator does know uh, that I, uh, nor any foreign minister before me, including Senator Payne, notwithstanding her interjection, have ever speculated publicly on sanctions. Uh, and uh, so the uh, previously, uh, <coughs> no foreign minister would publicly speculate on sanctions for very good reasons. Uh, I understand uh, the calls from the community uh, in Australia. I met with some representatives last week and I said to them, I understand uh, why it is people feel so strongly about this and why people are so angry. Uh, and uh, I wish it were a world in which Australia uh, and other like-minded countries, such as Canada and the US and New Zealand and many others that we have been working with uh, in the UN context to put pressure on Iran, I wish we could uh, make this better, but we can't. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, this is a repressive regime. We, we have to continue to work with other members of the international community uh, to assert, assert uh, uh, clear pressure in, the, in that context. We have also, we have also uh, made representations Thank you, directly Your time has expired. here. Senator Chandler, first Thank you very much, President. Uh, last week, after cancelling a division on my urgency motion calling on this government to take concrete action against the human rights abuses perpetrated by the Iranian government, both the opposition and the Greens clarified their positions as in favour of the motion. What was the government's position on the motion, in support or against, as Labor senators called out at the time? Minister. Thank you. I, I, this is going back a few days now. My, my recollection is that the, the whip indicated the government's position on that motion. Uh, so I'd refer you to Hansard on that. But again, I, I would, well, I, I'm advised that she did. Uh, I'm advised that she did. Uh, and what I would say is I think we, we have been very clear about our position in relation to Iran. And I, and I, find, it, I find it disappointing. I find it disappointing Order. that those opposites are playing politics with an issue when we see people being killed because of their actions and their beliefs. Like I find it extraordinary. Uh, uh, and you think that you think that what uh, what a procedure in the chamber where there was obviously an issue where an explanation had to be given in relation to a vote, you think that somehow is the main issue? No, you know what the issue is. Senator the Rustin. issue is the repression of women and men and children in Iran for standing up for their rights. That's the issue. Uh, Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Hundreds of Iranian Australians, Kurdish Australians and their supporters have been rallying outside the parliament today. Will the government listen to them and take real action to strengthen Australia's response to the abuses in Iran? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. Uh, I'm aware of that, uh, uh, that protest. I discussed it with members of the community with whom I met last week. Uh, and I support uh, their, their right to protest, and I understand their calls. I do understand their calls. Uh, and as I said to uh, members of, uh, as I've said previously to members of the community, I think, uh, you know, I, I, if I were in their position, I perfectly understand why, why they're calling for it. The, the person who holds this office has to make a range of decisions and go through a range of processes uh, uh, and make a judgment in Australia's best interests. I presume the same judgment uh, as the coalition government made when Iran was elected uh, to uh, the CSW, the Commission on the Status of, the, of Women, and no protest was lodged by the former government. Thank you, Minister. As Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. How are governments working together to meet the continuing health challenges presented by COVID? Thank you, Senator Smith. As Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Smith for the question. Governments around Australia are mon monitoring this fourth wave of Omicron very closely. Data released last Friday over the last seven days suggests that the current wave is likely to peak towards the end of November and into early December. 
The case numbers are up. They're up 10 per cent in the last seven days compared with 47 per cent in the seven days before that and 38 per cent in the seven days before that. So it's important that people continue to take precautions against COVID and the best precaution is to be up to date with vaccinations. The Albanese government is working with states and territories through national cabinet to ensure that we have a strong national response. In the recent budget, we spent, uh, I think, total spending on COVID measures is around $2.6 billion, including funding for the stockpile, vaccines and treatments, and significant investment in aged care. We will continue to work constructively with all states and territory governments because we know that a cooperative, collaborative approach leads to better public health outcomes. Governments working closely with their communities is also vital, and we saw evidence of this in the Victorian election on the weekend. No one has done it tougher during this pandemic than the people in Victoria, and the strong, focused leadership of Premier Daniel Andrews through the pandemic has been endorsed with this extraordinary victory. On the weekend, Victorians voted for a competent government. The strong leadership of Premier Andrews and his government show that during the challenges thrown at Victorians during the pandemic, accepting the public health advice, accepting the evidence, making tough decisions but being honest and upfront and transparent does reward you electorally. The government looks forward to working with the Andrews government and all state and territory governments as we tackle this next wave of COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Minister, what are we doing to protect older Australians and those in aged care? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Smith. Um, the budget includes funding to support ongoing measures to protect older Australians. Key measures include $810 million in additional funding Order. into the aged care support program grant so that aged care providers continue to be supported with the costs of managing COVID-19. $235 million to ensure aged care, primary care, disability care and First Nations health services will continue to have access to a supply of PPE, treatments, rapid antigen Order. tests. Sorry, I can't hardly Order. hear myself. Order. Senator Wong and Senator Henderson. Senator Thanks. Henderson, you've had a tough weekend, we know. We know you have. You take, take all the time you need. Take all the time you need. The government uh, has been on the front foot to help protect older Australians most at risk of COVID. Our measures to support the aged care sector include pre-deploying summer packs of personal protective equipment to all residential aged care homes, continuing to prioritise boosters and continuing access to surge workforce Thank you, Minister. and additional Your time workers. Has expired. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, what action is the government taking to ensure more Australians have access to antiviral medication to treat COVID? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Thank Senator Smith for the question. In July this year, the Minister for Health and Aged Care announced the widening of eligibility for antiviral drugs to treat COVID. All Australians aged over 70 who test positive for COVID are now able to access antivirals on the PBS. Access has also been expanded to people over the age of 50 with two or more uh, risk factors for severe disease, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people aged over 30 with two or more risk factors for uh, severe disease. The most recent data shows that 394,100 doses of antivirals have been prescribed and dispensed from the PBS. Prescription numbers increased by 11.8 per cent last week compared to the previous week and approximately 34,130 antiviral prescriptions have been provided to people in residential aged care. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Can senators please leave the chamber with some degree of decorum? Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of questions uh, from Senators McDonald and Rustin to Senator Gallagher. Please proceed. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, well, we have a 
another Labor government, and we have another Labor tax. Uh, another Labor tax that's been flagged uh, over these past few weeks uh, to now our mining industry, our mining sector. Senator Macdonald asked that. And we heard the normal weasel words we heard way back, way back before 2010, that there are no plans today, no plans today uh, for a tax on the mining industry. But that doesn't mean, of course, there won't be a plan tomorrow. There has been a campaign over the past few weeks uh, to, to leak out, uh, to prepare the ground. Uh, for a tax on, on Australia's mining industry, a tax on Australians' jobs. Uh, and there has been a complete disarray uh, from this government about what they are going to do and how are they are going to handle the skyrocketing energy prices that Australians are facing this Christmas. Uh, I just got, uh, uh, oh, my wife just uh, told me about our latest electricity bill. It's gone up 15 uh, per cent, and I know a lot of other Australians will be facing that uh, in the months ahead. Now, uh, that's challenging for all Australians, but this government promised Australians only six months ago at the election they promised Australians that they would lower their power bills by $275 a year. They didn't just do it once or twice or three times. It wasn't a footnote in their policy. It was said 97 times by the now Prime Minister Anthony Albanese that they would lower people's power bills by $275. Now they haven't done that. They haven't done that. As we saw in their first budget, power prices are actually due to go up by 56 per cent over the next uh, two years, completely breaking their promise, and now they're in a desperate, a desperate huddle uh, to try and find some other solution to distract people's attention. They don't know what to do in that huddle. They're all doing different things and breaking out in different ways. We have the industry minister, Minister Husich, out there saying that uh, gas companies are greeting and need to be somehow penalised, I think. It's unclear exactly what Mr Husich wants to do to them. We have, uh, we have uh, Ms King, the Minister King, the Minister for Resources, saying, oh, no, it's all fixed. She's fixed it. She signed an MOU uh, with the gas industry and it'll all be fine next year. And we've had uh, the tr Treasury officials come to Senate estimates and, and say that we do need to intervene in gas markets, and they themselves gave credence to this idea of a tax. Now, the reason the problem we've got here is even if, even if uh, the Labor government now gets scared off introducing a tax, this is destroying confidence in our economy. It is destroying investment in our economy. Uh, and that's not what we need right now in a time of high inflation. We need to attract investment to get our economy going. Because if we produce more, if we're more productive, that will help bring inflation down. That will create more goods for all that too much money that's out there. Uh, we saw just, the, just last week the Reserve Bank Governor, uh, Mr Philip Lowe, give a speech about this. And he highlighted, he highlighted that, that investment in our resources sector is at a very low level right now. It's uh, running at 3 per cent of GDP, uh, investment in resources. Resources itself accounts for 7 per cent of our GDP, the actual output. So investment in resources is much lower than its share of the economy, which is quite strange right now. Very strange, given that, given that uh, the actual uh, price for our resources is at record highs. Uh, so we pre in a previous mining boom that people probably remember, most people probably remember the previous mining boom that peaked in about 2011-2012, uh, when our iron ore, our coal, our gas, our copper, gold, almost all commodities were at record highs. Uh, we had this massive amount of money come through the Treasury here in Canberra. We had record investments in resources at that time. Investment in resources grows to 9 per cent of GDP, $200 billion in our gas industry, massive expansion of iron ore and coal industries across Australia, create thousands of jobs. Thousands of jobs. We had problems. We had problems in regional Queensland because there was too much going on. Uh, you couldn't get a house. Rents were through the roof. But they were probably good problems to have, really, in, in hindsight. Now we don't have that problem. We've got the opposite problem. We're not attracting investment. And that's because this government is not giving people the confidence to invest. Despite these very high prices, uh, we, have, we have coal prices that are sitting at, uh, at $350 a tonne. Now, the previous record was about $180 a tonne, so they're sitting at a level double the previous record right now. Why aren't people investing in the industry? Because there's no confidence here. They don't know what the government policy is. The government doesn't know what their policy is. They're arguing with each other. They're talking about taxes and regulations and all these types of penalties that might be imposed on someone. You're not going to invest. You're not going to create jobs if you have no confidence in what the policy settings will be in the years ahead when you have to pay that investment back. So I implore the government to get their act together before Christmas. Before Christmas, give a, give a present to the thousands of Australians that rely on the resources industry for their jobs, for their livelihoods, and let us know what you're actually doing so we can take advantage of this, this record opportunity to invest Thank in our you, country. Thank you, Senator Kennevan. 
Senator White. I'd rise to talk about uh, the question of and respond to the question from Senator Rustin. Let's talk about GPs. Let's talk about what our health system is like um, after we've inherited nine, nine long years of cuts and neglect of Medicare. It's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor than it is now. The former government froze the Medicare re rebate for six years, ripping billions of dollars out of primary care and causing gap fees to skyrocket. I myself saw last week a delegation of GPs about this, and they talked about the hardship of running uh, practices in a range of areas, not just in rural and regional areas, but in, uh, but in metropolitan areas and out of metropolitan areas. That is a direct result of the freezing of the Medicare re rebate that has been frozen for six years. Those are the real problems that are facing our GPs, and it's no wonder young doctors are walking away from general practice in droves. Just as every new Labor government has always has to do, we're, we're cleaning up the mess that's been left behind by the Liberal Party, not just uh, in, uh, in all the other areas that we've discussed, but also in this um, massive area of health and uh, what our GPs need, want and what our public deserves. In 2019, the Morrison government arbitrarily axed the ability of a long list of communities to recruit overseas trained doctors to fill gaps in general practice in those outer, suburban, uh, outer suburbs and the regions. That was a travesty, uh, and that has caused part of the shortages. That has caused part of the shortages that we are seeing today. Labor initiated a Senate inquiry uh, into the GP shortages in the last parliament as the minister uh, discussed. And it, it has heard mountains of evidence of people not being able to see a GP at all, about having to wait months for an appointment and having travel, to travel hours when they do finally get one. I myself have seen many, many workers who have not been able to get medical certificates um, from doctors because they just could not get an appointment, not in rural and regional areas, but in suburban Melbourne. They could not see it, then they got docked for their pay because they could not could not uh, get a medical certificate uh, when they were genuinely sick. Uh, we have deliberately not changed the regional incentive payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia, exactly because we recognise the importance of providing additional incentives for doctors to work in those remote and regional communities. The government funds a range of programs and incentives to encourage GPs to re relocate and work there, in addition to uh, the DPA. The Albanese government is committed to investing in general practice and strengthening Medicare with almost $1 billion uh, of investment. Our Strengthening Medicare Task Force will identify the best ways to boost affordability, improve access and deliver better support for patients with ongoing and chronic il illnesses, backed by the $750 million st Strengthening Medicare Fund. That's real progress. Those are real policies, which is in total contrast to what the, the uh, Liberal National Government had done for the long nine years beforehand. That is why we're in crisis, because of the lack of policies, in fact, some policies that were anti-GPs, uh, and that's what we are trying to repair. You know, certainly, after working tirelessly through the pandemic, we'll give our doctors the resources to invest in their GP practices with our $220 million strengthening Medicare GP grants. That is real policy. That is real progress, and that will make a massive difference to GPs um, in rural, regional and also suburban areas. We're also investing $146 million to attract and retain more health workers to rural and regional Australia. This will mean more trials of new innovative models of primary care. During the pandemic, we saw um, a range of innovations which we think can be continued beyond the, the pandemic time. There's also going to be more than a thousand places under the John Flynn Prevocation or Doctor program to encourage more hospital-based junior doctors to enter general practice in rural Australia. That's how we're going to get doctors into rural Australia, by placing incentives on the table and encouraging young doctors to go to, to those locations. There'll also be additional training for rural generalist registrations GP registrars and follow, fellowed GPs to undertake advanced skills training. That is real policy. That is what the Albanese government is doing, uh, and that will make a massive difference, not just to rural and regional areas, but to suburban Australia as well. 
Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of the question from Senator Rustin of uh, Minister Gallagher. I hardly know where to start with this appalling Labor policy. Uh, as other colleagues have said, it is absolutely detrimental uh, to the health care of Australians, some of Australia's most vulnerable in rural, regional and also remote areas. Now, it was even worse when you consider that the government admitted during estimates that they had done not a second of consultation with people who might be concerned. So they've called a task force instead of actually going out and talking to the people of Western Australia, going out into regional and remote communities to talk to these communities who are so starved of GP care. Now, by the DP area classification, the DPA classification, uh, now to include outer metro areas, is such a retrograde step for so many people in Western Australia. Because let me tell you what Labor has done to Western Australia in terms of health. We've got a health system in absolute crisis and chaos. We've got record ramping. We've got uh, record code blacks. We've got our nurses in uproar and on strike. And now, not only are we 350 doctors short in our hospitals in Western Australia, young doctors short in our hospitals, we are over 100, 100 GPs short, mostly in rural and remote communities. So what does that mean? That means that West Australians, who are our most vulnerable, who need health care the most in uh, Indigenous communities and in other uh, remote areas, cannot get the health care they need. And this will make it worse. The minister, Minister Butler, couldn't even say today how many communities were impacted. Well, let me tell you, if we're 100 GPs short in Western Australia, the vast majority of them are in regional and remote areas. And according to West Australian doctors, that means in every town without a GP or with un underserviced by GPs, that means there are 50 people a day who are not getting the support and the medical support they need. 50 people a day per doctor for our most uh, vulnerable. So shame on Labor. Again, policy on the run and without even consulting anyone. So let me finish by providing some of the information that if Labor had actually come to Western Australia, gone out into regional Australia, they would find out. So as I've said, regional health is struggling by 100 doctors we're missing and we cannot get, and about 50 patients a day. So even in areas that are closer to the city, take, for example, 2J, um, that they're now absolutely concerned because they're competing with Margaret River. We're competing with the coast, and they're now competing with uh, outer suburbs of Perth. Shame on Labor. For the remaining time, I give the call to Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting De Mr. Deputy President. I speak in response to, and I take note of, Senator Wong's inaccurate and misleading statements in response to Senator Hansen's questions. The Ukraine conflict does not affect coal-fired electricity prices in this country because our domestic coal-fired power stations have long-term price contracts. They are not subjected to the spot international prices. Fuel prices in coal secondly, fuel prices in coal-fired generation are a tiny proportion of the costs. Secondly, no country transitioning to unreliable solar and wind has reduced electricity prices. Countries that increase solar and wind increase electricity prices every time. The relationship is approximately linear. More solar, more wind, higher prices. Thirdly, CSIRO projections rely on applying unfavourable or sorry, favourable and unreasonable hurdle rates for investing in unreliable and expensive solar and wind costs. CSIRO cost assessments of solar and wind do not include construction costs, the roads, the bridges, etc., coming in, disposal costs every 10 to 15 years, which is three times for the equivalent life of a coal-fired power station, new offshore turbines so big that they have to build ships dedicated to moving them, cost of the ships not included, batteries essential for continuity of supply in wind and solar, not needed for coal, an extra $100 billion on, on solar and, and wind that are not included in the costings. Grid stability management due to wind and solar being unstable and asynchronous are not included in the costings. Transmission lines, because the distance from the generation sources to the cities where the customers are, are so big, the transmission lines are estimated to be an extra $50 billion expense not needed for coal-fired power. Why are solar and wind still subsidised? Who pays for these subsidies? 
the electricity users. That's what's driving up in part our, coal, our, our uh, electricity generation costs. Senator Payman. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I would like to. I rise to take note of uh, Senator Macdonald's um, question to Senator Gallagher. Um, I'm so astonished to stand here and hear about those opposite, uh, after a decade of delay, denial and destruction, to have the audacity to stand there and tell us what to do. We clearly went to the election and we saw what the Australian people wanted. They wanted change. They wanted a progressive government who will take action, who won't break their promises, who will ensure that Australians' voices are heard. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite astonishing to see even my um, colleagues from uh, Western Australia stand up and talk about what's best for Australians. Well, you had a decade. What did you do? Um, and, and despite the delaying tactics from the opposition, it's really refreshing to see that the government is going to be delivering on its commitments um, because, of course, the adults are back in charge and we will take the reins and run with it. Now, we've made it clear that we're prepared to consider a range of options when it comes to high energy prices in an energy market which is putting a lot of pressure on Australians, and we see it day in, day out. Um, and obviously that pressure is replicated on an Australian industry. Um, we've said that our priority is on regulation, on the side of regulation rather than on taxation side. But we're going through this in a thoughtful and considered way because that's what Labor governments do. We take precautionary measures. We have an incredible amount of consultation before we make decisions um, and we ensure that it's in the best interests of all Australians. A windfall tax is not our preference, and we've said it before, our preference is a regulatory solution. Of course, we're dealing with these rising power prices in large part because Russia's illegal war in Ukraine, but also in small part as the consequence of the wasted decade by those opposite, including more than 20 failed energy policies. Yeah, get it, 20 failed energy policies. The former government's fingerprints are all over those power prices prices rises, um, especially the member for Hume, who hid the price rises that he knew about before the election. Surprise, surprise. Australians know we didn't cause this mess, but we do take responsibility for cleaning it up, because again, adults are back in charge. A windfall tax wouldn't help with the near-term economic challenges, including the growing inflation challenge we have right now. Our priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring multinationals pay their share, their fair share, of tax here in Australia. That will play a part in repairing the budget, a budget that has been destroyed. Uh, and we've seen, um, with all our work, to get rid of the rorts and waste that have contributed to a trillion dollars of debt left to us that didn't come with the economic dividend. Multinational corporations making a profit in Australia should pay their fair share of tax in Australia, and our multinational tax package will close tax loopholes exploited by multinationals and improve tax transparency, because that's what Australian people want to see, integrity and transparency restored back in our political system. This will benefit Australians by funding vital services like Medicare, aged care and childcare, helping to service the trillion dollars of debt racked up by the, those opposite and levelling the playing field for Australian businesses. Now, the government has committed to tackling multinational tax avoidance in four ways, uh, supporting the OECD's two-pillar solution for a global 15 per cent minimum tax and ensuring some of the profits of the largest multinationals, particularly digital firms, are taxed where the products or services are sold, limiting debt-related deductions by multinationals at 30 per cent of the profits, um, limiting the ability for multinationals to abuse Australia's tax uh, treaties when holding intellectual property in tax havens, and finally introducing transparency measures, including reporting requirements um, on tax information, beneficial ownership, tax haven exposure, and relation to government tenders. And as I like to uh, reiterate before going, 
um, that it is time to have integrity and transparency back in our political system, and that's what Labor is delivering. Senator Little. Thank you. Well, the question was, what's the plan for more GPs in areas of greatest need? Changes like the recent expansion of the distribution priority area classifications by the Albanese Labor government have only had a negative impact as we work to address workforce challenges in rural and regional Australia. Solving for a problem in one area by making the situation worse for another is a really ill-conceived solution to a really serious issue. The DPA classification system was designed as a crucial part of solving the GP's crisis in rural communities by identifying areas of greatest need. The decision to expand the priority status classification to outer metropolitan suburbs has effectively rendered any advantage for rural and remote parts of the country to the dustbin. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia has stated that this policy change will cost the lives of rural and remote patients who are already suffering poorer health outcomes. We have already seen a number of real-life examples of how this expansion has pulled international medical graduates away from rural communities who are crying out for GPs. Examples include a doctor who was headed for Huonville in Tasmania, but because they now have the option of living in Hobart under the DPA changes, the Huonville community were left without the primary care support that doctor would have provided. The regional centre of Mildura has also been battling to keep many of its IMGs following the closure of a major clinic because practising in Dandenong is now an option. When asked in estimates if the Albanese government had consulted the rural and regional communities before deciding to expand the DPA classifications and make it harder for them to attract doctors, Assistant Minister McCarthy replied, no. Labor have consistently refused to even acknowledge the impact of this decision on rural communities, and today, in question time, Minister Butler couldn't even provide the number of towns who have lost a GP since the decision came into effect. Right now, we need to be absolutely focused on ensuring the right levers are in place to get more doctors practising in the bush, not making it harder for rural communities to attract GPs. We will continue to seek answers from the government on this serious issue until they provide some transparency on the full extent of the impact that their decision is having on rural, regional and remote communities. It has been clear that the Albanese Labor government does not have a plan to address the critical workforce shortages we are seeing across Australia's health care sector, particularly in relation to GPs. So far, all we've seen from this government is their dedication to copying coalition policies from the election. They have not announced one single new initiative that meaningfully responds to GP shortages as they are unfolding. The government's Jobs and Skills Summit was meant to address this issue, but all it delivered was another talk fest that failed to deliver any real plans. The only initiative they have actually delivered, expanding the distribution priority area DPA classifications for overseas trained doctors has exacerbated the problem by ripping away GPs from many rural and regional communities who are already struggling with GP shortages. Labor are too busy working on their next grab line for a headline, instead of with the practices and communities on the ground who understand the issue and are crying out for the government to listen. Don't take my word. RACGP Rural Chair Dr Michael Clements has said, this will absolutely lead to an immediate migration of doctors out of rural and remote areas and more closer to bigger cities as a direct consequence. Minister Butler must urgently explain to the Australian public and the health care sector if he has a plan to address the issue of GP shortages that are unfolding across the country. We asked, who did you consult? How many towns were negatively affected? That is what we need the answer to, and we don't need any more services or GPs exiting rural, regional and remote communities. 
I put the question to the motion as moved by Senator Canavan. Those for the question say aye, against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, I rise to take note of the questions I asked Senator Watt representing the Communications Minister earlier today, and that, of course, was in relation to the disastrous uh, performance of some in the Murdoch press uh, over the last uh, number of months, increasingly uh, becoming um, fever pitch with hysteria and, of course, craziness. And this, of course, has uh, come to a head over the weekend. We've had the results of the Victorian election, where overwhelmingly Victorians rejected uh, the overt political campaign trumpeted by uh, quarters of the Murdoch press, and in fact, voters seemingly ignored, ignored uh, what happened and what was being printed on the front pages of the News Corp papers or seen uh, in the crazy uh, shows late at night on Sky News. Front page after front page after front page uh, of the News Corp newspapers uh, argued that voters should vote the other way, and it seems overwhelmingly that Victorians ignored it. This, of course, Mr Deputy President, the reason I have asked the questions around the need for media diversity is because if a democracy is to be strong, if a democracy is to be robust, if a diversity of voices are to be represented in our parliaments and we have good government policy in the interests of all Australians, we need a strong, reliable, trustworthy news media sector. And what we've got in this country is a media sector that is overwhelmingly concentrated, more than many other comparable countries in the world, by one particular corporation. And that, of course, uh, is the Murdoch Empire and News Corp. And that part of the Australian media has become a parody of itself. Hysteria, lies, mistruths, and more and more and more opinion over journalism, opinion over fact. Meanwhile, there are good journalists working across all uh, parts of the Australian media who are just trying to do their job and do it well, who have good stories to tell, have good investigative stories to tell, and want to be able to do their part of upholding a strong democracy. Journalists should be able to question governments, hold governments to account, and know that when they have a good story, when they are onto something, that they can have that published and believed. But what we've got in this country is the Murdoch press dragging down every journalist in this country, even their own. There are some very, very good journalists who work within the Murdoch empire. Don't get me wrong. And I feel increasingly sorry for them, that they work within an organisation that has become a parody of itself, seemingly disinterested in truth disinterested in fact, disinterested in upholding democracy. And this is why we need to have a serious account of media diversity in this country. We do need a judicial inquiry with the powers of a royal commission to ensure we have a media we ensure we have media regulation that is fit for purpose and fit for the modern world. Whether it's the dominance of the craziness that comes out of our social media platforms, the big media giants, without any control, without any regulation, they think they can do whatever they want. And just look at what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter right now. He's fired not just half his staff, but the very people that protect everyday users and citizens from harmful and dangerous content. Twitter is becoming a cesspool, and that is it. A cesspool of hate, trolls and misinformation. And on the other hand, you've got the other domination of the media in the Murdoch press, which cares little about fact and real information. We need 
to fix the media landscape in this country. We need laws and regulations that are fit for purpose. And it shouldn't be up to the politicians to pick and choose. This needs to be at arm's length. Thank and you, that Sarah is why we young. need a royal commission and I'll we need put, one today. I'll put the question. Those the question say aye against no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? I should now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Oh, sorry, Senator Pratt. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators McCarthy and O'Neill for today for personal reasons. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Hughes and Molan for the 28th of November to the 2nd of December for personal reasons. Senators Birmingham and Dean Smith for the 2nd of December for personal reasons. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clark. A postponement notification has been lodged for today by Senator Hanson Young in relation to business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, postponed from today to the 29th of November 2022. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 10 on today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Cadell. Mr Deputy President, I seek leave to amend business of the Senate of motion number two relating to a reference regarding high voltage electricity infrastructure before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Deputy President. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. I move the motion as amended. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. Aye. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Sorry, did you? Okay. Well, I think I'll correct my I'll correct my call. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Cadell, which is in reference to, to a, which is a reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee and Transport References Committee, be agreed to. Those of the question passed to the right of the chair. Those against to the left. I appoint as teller for the eyes, Senator Askew, and teller for the no, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there have been 29 ayes and 30 noes. It's passed in the negative. Amen. Senator Dunningham or Matt? Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. I ask that business of Senate notice motion number three, proposing a reference to the Education and Employment References Committee relating to the disruption in Australian schools classrooms, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the Senator. I move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. A division required? Ring the bells.
lock the doors. Question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator O'Sullivan regarding a reference to the to a com to Education and Employment References Committee be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Pass to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart, and teller for the noes, Senator McKim. Honourable Senators, there being 45 ayes and 12 noes, it's, it's resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rice, yes. Yeah, just, I'll just let broadcasting get your microphone on. Yes, Senator. Uh, you see, the Senator seeks leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? It's, it's, no, it's been denied. We come to Senator Hanson. Is, Which notice the motion? Um, 96, 97. 96. 96. I ask that uh, general business uh, notice the motion number 96 be taken as formal. There, is there any objection to this motion be taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. I move the motion. The question is that the motion is leave granted. Leave has not been granted. I'm going to put the question. I seek. Uh, I put the question order order I put the question that the motion be agreed to those for the question say aye against no I think I think the noes have it is the division required division is required ring the bells
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the order for production of documents is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the eyes, Senator Urquhart, and teller for the nose. Sorry, teller for the eyes, Senator Askew, and teller for the nose, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 40 ayes and 18 noes, it's resol resolved in the affirmative. I just seek leave to table my motion uh, in regards to uh, notice of motion number 96, so table a statement in regards to our response. Leave is not required. It's tabled. Uh, Senator Hanson. I ask that general business notice of motion number 97 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. I move the motion. I put the question in the Minister. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Minister. It has been the long-standing practice of successive Australian governments not to disclose privileged legal advice, and the government maintains that it is not in the public interest to, de to depart from this established position. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. One minute.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, against to the left. I appoint teller for the eyes, Senator Askew, and teller for the nose, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 35 ayes and 17 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. We now come to 98 and 99. Senator, uh, sorry, Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Macdonald, I ask that general business notice of motion number 98 and 99 be taken together as formal motions. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I move the motions. Is, is there any objection to the motion being taken for, as formal? There being no objection, I, I note the Senator has moved it, so I'll put the question. Those for, the, those for the question say aye, against no. I think the ayes have it. <laughs> so that, that was an easy one. Uh, we now come to 100. Senator Smith. Mr. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 100 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the senator. The motion. I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. We now come to matters of public importance. Honourable Senators, Senator Lambie has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown in item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note four senators are standing. Not including the proposer, I note that. I understand that informal arrangements you can be seated now. I've noted you are standing. I understand that for informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers into debate, in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. If the Tasmanian State Government gets its way, we are going to spend $370 million on a new Hobart Stadium at Macquarie Point. 
Anybody with a checkbook worth $375 million in free cash and facing the problems that Tasmania is facing wouldn't start with a stadium. The lack of U Butte Stadium is, yes, a problem, but it isn't at the top of the list of priorities. So why are we doing this? Because we have a gun to our head and it's being held by the CEO of the AFL. The AFL says we can't have a team without building the stadium. Even though we've already got two, both of them meet the grade for the AFL, we play games there now. But you don't have to worry about those kinds of details when you're not, one, not, the, one playing, not the one paying for it. And the AFL are not the ones paying for it, Tasmanian taxpayers are. Why? Because the new stadium was never included in the AFL task force business case for a Tassie team. It wasn't supposed to be part of the deal. It snuck its way in and suddenly we're on the hook, just like a fish. And don't get me wrong, it's not to say that a stadium wouldn't be a good thing to have. It would be great to have, I'm sure. Hobart is missing out on major conferences, and at the moment Hobart doesn't have a site for a conference like that, which means we go without that money that comes from interstate tourism. That money is worth something to the state coffers. How much? No idea. Because the government, state government of Tasmania has no idea. No business case prepared, no figures to support supporting the decision. We just don't know. It's pie-in-the-sky stuff. But there'll be some value from it, and that's a good thing. It's why it's not a bad idea in, in isolation. We just can't look at this in isolation. I wish that we could. But if we're going to, going to back this, what do you say to the people sleeping in their cars? Here's some free tickets. Go on your way. Do you just tell pensioners freezing in their homes in winter because they can't afford their power bills that we'll send them some AFL-branded socks? Fair income. It's a fine thing to have a stadium. Any more economically secure times, maybe we'd even be able to justify it right now. But it can't be on top of the list of things we need to spend $375 million on in Tasmania. We're in a housing crisis. We're in a health crisis. People are dying waiting for a hospital bed. They're not dying waiting for a bloody footy team. People are living in tents, and our priority has to be putting a roof over their heads, not putting a roof over a stadium. And the argument from the Tasmanian Premier that this money won't come at the cost of health and housing, with all due respect, is absolute rubbish. It is up to you where you allocate that money that Tasmanian taxpayers pay. Wake up to yourself. Is he saying it wouldn't be addressed faster if we spend it more? Why? Is he out of, out of ideas of what he could spend the money on to make things better sooner? If he is, I'd say throw a rock out of your office window and whoever it hits will have a million ideas for you, but don't actually do that because if it hurts them, there'll be nowhere in the health system to put them. If he isn't saying that and he's got ideas how to make things better sooner, is he saying that they don't need the money? If so, why isn't he doing them already? So, of course, what he's saying is he has always is he has ways to make it better, faster, but they need money right now, and they don't have the money. They don't have $375 million sitting behind their couch. So where's the money coming from, Premier? From the roads? From the schools? From the hospitals? From Tasmanians? to the AFL. The AFL is holding a gun to the head of Tasmanians, and that is the truth of the matter, and you are absolutely despicable when there are more crucial points that need to be dealt with. People's lives are at risk in Tasmania, and here we are talking about a stadium that, quite frankly, we cannot afford. We cannot afford it when people's health is at risk, when teachers need a pay rise, when we've got ramping going on like there's no tomorrow, this is absolutely disgusting, and you're rubbing into the face of Tasmania some new u boot stadium that's got some automatic roof on it. What planet are you on, Rockcliffe? What planet are you on? I can tell you. Here's a go for you. Try him, Rockcliffe. Stick out. Come on, Rocky, stick your chest out. Let's see what you've got. Because I can tell you, instead, we have a $375 million, million to spend on he helping us lift our literacy rates, reducing our electric, le elective surgery times, sealing and resurfing our roads, and they say, give us a stadium or we'll shoot. I say to you, Rocky, 
Tell them to pull the goddamn trigger and try their luck. Thank Go you. on, Rocky. Thank you, Stick Senator Lambie. Thank out. you, Senator Lambie. Senator Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. At the outset, I would like to put on record our support for a Tasmanian AFL and an AFLW team. Nearly every Tasmanian would want to support or want to see the AFL a truly national game and having an AFL team in Tasmania and an AFLW team in Tasmania makes that a reality. Now, having said that, I'm also on the record of um, saying why is it that Tasmania somehow has to jump through hoops and other hurdles that other states haven't had to jump through? Why are conditions being put on Tasmania receiving an AFL uh, side that other states haven't had to um, Ha haven't had to put up with. Now, this is a really interesting uh, discussion around priorities, and, and what I have to say here, right here and right now, we have Senator Lambie's network obviously opposed to the stadium. We have the federal Liberal uh, team nearly all opposed to the stadium. I think the Greens might be opposed to the stadium as well. But what I, so what that all comes down to is we have a Premier back home that isn't listening. He's not listening to his own team. He's not listening to other federal representatives. But also he's not listening to the people on the street. Because nearly everyone that I've spoken to have indicated that there are other things that the Tasmanian government should be looking at. There's other priorities, and they do go to health and hospitals and housing and education. And, the, and what I hear from the state, my own state Labor colleagues, and they have been calling for um, Premier, Premier Rockcliffe to change his decision on this, to, to change the decision to allocate $375 million to a stadium um, that we shouldn't have to build just so we get our Tasmanian team. They've talked about people coming up to them and saying, why can't we put that money to hospitals? Why can't we put that money to uh, housing? We're in desperate need. In fact, the Premier, Premier Rockcliffe, is on record of say, saying, asking the federal government for injections of cash to help in those other areas. Just extraordinary. Extraordinary. So I hope uh, Premier Rockcliffe is listening to this debate. And, I, and more importantly, I hope, I hope, I hope the AFL uh, CEO, Gillan McLaughlin, is listening to this debate. Because quite frankly, um, they should be ashamed of themselves that they have come here, that they have put a condition on a Tasmanian team, which no other state has had to um, uh, uh, have to jump, no other hoops that uh, other states have to jump through. So it'd be good to be able to have our young players here playing for a Tasmanian side, and um, I just hope that Premier Rockcliffe has a uh, listens to not only people here, but more importantly, the community back home. So I have, but I'm also on the record of saying that the Australian, the Australian people elected an Albanese government on a platform of collaboration and respect for all levels of government. And respect in that sense is that we will wait for a business case for the Tasmanian government before reaching a decision. Now, this is a, when we talk about business cases, this is about a business case that needs to stack up, and this. No, 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 that is completely incorrect, Senator Wish Wilson. That is completely in incorrect. I've been very upfront with the, uh, when I've been asked by the media that this is the position that the, the government has made clear from the very get-go um, that if there's a business case that, that comes forward, and there isn't a business case at the moment. 
There isn't a business case, and nothing has been presented to this government. And what we've said is that we will consider it on its mer mer merits, but it has to stack up. And quite frankly, Pen Premier Rockcliffe should be really uh, looking at his Thank priorities. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy President. And look, I'm pleased to be able to make a contribution to this debate. Uh, to give a bit of context to some of the things I've said publicly down in Tasmania on this issue, and it is something I feel strongly about, and I don't resile from anything I've said. Uh, I, with Senator Brown and with Senator Lambie, and I suspect others in this debate, support Tasmania getting a team. We deserve it. We have a fine AFL hi uh, history. We've provided some of the best players in the AFL's history uh, over many years, and that's something we could continue to do um, with a team of our own and an AFLW team as well. But look. I don't agree with the idea of the federal government funding a stadium, but I'm not going to let Senator Brown and the Australian Labor Party off the hook that easily. You can't come in here and say that, Senator, uh, that the Premier of Tasmania, Mr Rockcliffe, isn't listening and then say that you haven't made your minds up yet. The Australian government have to actually put a decision on the record at some point, and I look forward to the day that that happens. Um, and going out and listening to the community is a good start to do that. But I do actually want to make a couple of points around uh, the stadium and, of course, around the Tasmanian government. Any day of the week I'd back Rockcliffe over White, Premier Rockcliffe over Opposition Leader White, because you know what? The Tasmanian Labor Party can't even really come up with a position. They've got to go and have a taxpayer-funded referendum to figure out whether they support the stadium. So they want to, they want to spend taxpayers' money to figure out what position they should have to fund a stadium with taxpayers' money. Yeah. So I tell you what, at least I know where I stand. Yes. Premier Rockcliffe knows where he stands. The Labor Party in Tasmania, federally and at a state level, don't know where they stand. But back to a point that uh, Senator Brown made, which I do agree with, and I know Senator Brown is a fine Tasmanian who yeah. actually does have her state's interests at heart. I know that very clearly, along with her Tasmanian colleagues. The AFL should take note. They should not treat Tasmanians as mugs. They landed a historic deal for broadcast rights—$4.5 billion, historic, self-described, private money. Why aren't they putting any of that into the construction of a stadium? Why aren't they being asked to fund this uh, arrangement that would enable us to get a team? If it's so important to them, to the club presidents, for us to have a team, why don't they do something about it? Instead of asking the taxpayers of Tasmania to foot the bill, I ex well, I'll tell you what, Senator Brown, if you want to stand up and say that the Australian government won't fund the stadium, you do it today. You've got an opportunity. There's another Labor speaker, and I'm looking forward to that being put on the record. But if your view is that the AFL should fund it, then make that clear in the next contribution, and the Australian government won't fund it. We should be putting the asset as a united team on the AFL, right. as has been suggested by Senator Lambie, to fund this stadium. Let's get them to do what they're telling us we need to do, yep. not Tasmanians to have to choose between whether they get Commonwealth funding for a hospital bed or a football stadium. Yep. Senator Lambie is right, and we should be backing this point. Gillan McLaughlin and the AFL should be doing the right thing by every person that wants an AFL team and they should be funding it. $4.5 billion sloshing around over the next few years could go to something good, like building a stadium if that's what they think we need to have. Having said that, though, Senator Brown was also right on the fact that we are the only jurisdiction being asked to build a stadium to have what everyone else has. They love picking on the little state. Yes, we've got 12 senators, and I think it's time we made our voice heard collectively. The AFL can no longer treat us like mugs. And if they've got a really good case to make, I hope they make it. I hope they can tell the Australian government why using $375 of that finite resource, taxpayers' money, is better spent on this than anything else, than on housing, than on more roads, than on hospital beds, than on sorting out that scourge of family and domestic violence. If AFL want to actually point to reasons that funding a stadium with taxpayers' money is more important than funding any of the things I've just mentioned, I'd love to hear it. Because I tell you what, when I go out and face the voters, 
They are not going to take the lines that they might, the AFL might offer me. I'd love it if they had to go out and uh, face the electors like members of parliament have to, but they don't. They can get away with seeking to blackmail our state, but we should not allow that to happen. The AFL should do the right thing and the Labor Party should make clear what their position Thank is, you, state Senator and federal. Dunham. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Can I just say, Senator Dunningham, you and I get on pretty well, but I'm disappointed to hear you say that the State Labor Party haven't put their position or support it. They do not, and they've been very clear about it for months that they don't support it. They've been clear about it for months. You must read the newspapers. You know. We know they've come out and said they don't support it. Also, can I just say, and I'll come to this a bit later, but we have not been asked for any money. So what, I, what I'm saying is Minister Rockcliffe really couldn't organise he couldn't organise a chook raffle. Order, he wants order, money. Order. Senator He's Billick, asked for money for Senator, other things. Senator Billick, please direct your comments through the chair. Oh, my apologies, um, Acting Deputy President. You're correct. I should know better. But Senator Dunham knows, through you, Chair, that, that the um, State Liberal Party have not actually approached us for money because they can't get a business case together, I presume. I mean, seriously, they couldn't, they couldn't run a chook raffle down there. They are hopeless. They are hopeless. We support, as, as Senator Brown said, I can hardly hear myself, Mr. Acting Order. Deputy no, you're President. You're quite right, Senator Betty. Money Senate from up here, I might say. Order. Senators on my left will perhaps. Be quiet. Thank I was, you. I was going to say turn now, it down, but I mean be, be quiet. And I thank Senator, Senator Lambie. I thank Senator Lambie for the MPI today, because what it does do, it gives us a chance to highlight those challenges that Tasmanians are facing, and that is around health, housing, and education, and in the public sector. Um, in the, sorry, in the pro, yeah, in the public sector, where people are so the workers are so overworked that they're you know having to go on strike because there's not enough of them, they're not paid enough, they haven't had a wage increase in years, and we've got a state Liberal government that's just walking all over people saying they want to build this amazing stadium. I'm often one of the first to complain when Tasmania gets left off the map, and we know that happens a lot. Tasmania is an AFL state and always has been, and we do deserve our own AFL and AFLW teams not just a matter of state pride, but also for the economic benefits they deliver. As Senator Dunham said, our state has produced a great slew of AFL players. Um, names that people in here would know, not from Tasmania, Darrell Baldock, Peter Hudson and Ian Stewart. And if I actually want to mention a few other people, my husband, being a Richmond fan, would probably like me to add Matthew Richardson and Jack Rewalt. All in all, Tasmania has actually supplied over 300 players at the top level—300. Eight games a year are already played on the AFL fixture are already played in Tasmania with the capacity for more people and the capacity for more games. So for a Tasmanian team, it's really a no-brainer. Obviously, we have to have a Tasmanian team. But we should be able to do it on a level playing field with other states, not have a gun held to our head by the AFL. Unfortunately, I do know it wasn't initially the AFL that brought this issue up. It was the former Premier who added this into the debate. Um, so why he ever did that, I don't know. Why he ever did that, I don't know, but it was not part of what the AFL uh, put to people. But we shouldn't have to jump through extra hoops. It's not right. I come in here and I argue for state rights, um, for territory rights, sorry, because I think they should have the same rights as states. And it's the same when it comes to Tassie and footy. Why is Tassie like treated like the Cinderella of the football world? I don't understand why. We've proven that we can get people to football games. We play games already at um, at the stadiums that are already exist. There's two stadiums that exist. It's not like we don't have a stadium. 
There's already two stadiums that exist. So why does the Premier of Tasmania want to have another stadium built? At an enormous cost, enormous cost, as Senator Lambie has said and Senator Brown has said, while people are waiting to get on the, the housing list, we've, we've got more people than ever on the housing list. We've had the state government say they're going to build um, a house, you know, uh, thank you, Senator it's 10, Billick. houses. Thank you, we've Senator got... Billick. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> the Greens have long been on the record supporting Tasmanian men's and women's teams in the AFL. Tasmania is a genuine footy state. We deserve teams in the national competitions. In fact, they will not be national competitions unless they have Tasmanian sides in them. And we thought we are on the way because we knew that we had cleared every single hurdle, even the blatantly unfair and unreasonable ones, put in our path by the AFL. But then not long ago, at five minutes to midnight, into town swans the AFL CEO, Mr Gil McLaughlin. After having driven straight past the homeless Tasmanians sleeping in tents on the domain, he arrogantly demanded that we spend money, a billion dollars, on a sports stadium we don't need instead of building them the homes they so desperately need. And worse than that, he said that unless we build this sports stadium that we don't need, we will not get teams in the AFL. Well, this is a disgrace. It's an insult to Tasmanians, and it is nothing less than a blackmail of our state. And he's got no right, and the AFL has no right to blackmail our state like this. And nor should the state Liberal government so weakly cower in the face of the AFL's demands, because it's all about the money for the AFL and for Mr McLaughlin. Now, you could not find a more literal example of the phrase moving the goalposts. For nearly two decades, the AFL has been happy for Hawthorne to play at York Park, accepting millions of dollars of the state's money to buy the matches. We've been happy for uh, games to be played. North Melbourne at Bell Reeve in the south, again, millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to buy those games into Tasmania. And now, at the 11th hour, with all the ridiculous arguments against the Tasmanian team having been carefully dismantled, apparently we don't have a good enough stadium. Well, give us a break. They were good enough for AFL for the last 20 years, and they'll be good enough for the next 20 years. The state does not have a billion dollars to spend on a footy stadium we don't need, while thousands languish on our public housing waiting lists and on our elective surgery waiting lists. Aboriginal Tasmanians were promised a truth and reconciliation park as the centrepiece of the Macquarie Point development. They've been working on it for years, a place of healing, a place of storytelling, of connection and of country. Then they woke up not long ago to the news that a stadium we don't even need would take priority over a reconciliation and truth park, and that park could just quite literally languish in the shadow of a stadium. No consultation, no communication, just here it is, like it or lump it. Well, news for the AFL and Mr McLaughlin. Tasmanians don't like it, and we're not prepared to lump it. Tasmanians are dying, literally dying, while they are waiting for ambulances. Or they're dying in ramped ambulances because there are no hospital beds available to save their lives. It is expensive, uh, offensive in the extreme to spend over a billion dollars on a stadium like this that we don't need while our hospital system buckles under the strain of years of underinvestment and so many Tasmanians are sleeping rough. Only the federal Labor government can save us from the Tasmanian Liberal government. The Greens urge Mr Albanese to listen to the calls from across the spectrum, from across the Tasmanian community, and refuse to fund a single dollar of this massive white elephant. If he does that, if he refuses to fund it, it will not be built. And I'll tell you now, if it's not built, 
sooner or later we will get our teams in the AFL and the AFLW, but those teams must be delivered on reasonable terms, not at the expense of Tasmanians who most need help, and certainly not at the expense of a pure and simple, obscene attempt to blackmail Tasmanians into spending a billion dollars of public money that nobody can afford building a stadium that nobody needs. Thank you, Senator McKim. The time for the discussion has expired. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Bragg, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is, this, is the proposal supported? Thank you very much. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Bragg. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise to make a contribution on this uh, very important matter of uh, public importance, which is in relation to the competency of the Assistant Treasurer. And I note uh, the last contribution from Senator McKim. Uh, we also heard from uh, Senator McKim on Friday, who uh, set out some of the issues that uh, members of this place uh, have been having in their engagement with the Assistant Treasurer. And it appears as if a deal with uh, Mr Jones is not worth the paper it's written on. But in relation to this uh, minister's maladministration of this portfolio, there are a litany of examples which I seek to catalogue today for the Senate's consideration. Now, of course, the matter before us is the FAR bill, the FAR package of bills, which is about ensuring that uh, financial executives are held to account under Australian law, that there are appropriate penalties where there, there is uh, uh, problems that they preside over, where there are problems which they preside over, I should say. Now, uh, this uh, bill has been totally botched by Mr Jones. Uh, of course, this bill also contains the compensation scheme of last resort, which I would say is a very interesting idea, a very interesting idea indeed, that the Commonwealth should compensate where there has been a problem in the market, uh, which may have been caused by a market operator or it may have been caused by a regulator not doing its job. But the point is that Mr Jones in opposition campaigned for much higher compensation caps uh, in relation to this bill. But when he introduced the bill himself as a minister, of course, he reverted back to the position that the coalition had in government. So Mr Jones, again, showing that he is unable to keep a position for a period of time. But of course, when you reflect upon his tenure as the minister for financial services and the assistant treasurer, Mr Jones's first priority was to strip transparency from superannuation payments to unions and to banks and insurance companies. Mr Jones has chosen to remove transparency in a compulsory savings scheme, which is a remarkable turn of events. That someone would come into a new portfolio and, as their first act, remove the ability of a person, a worker, to see where their own money is being sent. That is a remarkable uh, beginning. Now, of course, uh, Mr Jones, of course, has, has had another defeat today with the government deciding that it would remove from its own legislation the faith-based carve-out, which Mr Jones proposed in opposition. Now, this policy, uh, which was his main policy in superannuation, this is his key policy, he took the election, a carve-out from the superannuation performance test for religious-based funds has been dropped today by Mr Jones uh, after the Senate gave Mr Jones some advice. And I note the contributions of Senator Smith and McKim during the committee process. The Senate told Mr Jones that it was not going to be able to support this strange idea that someone in a religious-based fund, of which there are only a few, should be prepared to accept a poorer return than a person in a non-religious-based fund. Uh, a very interesting precedent indeed for someone who has spent most of their career arguing the virtues of compulsory super. Now, if I was a great supporter of the compulsory superannuation scheme, I would not be wanting to open it, I would not open it up to these sort of precedents. Because once you open the door to one idea that is not about the best financial performance of the fund, then you open the floodgates to every crazy idea. And I can assure the Senate that there are many crazy ideas in relation to the expenditure of superannuation funds. 
Of course, today we look at the uh, Australian Financial Review, and there is an, an article referring to Mr Jones, which is uh, called Mr Jones is Out of His Depth. And it says here, across uh, the Albanese government, the Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones, stands out like dog's paws. It goes on to say that in the six months since he took charge of the ministry, the member for Whitlam has chewed up the furniture, rubbed his bum on the carpet and cocked his leg over his parliamentary colleagues, the financial sector and the voters of Australia. Now That is in the Financial Review today, and I think it's a pretty fair assessment, actually, of Mr Jones's tenure, that, of course, after having uh, removed the transparency requirements for super, failed to protect consumers in the superannuation sector, failed to deliver any cryptocurrency uh, reforms, and of course now having lost his key, his key policy, the religious carve-out for the super funds, uh, which of course there are only two funds, uh, none of which have my super funds, uh, that is a remarkable tenure, maybe the worst assistant treasurer ever. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Ayres. Well, I mean, goodness gracious me. I mean, here we are. Here we are. It's obviously, you know, term four, right? Uh, everybody's tired and got the sillies. Um, this, is, this is the greatest uh, effort at insider baseball that you could imagine. Um, this is the week where the government is going to introduce um, sensible reforms in industrial relations that, that are going to make the country a better place, are going to be good for our workplaces. This is the week that uh, the government's going to introduce uh, you know, what, what the last government couldn't do, couldn't bring itself to do, reforms to introduce a National Integrity Commission, the National Anti-Corruption Commission. This is the week where you know, the modern Liberal Party, which had decided to tie its fortunes to the bunch of sort of ratbags and nutters and conspiracy theorists who are enlarging themselves in the Liberal Party's base in Victoria, decide to tie themselves to you know, some people who, who you wouldn't want to have a beer with, really, like you'd avoid at parties, um, the, the sort of extremists. Uh, the, the extremist takeover of the Victorian Liberal Party, and they've seen the culmination, the impact of that, you know, that uh, uh, strategy. What, what, what was the outcome? What, well, re-election of the Andrews government, uh, less Liberals, a few more Nationals, uh, and they have preference straight home and elected a few more Greens and a few inner-city seats. I mean, what art of genius! What, so in this. In this week, where we're going to see the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, being censured, what, 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 what's, it, what's Senator Bragg in here do, talking about? I, I mean, some arcane issue to do with the negotiation of financial sector reform. And when you look at the well, backdrop, you look at you look at the backdrop to this. What is the real backdrop to this? What's really going on? The previous government, and, and before that, the previous government before that, resisted, like fought tooth and nail, the idea of having the Hain Royal Commission. They didn't want it. They didn't want it to happen, to protect the interests of people who had done unscrupulous things in uh, the financial services sector. Senator Bragg's friends. Done unscrupulous things. Uh, the, the interest he's in here trying to protect. Now remember, they fought so hard to stop uh, there being a proper inquiry into all of those matters. And then finally, they're forced, dragged, kicking and screaming, into having a Royal Commission uh, headed by uh, former Justice Hain. Who did, who did a very solid piece of work, very careful piece of work. I mean, and, and don't forget the photos. I mean, there's a whole lot of bring back Josh sort of stuff going on now in Victoria, right? Bring back Josh. We had an incremental few degrees of few degrees. Oh, don't worry, I'm coming back to the topic. Don't you worry about that. The, so, so we go. So, so all the bring back Josh stuff. 
I mean, I mean, if something goes really badly, try it again. That's my, that's my, I urge the Victorian Liberal Party to do that. That would be good. We can never forget the photos of Justice Hayne and the former Treasurer. I've never seen a more unhappy couple. You know, one, one who actually believed in proper financial regulation, one who was actually doing everything that he could to avoid it. And then we saw the sorry months and years that followed that announcement. Like no reform. Like nothing happened. And now we've got a government that in a steady, careful, methodical way is introducing reforms. Now, reform's difficult. But, but I find this MPI resolution really interesting. It's got two sentences in it. it. Within those two sentences, it attacks the government for not consulting and then condemns the government for consulting. I mean, this is an incoherent, um, out of place, misconceived uh, MPI. I expect that we'll see many more of them in 2023. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator McKim. Well, thank you. Deputy President, uh, I placed the facts of this matter on the, the record in this chamber last week, uh, and I don't intend to labour them, but without any shadow of a doubt, uh, the Assistant Treasurer and I did have an agreement to include in the financial accountability regime civil penalties for people who breach their accountability obligations. But uh, what we saw um, last week was not just Labor uh, refusing to honour an agreement. It was one of those moments when Australians got a bit of a peek through the curtains at who actually runs this place. Last week was as transparent an exercise of power by the big business community in this country as you would ever want to see. Within 24 hours, of the agreement going public to put million-dollar fines on dodgy bankers who ripped off their customers, the Labor Party folded in a screaming heap under the weight of lobbying by the big banks. Now, Shame. I remind people these are the very banks who donated well north of $400,000 in the last 12 months that we have uh, donations data for in this country. I'll tell you what, money talks and it talks very loudly indeed in this place. The other thing is it was the way the banks steamrolled the Labor Party. They weren't even slightly shy or ashamed about it. They were naked in their exercise of power. In fact, they wanted everyone in this place to see that they made the government renege on the agreement. The banks wanted everyone in the duopoly here, Labor and the LNP, who might be thinking about pushing for something that curbs bankers' power, who might be wanting to tilt the scales in favour of the customers and against the big bankers, to know that, in fact, it is the big bankers who are in charge of this place. And my word, they've got the Labor Party on a short leash. We saw that last week. Now, they don't really need the Liberal Party on a leash because they've been bred to be loyal to the big banks, <laughs> which is why Senator Bragg's motion is, quite frankly, a little bit of rubbish. The inclusion of civil penalties for individuals who breach their accountability obligations was consulted on by the former government, was the subject of consideration by the Senate Economics Committee into both the previous governments and this government's bill. So the idea that it's come out of nowhere is absolute tosh. The policy is straightforward. The public benefit is abundantly clear to the public, and we now know the only people who don't want million-dollar fines for dodgy bankers who rip off their customers are the dodgy bankers who rip off their customers that have both the major parties in this place right where they want them. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, I must say, Senator McKim is more forgiving of the Assistant Minister than I would be in his place. And I was quite staggered. I was surprised when I heard the circumstances of the deal that was reneged on. Now, I first heard the term reneged when I used to renege when I used to um, play cards with my grandparents. And this was the first time I heard the, con the, the term reneged. You played the wrong card. You were meant to play a card of a certain um, uh, a certain uh, a club or a whatever, and you played a heart, so you're a neg. That's the first time I heard the term reneged, and that's what that's what that's what's happened in this case. 
And I want to quote from the Sydney Morning Herald article of 24 November 2022, written by Rachel Clun. Because, because my main concern with this is I can understand, or I can try to understand, how the Assistant Treasurer met with Senator McKim and maybe he did a deal he shouldn't have done. And I could understand if he actually then approached Senator McKim and said to Senator McKim, I'm sorry about that. I overstepped the mark. I didn't really understand the consequences of what I was doing. Um, the Treasurer has come down on me like a tonne of bricks. I've got to retreat. I can understand if he did that. I can understand him making a mistake. We're all human. We're all human. Uh, I could understand that. But what really distressed me, as someone who's gotten to know Senator McKim over the last three and a half years, as a man of his word, is the Assistant Minister went to the press and said, and I quote, Jones said there had been no final agreement on the Greens' amendments, and there was clearly plenty of stakeholder concern about civil penalties. We've asked them what it would take to get their support for that and other bills, he said. There'd been no sign-off on anything, end quote. So he actually went to the media, he actually went to the media and, in my view, cast imputations on Senator McKim. Because there are only two people in the room. Well, I don't know how many people are in the room, but there's Senator McKim and there's the Assistant Treasurer. They can't both be right. And Senator McKim said in the same article, and I quote, there was 100 per cent categorically a deal. We looked each other in the eye and shook hands, he said. If the minister is saying there was no agreement, he is not fit to be a minister. This is a disgraceful move to renege, there's that word renege, on our agreement, end quote. So only one of them can be right. Only one of them can be right. We're here in this chamber. We've all, we all know Senator McKim. I take Senator McKim at his word. I take Senator McKim at his word, absolutely. And I query why didn't the assistant treasurer come out and just honestly say he overstepped the mark? He made a mistake. Why didn't he do that? Why did he actually come out and say there was no final agreement when Senator McKim is so certain that there was an agreement. Why do that? Why cast dispersions on one of our fellow senators? It was totally unnecessary. And to me, that is the most concerning thing about this whole matter, that when a senator from this place, and I don't care which party, actually approaches a member of the executive and raises legitimate concerns, and the concerns Senator McKim raises in this space. I was chair of the Economics Committee, so uh, I was part of the reporting process in the last parliament of looking at this legislation. It's a very legitimate concern in relation to the level of civil penalties that senior executives in our banking industry should, should rightly face in the course of material, and we're talking about material misconduct. And some of the things that came out of the Hain Royal Commission were absolutely horrifying, horrified me as the next company secretary and general counsel of a publicly listed company. Horrified me. But what concerns me is every senator in this place, when they approach a member of the executive to have a discussion about proposed amendments to a piece of legislation, they should actually know or have faith with the member of the executive that they'll stay true to their bargain, that they'll deliver on the deal. That's the way this place needs to work. It can't work otherwise. If you can't trust, if you can't trust the members of executive to stay true to their to their word when you engage with them on a on a on, so, on a matter such as this, so that is the thing which most disturbs me: that a member of this place, a senator in this place who cares passionately about this matter, went in and had a discussion with the assistant treasurer, in good faith thought they had a deal, and then and then the assistant treasurer tips a bucket on him in the Sydney Morning Herald, in the public media. Absolutely astounding, and I think all senators should be concerned about this. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Roberts. Thank you. It seems Stephen Jones is to the Labor Party as Josh Frydenberg was to the Liberals, the bank's man in the cab government. Whether it's defending the right of the banks to bail in the cash in your account, whether it's turning a blind eye to banks closing their rural bank branches, which have increased this year under Minister Jones, or it's allowing the king's currency to be shunned so the banks can force everyone onto electronic banking. With every transaction helping bank profits and every sale providing a data and profit-rich environment for the banks. Or, as it is today, with letting banking executives off the hook for egregious behaviour that should be criminal. 
These hideous, inhuman banking crimes were brought to light during the Senate's Select Committee into Lending to Primary Production Customers in 2018, an inquiry that Senator Pauline Hanson got and that I chaired. Four years later, not one of those victims has been compensated, nor a banker prosecuted. Minister Chalmers is protecting the banks over the best interests of the people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, Senator Bragg for the opportunity to talk about failures of measured policy development uh, and administration uh, in this place, as per the terms of his uh, motion. Because uh, when it comes to failures of policy development and administration, there is, of course, no better example than those opposite starting indeed with the very legislation that is the subject of this motion, uh, the Financial Accountability Regime legislation, um, because this is actually the former government's legislation. Uh, it's legislation that they promised uh, and that they failed to deliver, uh, that they failed to get through their parliament. Uh, this is legislation that is based on reforms recommended by the Hain Royal Commission. Uh, and it's legislation that just sat gathering dust under the previous government uh, since 2019. Uh, legislation that does some incredibly important things for consumers of financial services, uh, including establishing an accountability regime for financial sector companies, uh, establishing a compensation scheme of last resort for victims of financial misconduct, as well as implementing the reforms recommended by uh, the long outstanding 2016 Review of Small, account, uh, small Amount Credit uh, Contracts, the SACS Review, um, a review which said it was urgent to protect vulnerable people from being trapped in unsustainable debt spirals as a result of uh, payday loans uh, and consumer leases that were not operating effectively in this country. Um, this is a series of really important legislative reforms to protect consumers uh, that has been sitting there for years, ignored by the previous government. And those opposite basically had to wait for us to get into government uh, to get the work done, uh, just like they had to wait for us to get the work done on another important Royal Commission, the Aged Care Royal Commission, uh, and its recommendations for more nurses and more care time. Uh, legislated by us, uh, just like they waited for us to implement the findings of the Respect at Work report, just like they waited for us to take real action on climate change and legislate net zero targets. I mean, really, if you want to talk about uh, measured policy development uh, and administration as per the terms of this motion, uh, then look at the Albanese Labor government and what we've delivered in the last six months, doing what the previous government failed to do for almost a decade. They waited for us to introduce a strong and independent national anti-corruption commission, another policy that they promised uh, and yet just failed to deliver. Uh, and let's look at the previous government's record on policy development uh, and consultation. Um, we all remember the appropriate consultation undertaken uh, during the sports rorts scheme, uh, during the commuter car park scheme. Uh, we remember the appropriate consultation for the, better, the Building Better Regions Fund, um, all of which had absolutely nothing to do with measured policy uh, and everything to do with rorting public funds for political gain. So if we want to talk about measured administration, uh, let's talk about a Prime Minister who secretly appointed himself to five ministries uh, without the knowledge of the ministers themselves. How did that contribute to measured policy development and administration under the previous government? And how on earth did a motion on measured policy administration uh, get through the opposition's processes and make its way to the floor of this chamber? Uh, because the list of examples goes on and on and on. The legacy of the previous government uh, is a record of policy failure, of missed opportunities and neglect, confusion and chaos, and not much, what was Senator Bragg's term, not much measured policy development and administration uh, to be seen. 
Uh, and meanwhile, uh, in just six months, um, you know, in my 20 seconds remaining, it's impossible for me to get through what the Albanese Labor government has actually achieved. Um, Aged Care Royal Commission reforms to deliver more nurses and more care time, legislating net zero, delivering 10 days paid family domestic violence leave, setting up Jobs and Skills Australia, repealing the nasty and harmful cashless debit card, making medicines cheaper for millions of Australians, getting wages moving for Australians. These Thank are you, the Senator measured policy Walsh. responses that we are— Your time has expired. Senator Pocock. Deputy President, I rise to speak to the urgent need for the government to relist the finance sector reform bills for debate this week. The reforms in these bills are urgent and overdue. The bills would immediately empower ASIC to go after predatory lenders that are avoiding the law. To give an example, the Indigenous Consumer Assistance Network is reporting that lender Signo is targeting First Nations people and are charging around 900 per cent interest, 900 per cent interest on the loans they issue. This is disgusting and clearly exploitative. We have the means to stop this. If the bill passed this week, we could go after Signo and other predatory lenders and put an end to this sector exploiting the most vulnerable in our community. I urge the government to relist the bills for consideration by the Senate. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Rennick. Deputy President, and, uh, what can I say? This motion today is just money for jam. Uh, and it really just uh, proves what uh, we've been saying for a very long time, and that is the Labor Party is the party for the big end of town. And it's interesting. I I'll slightly disagree with the wording of uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Senator Braggs, where he says, the Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones to appropriately consult um, in regards to this. I'd actually disagree with that because, as it turns out, uh, he got all the consulting he needed. He got a phone call from the former Queensland Labor Premier, Anna Bly, who of course is now the head of the Australian Banking Association. Now, if you, if you want a good example of just how close the big end of town, the banks, are to the Labor Party, look no further than who is the head of the Australian Banking Association, former Queensland Premier Anna Bly. And what was Anna Bly famous for up in Queensland? We call her the Minister for Privatisation. She sold all of Queensland's, all the, all the assets that belong to the Queensland people, the Queensland forestry plantations, which are freehold, for five times earnings. Five times earnings. She sold the Port of Brisbane for six times earnings, a 99-year lease for six times earnings. Gave our assets away to the mates in the big end of town and to her mates in the superannuation funds. Uh, and of course, she's got her payback. She's got her 30 pieces of silver. And of course, who is the master puppet pulling the strings behind uh, former uh, Queensland Premier Anna Bly? Uh, no less a person than the Minister uh, for Agriculture at the moment, uh, current uh, Senator Murray Watt, who is the chief of staff for all this. So we know that the Labor Party is in thick with the big end of town. I mean, we hear Senator Watt talking all the time how he engages with industry groups in agriculture. Well, let me tell you, as a sixth generation farmer, we don't engage with industry groups. We're too busy out in the paddock working to be hanging out with the big end of town, the blowhards. No, 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 no. This is not a party that cares about the workers. Let me tell you that. This is not a party that cares about the workers. And the history of the Labor Party and, and getting into bed with the big banks goes back, you know, there's another great example of how they sold the CBA. And of course, Senator Ayres was talking earlier on about how there's all this, you know, bad behaviour in the big banks. I'll tell you why there was bad behaviour in the big banks, because you privatise CBA without any regula regulation. At the same time, you introduce superannuation, where basically people are being the workers having their money taken from them, given to these financial planners, many of whom you know, started working for the big banks. I mean, remember the 90s? CBA bought Colonial Mutual, National Bank bought National Mutual, Westpac did a joint venture with Bankers Trust, and ANZ uh, uh, did, did a deal with ING. So it's the big banks, again, I mean, you know, I often say that the industry super funds are out there um, uh, good mates with Labor, but it's also the private sector as well that's very good mates with Labor. And of course, as I've always said, and I have to sometimes remind my colleagues on this side of the chamber, that Robert Menzies himself said in the Forgotten People speech that the rich and powerful can look after themselves. 
He made it very clear that we're about people that want to get about every day and put their nose to the grindstone. And of course, the minister for Stephen Jones, he doesn't know whether he's Arthur or Martha because he's thought he was going to get in there and save the world. And he suddenly realised that the lobbyists, the lobbyists, and I spoke about this last week, the Corey Mail reported it, lobbyists should disclose who pays them. It's not just political parties, because I tell you who's pulling the strings in the world. It's not us. I mean, I've often thought about engaging a lobbyist myself to get something done around here. So I can tell you what, as an elected member, I'm not getting much done, as an elected representative of the people. But let me tell you, but no, no, a phone call from Anna Bly and Stephen Jones, the uh, Minister for um, Whitlam, just suddenly pulls uh, the, the fees for the big, big end of town. And that is just so typical of the Labor Party of today. I mean, they tell me that the seismographs are, are going off in Bathurst where Ben Chiefley is rolling in his grave. Rolling in his grave. King O'Malley, rolling in his grave. The great man who actually started the Commonwealth Bank way back then, and it was also part of the Reserve Bank, and they actually had a business bank and they funded this stuff. So I'm, I'm very glad, and, and, and I think the Labor Party need to take a really good look at themselves, because this is not a party that stands up for the working class anymore. They are a party for the big end of town, big end of town, and of course we know that. We aren't surprised because the first thing they did, Stephen Jones did, was remove the disclosure requirements for super funds. I mean, I tell you what, this guy, he's, a, he's the minister for, as the Australian Financial Review called Thank him, the you, minister uh, Rennick, for the dogs. Senator your time has expired. And the time for discussion uh, on this MPI has also expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business, and there are four. Uh, is there anybody who seeks the call on documents? Page four. Okay, if there is nobody who wants to speak about the documents, uh, uh, so just check, is that correct? Yes? Okay. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you. I present a ministerial statement and a government response to two reports of the Joint Standing Committee of North Northern Australia relating to the committee's inquiry into the destruction of the Indigenous heritage sites at Nugan. George. I also present a, a government response to the 492nd report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit relating to the governance in the stewardship of public resources. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the government responses incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. Is there any other ministerial statements? Senator Dunham. I move to take note of the ministerial statement relating to the destruction of Indigenous heritage. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to take note of this ministerial statement. As the member for Cowper, Mr Conaghan, said on my behalf in the other place on Thursday of last week, it's always been the Coalition's view that uh, the events at Dukin Gorge on the 24th of May 2020 represented at least, at the very least, a tragic failure on so many levels in the interactions between Rio and the traditional owners. Those events are so disastrous that they made it very clear that comprehensive work needed to begin as a matter of urgency on modernising Indigenous heritage protection laws in Australia. To each of those ends, the Coalition fully agrees with many of the elements of the ministerial statement. I would also like to reiterate the comments of the member for Cowper about the importance of the work on these issues on the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. That committee's work led to a series of crucial findings and recommendations, and it also led uh, during the years of the coalition government to a range of work guided by our then Environment Minister, Ms Lee, and the then Indigenous Affairs Minister, Mr Wyatt. That work was underpinned by funding in the 2021-22 budget that was specifically devoted to developing an engagement process to identify the best options for reform. As we said throughout that time, we always considered that it was vital that this process be centred on the views and experiences of traditional owners. We're also pleased that Ms Plibersek's statement now clarifies that the government intends to continue in those directions. On that note, I should add that the coalition is uh, comfortable in principle with the government's decision to accept the first seven recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee's 2021 uh, report and to continue to explore the eighth. In saying all of that, though, I think all of us should be uh, concerned about what's come to light in the wake of the statement last Thursday, and specifically I'm referring to the uh, multiple subsequent media reports that traditional owners in the Putu Kunti Kurama and 
Pinikura uh, people uh, say they have not been properly consulted by Minister Plibersek. PKKP Aboriginal Corporation Chairman uh, Birchall Hayes has in fact gone so far to say, as it seems like a media event in Canberra is more important than giving PKKP people the respect of asking us what can be done to try and stop something like the destruction of the Jukin Rock shelters happening again. And that, quote, we would have expected the minister uh, would want to meet with us before making a public announcement about our country and our cultural heritage. The government should take note, especially when Ms Plibersek has made uh, such uh, uh, big things of the work that had been done, supposedly, with the traditional owners. It's hard to see how it can be said on the one hand that you're fully committed to, and I quote, full and genuine partnership with First Nations people, as it's stated in the booklet on page five and also on page eight, I quote, the importance of putting First Nations people at the heart of decision making for issues that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, when it turns out, as it uh, has now been revealed, that uh, there has been no consultation with traditional owners and they're left feeling uh, disrespected and um, understandably very insulted. This is plainly unacceptable. I'll add that there are some other parts of the ministerial statement and the accompanying booklet that do leave the coalition with some concerns. Foremost among those is uh, that there is really very little in the way of firm timelines and KPIs for progress. On page five of the booklet, there is the wording that says, quote, options to reform First Nations cultural heritage protection will merely be provided for consideration in, government, in this term of government. I think Australians deserve and, in fact, have a right to be sceptical um, about exactly what this means, because it sounds like the wheels of government are now turning very slowly on this and that any potential and genuine progress might well be a long way away. More positively, though, I do want to acknowledge that the ministerial statement says that, and I quote, uh, that any reforms here will not be about stopping development or halting progress. Industry and the resources sector in particular plainly need to be uh, consulted closely in the consideration of new laws. Moreover, the government does need to honour the point that uh, the overwhelming majority of companies in modern Australia are very committed to environmental protection and conservation. They need to contribute to this process rather than being excluded from it. We urge the government to make sensible and balanced decisions here that align environmental protection with sensible, measured and sustainable economic development. In the meantime, I want to return to where I began in saying that there is a resounding agreement between the government and the opposition on the overwhelming majority of issues covered by this ministerial statement. I also reiterate the comments of my colleague, the member for Cowper, in paying tribute to the traditional owners of the Duke and Gorge for their ongoing determination to preserve and to honour their beautiful and phenomenal cultural heritage and in thanking all of the many people who have been involved for the past two and a half years in trying to turn an environmental tragedy into much, a much more positive and inspiring future. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Senator Cox. Thank you. I also uh, wish to take note of uh, the ministerial statement and uh, make a short statement. Uh, there's no amount of money that can restore what was destroyed at Jook and Gorge on May 24, 2020. No reparations will heal the anguish, the devastation, the loss inflicted on the PKK people. Uh, traditional owners by the blasting of those rock shoulders. I have familial links and uh, before coming to work in this place I had the pleasure of walking alongside and working with them to discuss ways which they can create opportunities for their elders, their young people. From health care to continuation of law practices, we collectively put our minds to working to improve the economic and social benefits for PKKP people. I'm forever grateful for them for allowing me to share this experience, especially Uncle Birchwell Hayes. The PKKP mob come from an area that is 10,888 square kilometres between Onslow and Tom Price in Western Australia. But you can drive to the top of Mount Nameless, which is in fact its western name, but Jandamar, which is the eastern Gurumar name, meaning the place of the rock wallabies, you can get a wonderful view of the majestic Hammersley Ranges. The lack of legislative oversight at federal and state levels resulted in absolute destruction of tens of thousands of years of cultural heritage. And since that monumental disaster, there's been little progress shown by any government in this country to prevent Jukun 2.0 from reoccurring across this country. And in fact, in the every mining project has a cultural heritage tenor to it. And in particular, in my home state of Western Australia, which is in fact the engine room of mining in this country. Last week, the Environment Minister on behalf of the Australian Government tabled their response to the interim and final reports by the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia into the destruction of Jukun Gorge. 
The committee I served on to deliver this final report and its recommendations alongside an open letter that we wrote to the Premier of Western Australia, in fact about the WA cultural heritage legislation, which I nicknamed the Mining Enabling Legislation, because there's plenty of loopholes in it. Federal, state ministers, the Prime Minister, in fact, and other state premiers need to get out on country and visit some of these sacred places like Jook and Gorge. They need to listen to traditional owners to truly hear, see, feel the importance of these places, to understand the link to our rich biodiversity and our totemic systems, our artefacts, our sacred sites. In fact, they are our museums and cathedrals, our artwork our scientific knowledge, our cosmology, which in fact is about our religion and our spirituality. Consultation cannot be a box-ticking exercise. There has to be genuine, meaningful and collaborative engagement. That is what is required. And internationally, people were shocked and outraged about the actions of Rio Tinto. In fact, it was, a, it was called a national disgrace, a dark day in Australia's history, some of you in this place might recall were some of the headlines that were touted. In fact, my colleague on the committee and fellow West Australian Senator uh, Dodson is quoted to have called this incremental genocide over its, uh, the mining company's behaviour in the lead up to the destruction of the Jook and Gorge caves. It's now time for all Australians to see the destruction of Jook and Gorge by an ignorant mining company as a wake up call, but more importantly, for those who sat in opposition at the time to do what they said they would do. As a newly anointed government, we now see if they are up to the challenge. Australian cultural heritage sites, whether they are significant to First Nations people or other cultures, deserve protection in this country. As the PKKP mob have said, the Jukun disaster is a tragedy, not only for our people, it's a tragedy for the heritage of all Australians and indeed humanity as a whole. Tourists all over the world visit the Stonehenge, pyramids of Egypt, ancient temples across the Asian continent, but it is here in Australia that the oldest, world's oldest surviving culture endures. It is in the dynamic, resources-rich landscapes that First Nations culture and tradition, tradition endures, uninterrupted for tens of thousands of years until one day a billionaire decides to blow it up at the stroke of a pen. The federal and state governments of this country have failed to protect this profoundly important place, the Jukun. With 46,000 years of continuous occupation, the sacred place of tradition and sharing of knowledge. Jukun was blown up just a few days before Reconciliation Week when elders were set to share their cultural teachings with the next generation. Traditional owners are given, through their birthright, the right to speak, protect and care for country. I'd like to offer you an example of an intangible cultural heritage so some of you might actually understand or try to connect with my definition of what that means as a First Nations woman. When I gave birth to my daughters, I took their placentas and I buried them on my mother's country because we are a matriarchal culture. I put them next to the olive tree on the old cottages site of the Unorsha Mission where five generations of my ancestors lived during the time their children were placed in the care of missionaries. My family have practiced this for generations, and my old people, um, this means to them that their cultural heritage will be preserved. And as I teach my children the stories, song lines, the trade routes, and the legacy of this place, the importance of their connection. The two dreaming tracks that are from this place link them to the Nyingan, which is the Echidna Nyunga language, and the Dwert, which is the Dingo. And across the country, and it gives them their responsibilities for protecting their totems. Cultural heritage is more than native title rights, and it is the knowledge that is passed to us through our stories and our oral teachings. And I'm fortunate enough to have two black parents who gave me this knowledge on both sides. And to provide information about place, history, story, dance, and our connection. To the things which are environmental, cultural, spiritual, and familial. This is the way we learn and we teach our generations to have a reciprocal relationship with our buja, which is the name, the Nyungai name for earth. And it comes from the word bujari, which means pregnant. We are born through her spiritual being, which is the mother earth, 
to a place and a time that has been created by our ancestors. Therefore, there is no manual, there is no book we hand over for those decisions about our land in our sea country or transfer a title, and we should retain the power to say no to industry and, in particular, to mining companies. And this is why proponents and governments should not now or ever be able to make decisions about First Nations cultural heritage in this country. I welcome and I agree with the Environment uh, Minister's acknowledgement that state laws are too weak and that Jukun Gorge was not an isolated mistake. This is the, as a result of a failing system, a white colonial system that has failed First Nations people. And it will continue to fail us until something drastically changes. The federal and state governments will continue to fail First Nations people until we have free prior and informed consent, until we are considered equal partners in our negotiations, until we have truth telling about the destruction. And the people in this place must listen to the ways in which we fight every day to keep our culture alive and its links to our heritage. The recommendations of this report require these principles to be respected, and I will keep fighting and hold this government accountable to make sure that they are seen through. Today it's been reported that the PKK people, uh, through their Aboriginal corporation, has reached an agreement with Rio Tinto on a legacy foundation that will deliver the social and economic program, such as education and training opportunities, business development, capacity building, preservation and advocacy of cultural heritage and land. First Nations people finding something enduringly positive in the greatest tra tra tragedy, as we always do, and the mechanisms for our survival. But without meaningful and lasting action, this will not be the last tragedy for First Nations cultural heritage, and we anxiously await the government's latest test at Murujuga to save our songlines, our rock art, from the destruction by another corporate entity who claims to be the friend of First Nations people. I look forward to hearing about this government's approach in relation to legislative reform to ensure there is accountability and transparency. An interim report called Never, uh, Never Again and the final report called A Way Forward must ensure that the destruction of cultural heritage is, in fact, never again and we find a way forward. We need to make sure that the destruction of cultural heritage ensures the stopping of disenfranchisement and dislocation of First Nations people from their country and pivoting out of extractive mining into regenerative and renewable sources is a way of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I uh, rise to speak on the response to the Jukun Gorge inquiry. I, of course, was a member of that committee that uh, did the inquiry. <clears throat> on Thursday, the Minister for the Environment tabled the government's response to the interim and the final reports for the inquiry into the destruction of 46,000-year-old caves at Jugan Gorge in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. The destruction of the rock shelters at Jugan Gorge was a wake-up call to the nation. It was absolutely unnecessary that the parliament thoroughly interrogated how such an atrocity could occur within existing legal frameworks. As a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, we had the important task of finding out what went wrong. We needed to understand how to stop it from happening again, and I want to acknowledge the resilience and the strength of the PKKP throughout this inquiry. Their integrity and capacity to leverage opportunity by participating, even when they had every right to be disengaged, has been commendable. As a committee, we adopted a unique process to ensure cultural safety for witnesses and to show respect for what had been lost. We went on country to hear directly from the people so tragically affected by the needless destruction of culture and the causing of pain to themselves. We held round tables so that hearings were more accessible and less formal and encouraged conversations and knowledge sharing. And as a result, 
All the committee members could see and feel in person the deep impact of lost culture. I commend the work of my fellow committee members, particularly the chairman, Warren Ench, Warren Snowden and Rachel Seawood, for the care and the commitment to this inquiry. The inquiry's interim and final report demonstrated quite clearly that this incident was endemic of a broken cultural heritage system. Rio Tinto's failures were appalling and symptomatic of a don't care about culture approach, but they were also legally entitled to do what they did. This destruction could happen anywhere by any mining or development company and even by governments. There are still existing Section 18s under the Western Australian Heritage Act that are active in Western Australia. And there are sites that are just as much at risk. We currently have a system that doesn't protect First Nations culture, but equally isn't clear for the proponents of development. We have a scheme that allows destruction of heritage that runs very close to destroying evidence of 60,000 years of First Nations history. While it was legal, proponents should not presume that they have a social licence to cause harm within an existing broken system. In public protest and outrage, Australians showed what occurred at Jugend Gorge should not have been legal and was definitely not moral. They must adopt processes of free, prior and informed consent. They must do better. I'm proud the Albanese government has accepted seven of the eight recommendations to reform the Australian cultural heritage system. The future cultural heritage system needs to be strong and it needs to protect that culture for our families and our communities. We have committed to developing standalone cultural heritage legislation in the future. It will be developed in partnership with the First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance. It will holistically adopt reforms to address the existing flaws. In this co-design process, we are working through the final recommendation about ongoing portfolio responsibilities. Federal leadership on this is critical to sustaining the preservation and protection of our ancient cultural heritage. That is why there must be minimum standards in federal legislation for states and territories to live up to. Those minimum standards will be rigorous, rigorously adopted in our future standalone Commonwealth cultural heritage legislation. Because there has to be a flaw, not only aspiration, if we're to protect culture. Many of the cultural heritage protections are currently to the detriment of the free, prior and informed consent of First Nations peoples, where clauses that enable such uh, disregard to exist, such as Section 18 and the Western Australian Heritage Act, then these should be rooted out and replaced with positive provisions. The operations of our future legislation should not be, con <coughs> not be constructed <coughs> in commercial with commercial obligations which force First Nations peoples to negotiate under duress. We found there, are, there were clauses in these negotiations that basically amounted to uh, putting people's rights to express their concerns at risk. We need to ensure that negotiations between First Nations peoples and resource development companies are not conducted so that compensation is simply to offset the cost of operations. The new regimes needs to be set needs to set the expectations for resource developers that they need to win the social licence from traditional owners and the public, not find ways to work around the statutory requirements. First Nation cultural heritage is precious. It is interconnected to who we are as a community. It is the flip side of the commercial bottom line. I am proud that this government will address the long overdue reform. The PKKP's 
strength throughout the inquiry will lead to greater protections for all First Nations cultural heritage across these lands. My hope is that we do justice to the PKKP resilience while, this real reform, while there is real reform to ensure the destruction we saw at Jugan Gorge is never allowed to happen again. This is a way to incrementally devalue, destroy and eradicate the presence of Aboriginal peoples of these lands if we continue to allow this to happen. Thank you, Senator Donza. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of this ministerial statement. Uh, we welcome the government's response to the recommendations made in A Way Forward, the final report of the Jukan Inquiry, accepting seven out of eight of its recommendations and committing to working in real partnership with First Nations people, eye to eye and through free, prior and informed consent in implementing these recommendations. These reforms would see the introduction of national standalone cultural heritage legislation developed with First Nations people and acting as a minimum standard for state and heritage protections. As we know, these are highly inconsistent and often ineffective or even skewed against protecting our heritage. The government's commitment to free, prior and informed consent is great, but we need to see how this actually plays out in reality. Unfortunately, government doesn't have a history of following the principle of free, prior and informed consent, and it often pretends that it does. We hope that this process can be one setting an example of how FPIC can be pursued through government. FPIC is a key principle of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and means the first, that First Nations people receive all relevant information to make a decision well beforehand, have the means to consider it properly and can make a self-determined decision, a decision that is not predetermined by government or anyone else and can be made without being pressured one way or another. The government also commits to reforming native title to address inequalities in negotiating positions that traditional owners face. This is a much overdue reform. Traditional owners need to have the final say on proposals affecting their cultural heritage. That again is the essence of free prior and informed consent, and it includes the right to veto to say no. And put forward in Recommendation 7 of the Jukan Inquiry report, these reforms also need to address the role of prescribed body corporates and native title rep bodies. All too often, these rep bodies do not represent the views of traditional owners, whose interests they should work in and make agreements with mining or proponents on their land going through representative bodies alone is not free, prior and informed consent. These bodies themselves need to comply with the principles of FPIC and their accountability, governance and transparency mechanisms need to be strengthened. Besides committing to seven of the eight recommendations, it is disappointing to see that the government has not, or at least not yet, accepted the first recommendation of the Jukan Inquiry which is that the responsibility for First Nations cultural heritage matters should sit with the Minister for Indigenous Australians instead of the Minister for Environment and the relevant shift of responsible portfolio agencies. I was on the Joint Standing Committee for the Jukan Inquiry, and there is a reason for this recommendation to be the first recommendation of the final report. The government always talks about First Nations justice. Well, at the heart of First Nations justice lies self-determination. We are talking about the heritage of First Nations people, of the oldest cultures in the world. Country and culture are the essence of who we are, and yet here the government does not commit to transfer responsibility for our own cultural heritage to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. It is time for government at all levels to stop clinging on to the old colonial days to stop making decisions for us, to stop controlling us. The government is talking about a voice to parliament, yet failing to take an overdue and necessary step to move responsibility for First Nations heritage 
to the Minister for Indigenous Australians, whose portfolio agencies are much better set up to engage with First Nations communities across the country. I hope that eventually your talks with First Nations Cultural Heritage Alliance will conclude in accepting this recommendation also. I also want to urge you to pursue the reforms you have committed to with urgency. We have no time to waste. Every year, month, week and day we are delaying action which risks the further cultural heritage being destroyed and part of our culture and our stories being lost. Traditional owners across the country are fighting every day to protect their sacred sites. Every day my office gets calls for assistance. The numbers of applications being sought under Section 9 and 10 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act are just giving a small insight into how many challenges traditional owners face to protect country and culture everywhere. The government has given no indication on when these reforms will take place. And this clearly raises concerns that it might not be a priority for the government. We have waited over a whole year since these recommendations were handed down until we even got a response. Despite Labor being involved in developing these recommendations and endorsing them, how long is it going to take to finally see our heritage being protected? In the Greens, Additional comments to the Jukan report, along with a range of further recommendations based on the evidence of the Jukan inquiry, which would further strengthen First Nations cultural heritage outcomes, we ask the government to, to pursue a treaty or treaties with this country's First Nations peoples. While it is incredibly important that we fix the cultural heritage protection framework in this country, we also need to address the underlying factors which have led to the destruction of so much of our heritage and culture our conti and continue to do so every day. We can only do that through treaty. Treaty is the end to the war and leads the pathway to a better future. Treaty acknowledges First Nations sovereignty, protects First Nations rights and sets out the underlying terms for First Nations people to negotiate with the government moving forward. We need to protect First Nations heritage now. We need to follow self-determination now, and we need a treaty now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. The question is that the Senate take note of the statement. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Brown, Minister. Uh, thank you. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the ASEAN meeting on military medicine, the small business skills and training boost, budget process operational rules, Handorf Township improvements and the 2022-23 budget. Are there any committee memberships? The President has received a letter nominating senators to be members of a committee. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Leave granted. Yes. Leave granted. Minister. I move that senators be appointed to the Select Committee on Foreign Interference through social media as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic read. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Respect at Work Bill 2022. The President has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to six laws, details of which will be incorporated into Hansard. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure, National Interest and Other Measures Bill of 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed with, without formalities and be now read as the first time. 
Those in that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to telecommunications and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated is in the leave, Is leave granted? Yes. Leave's granted. In accordance with standing order 115.3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 1st of March of 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill of 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I'll put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. For an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave granted. Senator Cash. You speak in support of the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill 2022. The purpose of this bill is to increase the Commonwealth Penalty Unit amount from $222 to $275. Penalty units are used to describe the amount payable for monetary penalties imposed for criminal offences in Commonwealth legislation and territory ordinances. Commonwealth penalties are generally expressed in terms of penalty units rather than specific values to assist with the adjustment of penalties across Commonwealth legislation. This legislation will adjust the penalty unit to reflect community expectations and continue to remain effective in deterring unlawful behaviour. When the penalty unit was introduced in 1992, the value was set at $100. The value has adjusted four times since it was introduced. It was increased to $110 in 1997, to $170 in 2012, to $180 in 2015, and then to $210 in 2017. In 2015, the former coalition government amended the Crimes Act to introduce an indexation mechanism to automatically increase the value of the penalty unit every three years in line with CPI. An indexation occurred on 1 July 2020, where the penalty unit was increased to $222, where it currently remains today. What the bill before the Senate will actually do is ensure the three yearly indexation cycle continues from 1 July 2023. The Coalition will always support laws that will deter crime and will protect the lives of Australians from the threat of criminals. In the 2022-23 budget, the Coalition Government announced an investment of $170.4 million in the AFP and the Australian Border Force capabilities to harden Australia's border against transnational serious and organised crime, including the establishment of dedicated AFP strike teams to target the importation and manufacture of illicit drugs, firearms and money laundering, boosting the AFP's specialist capabilities to keep pace with the growing threat of outlaw motorcycle gangs, organised crime cartels and other crime groups, and strengthening investment in AFP's Criminal Asset Confiscation Task Force to further disrupt the criminal business and remove the profit out of crime. Ensuring our community and borders were protected was always a priority for the former coalition government. And that's why the AFP's funding increased to a record $1.7 billion. In government, the coalition provided our law enforcement, intelligence and border agencies the powers and resources, it, uh, the resources they needed to take the profit out of crime and harden Australia's supply chain against criminals. From the latest analysis, by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, transnational serious and organised crime costs the Australian economy up to $60.1 billion per year. This is unacceptable. This has a devastating impact for families and communities, causing lost income, health and social impacts, and the erosion of public trust in our government, business and public institutions. 
The AFP-led Operation Ironside publicly exposed the insidious and pervasive impact that transnational serious and organised crime has on the safety and security of Australia. Whilst Operation Ironside was a success, there is more work to do, and this bill continues on that work. And that is why these changes are necessary. And on that note, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill will increase the value of the Commonwealth Penalty Unit from $222 to $275, and that will take effect from 1 January next year. This is the, the, the way in which fines are meant to keep place with inflation without having to amend each and every bill. Acting Deputy President, we do not oppose the bill, but we'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the urgent need to make the fine system and the way in which penalty units are applied far fairer. Fines are the most common sum summary penalty, but it's clear that fines don't have an equal impact as a punishment or, de or deterrent, and it depends on who's receiving them. For a person on job seeker payments, a single penalty unit imposed at $222 or now $275 is crippling. But for the billionaires and multimillionaires in this country, they wouldn't even notice it. Fines need to be in proportion to income to really be fair. A $275 fine means nothing to a banker or a property developer, but to a student, a person on the NDIS, a renter, someone on JobSeeker. That $275 means skipping meals. It means unpaid rent for the week. It means missing a wisdom tooth removal that you've been already waiting for for six months to afford. An action punishable by a fine too often just means it's legal for rich people. Fines enforcement, as it currently occurs, produces deeply unfair and often escalating hardships for vulnerable people, who, not being able to pay a fine, may then go on to lose their driver's licence, then be caught driving without a licence, lose their job and find themselves dragged into the criminal justice system. We commend to the Senate the work by the Law and Justice Foundation, and I want a particular call out for the work of Professor Julia Quilter and those others in that team who have worked on this important issue. An income-based model is already in place in other jurisdictions, including Finland, where the method for calculating fines is based on the amount of spending money a person has for one day, and then it's divided in half. It's based on their income. I pushed the need for this in New South Wales, and thankfully we managed to secure changes that ensured people on government benefits can receive a 50 per cent lesser fine than the fines issues to others. And that's fair, because it has a far bigger impact, even at that lesser amount. That's clearly not an, uh, We were told, however, that income-based fines were impossible to do at a state level, because the states didn't have access to the taxation data necessary to determine income-based fines. Well, that's clearly not an issue at the federal level. And we call on the federal government to take steps to address the clear unfairness of fixed-level fines, regardless of income. The law needs to be just and treat people equally. And equal treatment doesn't mean the same treatment. That's the fundamental flaw in how the Commonwealth uses fines, and it's the flaw that this bill fails to fix. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. The Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit um, hang on. Um, thank you uh, to my colleagues for the contributions on the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill 2022. This bill will increase the value of penalty units to ensure that financial penalties for Commonwealth offences reflect community expectations and continue to remain effective in deterring unlawful behaviour. This bill amends section 4AA of the Crimes Act, which prescribes the value of monetary penalties across the Commonwealth legislation and territory ordinances. The bill will increase the value of penalty units from $222 to $275 with effect from 1 January 2023. It will also update the indexation year to 2023 to ensure that the three-year indexation cycle continues unaffected from 1 July 2023. And I thank people for their contributions. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. It's the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill. Uh, those of that opinion say aye, aye. against no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk, 
The bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated, so I'll ask, does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye, against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I seek leave um, to give notice of a motion I intend to move tomorrow for hours. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is it? Well, no. I've got two separate things. I'm giving. I just want to give notice that tomorrow I will move okay. a motion relating to the hours of sitting right, for the so Senate this week. So you're now on your feet on another, next another question. Is that right? Okay. Well, you've given leave. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Now I um, seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting for this evening for the Senate. Okay. okay. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave's granted. Uh, thank Minister. you very much. Um, I move that the hours of meeting for today be from um, for tonight, and the motion has been circulated in the chamber. Is to extend. From 8 o'clock tonight, government business for the consideration of second reading speeches on the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill, and that the Senate adjourn without debate after the second reading debate has concluded on that bill, and that no divisions may take place after 6.30 p.m. This has been designed to facilitate the, the contributions on that bill, but for senators uh, would not be required. Uh, to be here, although I see your whips about whether or not you're allowed to leave. For some people, um, yeah, <laughs> for some people, but we have done this, and I thank other, um, I thank the opposition, the Greens, um, and the crossbench for their support in facilitating that debate tonight. Okay. Um, so the question before the chair is uh, regarding the hours of meeting and the routine of business variation. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and a related bill. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash. I rise to make a contribution to the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022. The Coalition supports the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Let me be clear. Corruption is wrong. It is corrosive of public trust. It undermines the very public confidence on which all of our institutions depend. The public should know that those who break the law should face the consequences and the standards in public office should be high. The passage of bills to establish this commission will mean that every jurisdiction in Australia will have an anti-corruption commission. In participating in this debate, the coalition has sought to draw on the over 30 years of Australian experience of corruption commissions to make sure that this commission is effective and has appropriate safeguards built in. Anti-corruption commissions have extraordinary powers to deal with corruption, a civil wrong, more powers than the police have in investigating crimes of murder or terrorism. Let me reiterate, the coalition supports the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The government has the balance right on several matters, but there is further work to do. The government has adopted the bipartisan recommendations of the Joint Select Committee, but there are some additional measures that are required. The coalition intends to bring forward amendments to deal with these measures. Our amendments are designed to implement safeguards to ensure that this very important bill gets the balance right. The National Anti-Corruption Commission has a very broad scope. It applies to parliamentarians and their staff and to every Canberra public servant. What many perhaps do not know is that it also applies to our Defence Force, the Australian Federal Police, our diplomats in embassies around the world, and every cook, cleaner, gardener, comcar driver, 
contractor or subcontractor the Commonwealth engages with. It applies to almost every person exercising power under a law of the Commonwealth. Pharmacists, NDIS workers, aged care workers and Indigenous rangers. In fact, it is estimated that probably around one million Australians are brought within reach of this commission. We will be moving amendments to ensure that adequate safeguards are in place to enhance the way the commission operates and to ensure that the rights of individuals are protected. This commission will have extraordinary powers, and with extraordinary powers should come greater accountability. While it's important that serious corruption be identified and dealt with, a terrorism suspect prosecuted in a criminal court has more rights than a person brought before this commission. The words of the South Australian Bar Association are particularly worth noting. Corruption is wrong, but in our zeal to see corrupt public officials dealt with appropriately, we must not discard the protections of the rights and liberties that are central to our legal system. I want to turn to the issue of public versus private hearings, which has consumed so much of the debate in relation to the Commission. The default of private hearings is one important aspect of ensuring that the Commission's focus is where it ought to be. A balance has been struck with section 73.2, which allows for a hearing to be held in public if exceptional circumstances justify holding the hearing or the part of the hearing in public, and it is in the public interest to do so. This balances the important investigative power of the Commission, whilst also protecting the rights of individuals and ensuring that any future prosecutions that may follow from an investigation are not unduly prejudiced. As the Queensland Law Society has said, in our view, in order to preserve prosecutions, in order to maintain that prosecutorial authority with those bodies, as opposed to investigative bodies, and not unfairly damage reputations of people coming before the National Anti-Corruption Commission, it is imperative that the default position be that private hearings are held and obviously with the test of exceptional circumstances being employed. We would like to see that test further strengthened. While the legislation presently lists a number of factors in section 73.3 that the Commissioner, and I quote, in deciding whether to hold a hearing or part of a hearing in public, the Commissioner may have regard to, the word may is insufficient. We believe the Commissioner should be required to have regard to those factors, which include the extent of corruption, the benefits of exposing corrupt conduct to the public and, also importantly, any unfair prejudice to a person's reputation, privacy, safety or wellbeing that would be likely to be caused if the hearing or part of the hearing were to be held in public. The need for section 73.3 to be strengthened in this way was endorsed by various submissions to the Joint Committee, including by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Let me now turn to the definition of corruption. We will move amendments to section 81A to remove the vague and superfluous phrase, or that could adversely affect, consistent with the Law Council submission that such a phrase is unnecessary given the conspiracy given that conspiracy is included in section 810 the phrase or that could adversely affect introduces uncertainty to the definition of corrupt conduct we are also concerned that section 91c does not just define a corruption issue as something that someone has done or is doing but as something that a person will engage in in the future. This would see the Commission investigate possible future conduct that has not actually been carried out. This provision should be removed. A person cannot be investigated and punished for actions they have not taken. 
We'll also move amendments to delete section 91C. Again, this view is consistent with the views of the Queensland Law Society and the Law Council. Another issue in the public debate about the powers of the Commission has been whether it should be retrospectively able to investigate conduct. The basic people is that people should be able to know what, law, what the law is before they act so that they can comply with it. Section 84 gives the legislation completely unbounded retrospective reach. We believe that an additional public interest test is needed if the Commission decides to investigate conduct that occurred before the commencement of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The Law Council suggested including an additional threshold that will allow the National Anti-Corruption Commission to conduct investigations into past conduct only where there is an identifiable public interest in doing so. This would bring the National Anti-Corruption Commission into line with similar provisions under the Victorian IBAC Act. The Prime Minister has said that this legislation is not designed to duplicate existing processes but intend, is intended to instead fill gaps. Under section 45, the Commission has the power to reinvestigate matters which have previously been investigated by another integrity agency. Section 45.3 lists the matters the Commissioner may have regard to when deciding to commence an investigation into a matter previously investigated by a Commonwealth integrity agency. As with the decision to have public hearings, we believe that in exercising this power, the Commission and a Deputy Commissioner should be required to jointly sign off on decisions to reinvestigate matters that have already been considered by another integrity body. I now turn to the application of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act to this bill. The bill has limited uh, the application of the ADJR Act to a small number of matters. We believe that judicial review under the ADJR Act should be available to all decisions under this bill and we will move amendments to this effect. This is consistent, again, with the recommendations made by the Law Council. We believe that judicial review under the ADJR Act, as I said, should be available to all decisions under this bill. The application of the gag orders for people under investigation by the Commission can present a real threat to a person's mental health. Not being able to talk to a mental health professional or to a family member can mean that, at a very stressful time, the usual supports that a person may rely on are not available. As the Australian Psychological Society told the committee, individuals involved in Corruption Commission inquiries are likely to be appearing in a professional capacity. For many people, their professional persona is core to their self-identity and any damage or threat to it is therefore amplified. Gag orders therefore need to be balanced to ensure that people can access appropriate support. I now come to the important issue of privilege or privileges. Rule of law principles exist for an important reason. They ensure robust systems of justice are balanced with concern for individual rights. The bill abrogates a number of privileges that would exist in a criminal process, like the privilege against self-incrimination and legal professional privilege. Because the rights of a person under investigation are waived, it is very important that material that is elicited by the Corruption Commission in a scenario under which a person doesn't have the rights that would, they would usually have in a criminal process must then not be used either directly or derivatively in a criminal process. A body with the extraordinary powers of this commission must itself be held to account. At present, the inspector's powers are insufficient. As the bill stands, the inspector is due to be the National Anti-Corruption Commission of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. We believe 
the inspector's role should be broader, and we will move amendments to strengthen the role of the inspector. We also believe that there should be time limits on investigations so that the Commission is required to conclude investigations within a definite period. I note that one of the foremost advocates for the National Anti-Corruption Commission, Geoffrey Watson SC, has argued for time limits on investigations. Time limits could be extended by application to a court, but we need to see investigations not remaining open indefinitely, and our amendments will seek to do this. Finally, in relation to amendments, we believe the appointments of the Commissioner Inspector must be completely above politics, completely above politics. And to that end, the appointment of these roles should be subject to a supermajority of nine out of the 12 members of the Joint Standing Committee. It must be above politics. This ensures that those who fulfil these significant roles have bipartisan support. And we will be moving amendments to this effect. In conclusion, whilst we believe there are numerous measures that would strengthen this body and provide safeguards for individuals, I want to reiterate the coalition's support for the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The support for this body across the parliament is clear, and it is a clear message to the Australian people that corruption is wrong and that the parliament is dealing with corruption seriously. Thank you. Senator Shubridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Finally, finally, we are going to get a National Anti-Corruption Commission. After years of delay and broken promises, in parliament after parliament, we are now going to get, in just a matter of a few days, a National Anti-Corruption Commission to fill the corruption gap, the gap in oversight and corruption that's been there staring everybody in the face at a federal level. The Northern Territory's got one. Uh, Victoria's got one. New South Wales has had one for decades, and haven't they needed it? And finally, we're going to have that, that torch of that torch of anti-corruption, that, that powerful independent uh, knack focusing on the workings of this place, the workings of the federal government and all of those corporates and others who seek to corrupt uh, this institution and federal politics. Uh, Acting Deputy President, the Greens made a commitment, an election commitment, to the people of Australia and those millions of people who voted for the Greens that we would do everything in our power to pass a National Anti-Corruption Commission bill and to make it the most powerful and independent version that we could. And we have been delivering on that. And, and I, I'm proud to be part of a record 12 Green senators in this place um, who have given the support necessary to, to deliver a powerful National Anti-Corruption Commission. Because if it was left just to the major parties, to bounce between themselves and cut the deals, there is no way we would be getting the corruption commission that we got now. And, and I want to pay tribute to my colleague Senator Waters for having done so much heavy lifting in this space and actually having passed, I would say, a stronger anti-corruption uh, commission bill in a previous parliament and navigated that through the Senate only for it to run, run, run aground on the rocky shores of a, a Morrison Dutton coalition dominated chamber downstairs. Well, well, thank goodness we've got rid of those rocky shoals um, with the last election. And, and I want to pay tribute as well to the member for Indi, um, Helen Haynes, Dr. Haynes, and the work she's done. Uh, and, and, and as well, the civil society groups who have for years been working with politicians, Greens and others, to try and get this parliament to pass not just any anti-corruption uh, bill, but the best possible one. And I, I, there are too many to mention, but I note particularly the Centre for Public Integrity, uh, the Human Rights Law Centre, uh, Transparency International, and so many others. Um, Acting Deputy President, 
while we are getting a powerful bill, there is a glaring gap in it, and that glaring gap is about public hearings. The, Labor, the now Labor government went to the election with a promise on NAC. And they had the seven elements and they had shiny brochures and they handed them out and they said, if you vote for them, this is the kind of NAC you'll get. And tragically, they have, betray they have betrayed with this bill one of those key elements because they said in black and white that they supported a national anti-corruption commission where the test for having a public hearing would be what is the public interest. And there it is, laid out in their brochures in black and white. That's what the test would be. And yet, what do we see with this bill? We see a test negotiated with we don't know who that puts in place a need for the Commission to find exceptional circumstances before a public hearing can be held. Public hearings bring other witnesses out. They hold anti-corruption commissions to account and they provide a necessary cautionary example to other politicians or other bureaucrats or other entities trying to corrupt the Commonwealth government. And we know that they have worked extremely well at a state level, and we know from the evidence we got at the inquiry that those state-based anti-corruption commissions that have a test for public hearings based solely on public interest and don't have exceptional circumstances, we know that they, they, that they think that that's extremely valuable. We also know that those anti-corruption commissions that have an exceptional circumstances test want to get rid of it as quickly as they can. So in the inquiry, we heard, for example, from the current commissioner, New South Wales um, ICAC commissioner. Um, and what did he say? He said, the other issue that's been raised is public hearings versus private hearings. I'm a strong supporter of public hearings. I believe that they're important because they make the organisation accountable and they provide an opportunity for other people to come forward. We've had investigations which have commenced in public, and as a result of that information, other people have come forward, and we've been able to go into other areas which have raised significant issues of corruption. It also, I think, ensures transparency and accountability for the agency and justifies the purpose if the case ultimately is made for change. That's three decades of experience in the New South Wales ICAC there. And I can think of multiple inquiries, one, for example, into corruption in a very major council, Canterbury Bankstown Council in, in Sydney, where the holding of public hearings, the exposure of what some of those corrupt council officials and councillors were doing, brought out additional witnesses who saw people lying in public hearing and then came and gave their version to the ICAC and ultimately were essential for changing and exposing the corruption in those councils and producing the most powerful report and the recommendations needed to clean up corruption. It was public hearings that produced that. Um, when it comes to the, new, the Victorian Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission, they suffer under an act which requires them to find exceptional circumstances before they can hold a public hearing. And that's already tied them up in legal challenges and it's also limited the ability of, of that, the IBAC, to do its job. We, we, just had a, we just had a state election in Victoria in circumstances where there have been multiple secret inquiries being undertaken by ICAC involving the current government in Victoria, and most voters in Victoria didn't know. They didn't know what the content is. They don't know what their government had been accused of and they went and voted without the information to hand. Compare that to New South Wales, where the public hearings have led to a contest of ideas. And people know what the former Premier and other senior members have been up to in New South Wales. And they'll be exercising their rights at the ballot box far more informed in New South Wales than voters were in Victoria. And what did the Victorian IBAC say? They said this. A crucial way in which any anti-corruption agency exposes its corrupt conduct is through the public examination of witnesses. Examining witnesses in public can make investigations more transparent and can increase public awareness of and confidence in the integrity system. The nature of serious or systemic corruption is that many people may have knowledge of isolated pieces of information that may be relevant to a particular investigation. By holding a public examination, 
awareness and understanding of the matter under investigation is raised, and witnesses can be prompted to come forward with relevant information that they had not previously understood the potential significance of. The bill currently only permits public hearings if the commissioner is satisfied that exceptional circumstances justify the holding of the hearing in public and that it's in the public interest to do so. And they go on to say, the IBAC does not consider that the existence of exceptional circumstances ought to be a decisive factor in determining whether a public hearing should, be, should proceed. So we have the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, and I, I quoted from the current commissioner, but the former commissioner as well gave the same evidence. So the New South Wales ICAC don't have the exceptional circumstances test, and they've told everyone in this chamber, don't, don't put it in, because it'll cripple the ability of the NAC to work. And then on the flip side, we have the Victorian IBAC, where they do have the exceptional circumstances test, and they've laboured under it for years, and they say, don't repeat the Victorian mistake. Don't put in place exceptional circumstances. But it seems that there's a collective will amongst the major parties to have such a high threshold for public hearings that basically politicians will continue to be a protected class at, fe at a federal level. What's so special about federal politicians that they should be shielded from public scrutiny and have to answer in public for allegations of corruption? What's so special? Well, the only thing special about the Commonwealth level is there's more money and there's more funds and there's more opportunity to corrupt. And of course it should be subject to the same level, at least, of scrutiny as we have in New South Wales. Sunlight is a great disinfection. It is a great disinfectant. And this bill does not provide sufficient sunlight. We will be moving amendments to seek to protect that, to, to correct that error um, in, in, the committee for, in the committee phrase. And can I finish by this on that point? We've had multiple concerns raised in the committee, and I'm sure many members have had concerns raised about when anti-corruption commissions have gone off the rails and, and been unfair, unfair to witnesses, produced unfair results. Almost uniformly, those concerns have come about from private hearings, private hearings that have gone for months or years where witnesses have been gagged and can't speak in public, where, where they've been unable to tell their spouse or key people in their life what's been happening to them, because it's all been happening in secrecy. And it's in secrecy where anti-corruption commissions can, 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 can veer into substantial and real unfairness against witnesses, cannot be providing the kind of natural justice that you would expect. And one of the best cures for that is to have the hearings in public where the Corruption Commission needs to justify its work, needs to justify its processes to the, to, 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 to the broader public. We recognise that there have been some improvements made to the bill in the other place. There have been greater protections for journalists, but there's more still to be done in that regard. We recognise also um, that there have been some minor improvements in other aspects of the bill, but we went backwards in one key regard in the amendments that happened down, downstairs. And that was narrowing the defin definition of corruption, to remove a generalised jurisdiction for tracking down corruption before, within the NAC. We don't understand the rationale for that. And we simply ask this, and we'll ask it in committee when we try and reinstate that. Exactly what corruption is it that the Labor Party and the Coalition don't want the NAC to look at? If there's corruption, however defined, well then the NAC needs to have the ability to investigate it. In terms of other unfinished business, one of the aspects that we have concerned about is the Oversight Committee. From the day this legislation was tabled, the government was on notice that a government-controlled Oversight Committee does not have the independence required to do its job properly. The best solution to that is for the government to adopt the Greens Amendment, which requires a non-government chair of the committee, and therefore ensuring that the government doesn't have complete control and the opposition doesn't have a veto on key questions like the appointment of a commissioner. And I've got to be clear, if we don't get the numbers to support that very rational Greens amendment supported by a, a, across the sector, integrity experts from across, uh, across the country, then we're going to be looking very genuinely to any other amendment that seeks to remove an ex complete executive control from that committee. 
And, and one of those would be to have a supermajority um, when the committee votes to appoint commissioners in order to remove the government's complete control. Because we're not just making a knack for the current government. We're protecting it against a more noxious government in the future that may want to impose the worst of commissioners on the NAC. And of course it shouldn't just be at the whim of the government of the day in a committee completely controlled by the government of the day. We know as well that more work is needed to be done on oversight. The current inspector is basically a mini NAC of NAC, looking for serious or systemic corruption in NAC. And we hope that there will be none of that work to do, or at best a tiny amount of work to do. At state and territory levels, the inspectors have a far broader role basically to be a permanent ombudsman oversighting um, the, the NAC, and we will be moving amendments to implement that, based largely on the excellent recommendations of Bruce McClintock SC, the current inspector of the New South Wales and Northern Territory NAC. We will also be looking to improve the protections for journalists, to ensure that where warrants are being sought against journalists, those warrants are contestable. We know that works in the UK. It can work as well here. Finally, I'll say this, Acting Deputy President. As, as Greens, we are focused on the outcome. We want the best, the most, independent, the most independent and the most transparent NAC that we can achieve. And we will work across this parliament. We will work across this parliament to get the numbers to achieve that. I think we've got a lot of work to do in committee. We've got a lot of work to do in committee, but I can say this clearly. In just a few short days, we will finally have a national anti-corruption commission, and it's well past time. Thank you, Senator Payman. I think I have on the list. Oh, Senator Waters. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, sometimes patience pays off in politics. It's been three years since my private member's bill for a strong, independent anti-corruption watchdog, with the ability to hold public hearings past this chamber. And it's been 14 years since the Greens first moved for there to be a federal corruption body. So uh, here we are this week. We will finally see the passage of legislation to set up a federal corruption watchdog. And boy, has it been a long time coming. The Commonwealth has been the only jurisdiction that has not had such a body. All of the states and territories now have their version of a corruption watchdog, and it's not like the Commonwealth has been free of corruption. So this is a very uh, happy and long coming day. There are few things that the Australian community is more unified on than the need for a strong, an independent, a transparent and an effective corruption watchdog. Public confidence in the integrity of Australian politicians has plummeted in recent years, and it's no mystery why. Scandal after scandal with no consequence, watching donor mates feather their nests while so many ordinary Australians struggle to make ends meet, former government ministers almost immediately popping up to spruik mining companies or banks or gambling interests after they leave parliament. When Transparency International gave Australia its lowest score ever on the Corruption Perception Index last year, it was clear that lack of progress on an integrity commission was a key factor in that terrible ranking. At the election, people voted clearly and en masse for more transparency, for more integrity, for better representation. People want an independent and a powerful watchdog that can root out corruption that runs so rife in this place and continues to undermine our democracy. And they want that work to be done with transparency and without politicisation. Australians need to have confidence that there will be consequences when corrupt conduct is identified and that there won't be a protection racket for politicians. As my colleague Senator Shoebridge has outlined, the Greens have been pushing to get a federal corruption watchdog for 14 years now, and as I mentioned, my bill passed uh, this chamber more than three years ago. Um, now, for 10 years, we were in the wilderness uh, advocating for this idea. It was described, if my memory serves me correctly, as a niche issue 
by then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. It was laughed at by both of the big parties. And then, ten years after we first suggested it, it was first Labor that finally agreed, no, this is something that does need to happen. And then it took another year for the Liberal National Party to change, uh, do a 180 and say, all right, we agree that we need a federal corruption watchdog. We're happy when people get there in the end. It's a shame it had to took so long. But however, we then saw three years of obfuscation and inaction from the then Morrison government. We saw three rounds of public consultation on a draft consultation paper that miraculously didn't change from consultation to consultation. It was tokenistic consultation. Uh, it was the absolute definition of that, because actually they weren't listening to what people were saying when they were consulted on the bill. Um, so that was a, a somewhat amusing uh, walk throughout history that was desperately frustrating to all involved at the time. Um, but in that 14-year history journey, I want to pay an enormous uh, gratitude and tribute to former uh, Greens, Senator Bob Brown and Senator Lee Rhiannon, who drove this issue uh, before I took over the portfolio in 2015. Um, and of course, I want to acknowledge both current and former um, independent uh, MPs, Cathy McGowan, who um, also had an excellent draft bill, and now Helen Haynes, who have collectively got us to where we are today. Now, the previous government fought tooth and nail against an effective corruption watchdog, and I wonder if that's because they knew half their cabinet would have been implicated by it. Now, I've done multiple speeches in this chamber um, where I ran out of time every time to list all of the scandals, all of the integrity uh, fracas, all of the embarrassment that so typified the previous government. And so it's no wonder that the, uh, the government at the time deprioritised this. It was delayed. It was finally presented in a form that made it clear that the governments continued to not listen to the expert contributions um, and that anyone with an interest in this had been saying for years. But what those experts had been crystal clear on were the key features of a strong, independent anti-corruption commission. And they are a broad definition of corrupt conduct a broad scope that captures parliamentarians and their staff and statutory office holders and employees of government entities and contractors, strong investigative powers, the ability to act on referrals, to act on public complaints, including anonymous tip-offs, and at the Commission's own initiative, reasonable thresholds for commencing an investigation, the power to hold public hearings the power to make findings of fact and findings of corrupt conduct, the power to report publicly, oversight by an inspector and a cross-parliamentary committee, and retrospective application. They were the key features that the experts said a corruption watchdog needed to have in order to be an effective watchdog and not one that was toothless or asleep in the kennel. Now, in opposition, the Labor government acknowledged those features, so we were hopeful when the Albanese government made integrity a key election commitment. And there is no doubt that this bill is a huge leap forward with many of those necessary features. It builds on the good work done by Greens in, in, and independents over many years. But we remain incredulous and deeply disappointed that Labor has walked back its previous commitment to public hearings, making them the exception rather than the rule. When it comes to integrity, the experience in all other jurisdictions has been that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Public hearings build public confidence in the outcomes. They act as a clear deterrent to those who think they can get away with corrupt conduct, and they provide a forum that can tease out new angles, new witnesses, new evidence that might not have come to light without public attention. The vast majority of work done by integrity commissions is done in evidence gathering and analysis, and with a clear view to balancing the public interest in transparency against the risk of uh, disclosing compromising uh, things to do with an investigation and balancing that risk of undue reputational damage. Public hearings happen only after a significant body of work has been done to satisfy the commission that there is a case to answer. Commissioners are well placed to make the assessment about what is in the public interest, but the presumption should be one of transparency. We'll be moving amendments, as my colleague Senator Shoebridge has mentioned, to give the government another chance to get this right and to provide for public hearings. 
Now, it's, an, you know, it's a worst kept secret in this place that the deal was done with the LNP on this matter in order to secure um, their support for this, because there's some belief that somehow um, this will make it a more longer lasting body. Well, how can you create this otherwise fantastic body that's got so much work to do and then nobble it from having public hearings? It's just unfathomable. So I urge the government to support the amendments that we will move um, to, to ensure that public hearings uh, can be had without a fetter on the discretion of the commissioners to make that decision. Um, we also need to make sure that the resources that the NAC needs to do its job um, are determined by an independent body. Leaving funding decisions to government risks the body being starved by a government who would benefit from an anti-corruption commission that's totally broke and has no teeth. An anti-corruption commission that cannot do its job is in many ways worse than none at all. The cross-parliamentary committee established under this bill is welcome, but it's not sufficiently independent of the executive. It can make budget recommendations, but funding decisions ultimately rest with government. Another key feature that is missing from this bill is clear protection for whistleblowers. My bill for a National Integrity Commission included a dedicated whistleblower protection commissioner recognising that those who expose corruption and mal maladministration can face and often do face considerable personal risks. The Attorney-General has committed to acting on the Moss Review and strengthening the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which we welcome, but it is a missed opportunity to not establish a whistleblower, whistleblower commissioner as part of NAC to ensure appropriate support, advice, representation and protection for people disclosing misconduct. Finally, I want to talk about cleaning up politics. Of course, we need a federal anti-corruption watchdog, and we will be supporting this bill. But a federal NAC is not enough. The NAC won't stop pork barrelling or breaking the stranglehold of corporate influence on politics. It won't stop the revolving door between industry and political parties. It won't be enough on its own to give the community confidence that politicians are acting in the public interest, not their own interests. We need a comprehensive plan to clean up politics from the start, not just to deter corruption at the very end. We need to get the influence of big money out of politics. Last week I reintroduced my bill to ban donations from dirty industries and to cap all other political donations to $1,000 per year. We also need to lower the donation disclosure thresholds and make, donations in, make, make them public in real time so people can see who is seeking to influence decisions. We also need election spending caps so elections aren't bought by those with the deepest pockets. We desperately need to lift parliamentary standards with a strong code of conduct for all MPs and senior staff, which we're making some progress on, and we need to strengthen the lobbying code. We need to publish ministers' diaries. And we need to make sure that freedom of information laws actually disclose information affordably and meaningfully. We need to stop the revolving doors and the golden escalators by extending the cooling off period for former ministers taking on cushy roles in industries they used to allegedly regulate for five years, not the unenforced 12 to 18 months that it currently is. And we desperately need a more diverse parliament that represents our community. We also need to remove barriers to public servants and dual citizens running for election. We need increased public engagement in parliamentary debate, and we need strong support for protest and public advocacy. Everyone benefits from honesty, transparency and accountability in politics, everyone except dodgy politicians. The community deserves a genuinely representative parliament with integrity, one that acts in the public interest, not just the interests of politicians, big corporations and the super-rich. I welcome this bill as a huge step towards that goal, and I look forward to working with the government on getting the rest of the way there. And uh, whilst I began the speech by saying that patience pays off, I am running out of patience for reform on those other elements. Thank you. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As a young person, I appreciate that learning about life and its challenges is tough enough, let alone having to question the integrity of the people you're supposed to trust the people who are meant to think of the collective good and the people who create legislations that will benefit everyone in our society. When I hit the 2022 campaign trail in Western Australia, both door knocking and phone banking, I heard from young people firsthand from all walks of life who were put off by politics and the voting process altogether. 
I heard them say things like, government can't be trusted, they're all crooks, good for nothing, self-interested and corrupt, they don't listen and do nothing. All they heard on the news in the, in the past nine years were countless number of rorts, cases of misconduct and corruption, and a lack of transparency when the previous Prime Minister secretly appointed himself to five ministries. So you can imagine how disappointed and in despair young people felt. The same young people who one day will be the pioneers and leaders of our tomorrow. The same young people who are full of ideas that could potentially hold the key to the issues we currently face. Labor listened and committed. Before the election, Labor promised we would be a government that Australians can be proud of, both nationally and globally. A government committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, unlike those who came before us. Our priority since being elected has been to legislate a powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission by the end of the year. This is an essential step to fulfil our promise to the Australian people. The Albanese government's National Anti-Corruption Commission will be built on the following six design principles. The commission will have a broad jurisdiction to investigate serious or corrupt or systemic corrupt conduct across the Commonwealth public sector by ministers, parliamentarians and their staff, statutory uh, office holders, employees of all government entities and government contractors. The Commission will operate independent of government with discretion to commence inquiries into serious or systemic corruption on its own initiative or in response to referrals, including from whistleblowers and the pu public oversight. The Commission will be overseen by a statutory parliamentary joint committee empowered to require the Commission to provide information about its work. The Commission will have power to investigate allegations to um, investigate allegations of serious or systemic corruption that occurred before or after its establishment. The Commission will have power to hold public hearings in its exceptional circumstances and where it is in the public interest to do so. The Commission will be empowered to make findings of fact, including findings of corrupt conduct, and refer findings that could constitute criminal conduct to the Australian Federal Police or the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. And finally, the Commission will operate with procedural fairness and its findings will be subject to judicial review. Now, this legislation also provides strong protections for whistleblowers and exemptions for journalists to protect the identity of their sources. This is the level of accountability the Australian people expect, what they voted for and what they deserve. And for so long, Australians have felt their trust in the conduct and discourse of the federal government crumble and they remain scarred. But I stand here today proud to be a Labor senator, a part of the Albanese government, committed to healing and restoring the public's faith in our political system. I remind the Senate of the wise words of William H. Hastie, which are displayed on the wall of the old Parliament House. He eloquently said, and I quote, Democracy is a process, not a static condition. It is becoming rather than being. It can be easily lost, but is never finally won." End quote. To uphold our duty to the true essence of democracy, we first need to ensure integrity and transparency is established so that people feel confident in the legitimacy and accountability of the government and its intentions of serving the best interests of all Australians. I thank Senator Waters and all my other colleagues here in the Senate for their advocacy and efforts in striving to see the establishment of this National Anti-Corruption Commission. Thank you. Senator Henderson. As the opposition has always made clear, we support a corruption commission consistent with our strong stand against stamping out a strong stand against corruption. People who break the law should face the law. And it was, of course, the coalition which uh, first introduced Australia's uh, first ICAC in New South Wales back in 1988. 
While we support the establishment of a national anti-corruption commission, as we've heard in this debate, it is absolutely critical to get it right. The bill, after all, does confer extraordinary powers on the commission and also applies to a very broad range of Australians, not just, not just parliamentarians and public servants here in Canberra, but a wide range of people working for the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Federal Police, uh, agencies such as the National Disability Insurance Agency and um, aged care workers, as well as any contractor or subcontractor or any person exercising a power under a law of the Commonwealth. However, as we've also heard in this debate, conveniently, somehow, it doesn't apply to union officials exercising a power under a law of the Commonwealth, and I'll return to that point in a moment. So, with such a broad application um, and all the powers of a royal commission, it's critical that we get this bill right. Um, the bill isn't perfect, and I have to say there's been a lot of very good work in this parliament addressing a, a range of shortfalls, uh, including by the Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation, uh, which made six consensus recommendations. There have been uh, many other additional comments from coalition members and senators, um, coalition members of that particular committee, as well as coalition members and senators across the board, seeking to ensure that the bill gets the balance right between stamping out corruption and protecting the rights of everyday people brought before it. Extensive recommendations from the Senate Committee on the scrutiny of bills highlighting the concerns around a, a lack of um, specific um, identification of um, de things like definitions um, and the use of coercive powers without adequate safeguards. Uh, there have all been issues that have been raised through the committee process, uh, as well, of course, as for the recommendations from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, which noted concerns about the use of gag orders and their, the harm that those gag orders can cause, particularly to the mental health of people brought before the Commission, uh, as well as the broad use of contempt offences. Uh, the Coalition has gone about engaging uh, with the government, with the crossbench um, and through the committee process in this parliament uh, with good faith. Uh, that said, of course, uh, there are a number of amendments that the Coalition is proposing. The first one is uh, that we'll introduce some amendments concerning not allowing union members to receive an exemption under the bill. So, As we've heard in this debate, a disinfectant is the best form of sunlight, and if we are going, if the government is going to talk a big game on integrity, uh, that goes out the window when unions are exempted from the operation of the Commission. My office is in Geelong, where the NDIS has its national headquarters. Uh, just imagine the unfairness, uh, the lack of integrity in passing legislation which, hauls, which gives the Commission the power to call any NDIS worker with the agency, uh, but not a union official exercising a Commonwealth powers, uh, those, that category of persons is let off scot-free. So if it's good enough for NDIS contractors, if it's good enough for the aged care workers and for members of our defence force, it should be good enough for union officials. Uh, we just cannot have a bill passed which does a special deal for unions. The Coalition is proposing a number of other amendments, including um, introducing amendments that will be introducing amendments supported by eminent experts in this field, including the Law Council of Australia, 
uh, the Queensland Council of Civil Liberties and the South Australian Bar Association uh, that the power to decide a public hearing not be vested in the Commissioner alone. Uh, we think it's really important that there are all the appropriate safeguards in this bill, including on this issue. It's critical that it's not just the Commissioner who decides to commence a public hearing. Uh, we are concerned that that vests far too much power in one single person. Uh, this power needs to be shared between the Commissioner and a Deputy Commissioner to ensure, again, greater integrity, transparency and a proper governance. Uh, we also think it should be compulsory, not optional, for, for the Commissioner to consider factors including whether confidential information is involved, whether there would be unfair prejudice to a person's reputation or whether a person giving evidence has a particular vulnerability such as being under direct instruction or control of another person in determining whether a public hearing should be held. Uh, this was supported by the Queensland Law Society, the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Australia Institute. Again, we want to see these changes in the bill to make sure that we have every possible safeguard. Uh, the Commission should also be required to only commence an inquiry into matters which took place prior to the establishment of the Commission uh, if it is in the public interest for them to do so. So there must be a strong public interest test uh, when determining whether a retrospective inquiry will be held. All decisions of the Commission should be subject to review under the ADJR Act. A significant Significant aspects of the bill are not subject to this review, and this was a very strong recommendation made by the Law Council of Australia, uh, and of course um, that is one that we strongly support. The Commission has the power to impose non-disclosure non orders or gag orders on people, which prevent them from disclosing that they have appeared before the Commission. Um, this is a very um, contentious issue. Of course, we think it's essential that there be very limited exceptions to this in the interest of the mental health of the people who come before the Commission. Uh, people um, should be able to make a disclosure uh, to an immediate family member, as long as they're not also a person of interest, a medical professional uh, and a mental health professional. Uh, it's critical that we do not put people in this situation where they feel they have nowhere to turn. Uh, there was a, a shocking case in Victoria. A friend of mine uh, who appeared before IBAC and tragically she committed suicide. Um, no findings were made against her. Uh, we don't know all the inner details of what led to her death other than uh, we do know that she was absolutely traumatised by what she was going through. Uh, and so when people are put under this extreme pressure, it is absolutely critical they have the supports that they need um, to get through what can be obviously a very uh, difficult and traumatic set of circumstances. And I do say that there have been from all reports, a number of people who have committed suicide, who have been before various anti-corruption commissions as a result of the trauma and of the, the grief uh, of what they have confronted. Uh, we're also, as, a, as a, an opposition, concerned about um, the privilege against self-incrimination and legal professional privilege. Uh, we are proposing to introduce amendments which ensure that this uh, these privileges are only granted when absolutely necessary because, again, this imposes very significant imposts on fundamental rights, uh, another amendment supported by the Law Council. Uh, Geoffrey Watson SC, as we've heard in this debate, um, supports an amendment that investigations not go on indefinitely. Uh, our amendment will propose a 12-month time limit on investigations. Uh, time limits are also critical to, to justice. Uh, people cannot come before these anti-corruption commissions indefinitely, put their lives on hold year in, year out, without any sense of certainty 
uh, as to the length of an investigation. Uh, we also think it's absolutely critical that there is bipartisanship in the creation of a new body like the National Anti-Corruption Commission. That's why it's important, very important, that there is a three-quarter majority of the parliamentary committee uh, overseeing the commission uh, in relation to the appointments of the commissioner and the inspector. Without the support of all sides of government, the commission risks losing the trusts of the public. Um, we don't want to face any sort of risk that any appointment like this, as important as, the, as these appointments are, could be politicised in any way. I emphasise this is a very strong integrity measure. This bill must stand the test of time, not just in relation to this government, but future governments. And like excluding the unions, this bill cannot be clouded by questions of integrity, and that's why this amendment must be supported also. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak about the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022. Um, this bill is a long time coming, a very, very long time. The Greens wholeheartedly welcome the establishment of a Federal Anti-Corruption Commission something that we have been calling for, campaigning for, and advocating for loudly and consistently for decades. Of course, we would prefer for it to fully meet community expectations of having public hearings and stronger protections for journalists. And I know that the Greens will be moving amendments to try and ensure that we do get the best possible anti-corruption commission this week. Corruption has sadly become part and parcel of Australian politics. Um, and no wonder Australia recorded its worst ever score on the Corruption Perceptions Index behind New Zealand, Singapore and Hong Kong in the Asia Pacific. One of the reasons that my husband and I left Pakistan was the pol political corruption that had set in over there. By the time I reached my 20s, corruption was taking hold in Pakistan. It was deep-seated and it was widespread. It became entrenched in politics, bureaucracy and institutions. And my elders, I often remember my elders reminiscing about the good old days of statesmen like politicians who dedicated their lives to the good of people and country. There was also this notion that trickled down to me that while politics in Pakistan had become corrupt, Things were very different in Western democracies. Politicians there were public servants with honesty and integrity, I was told. I had high hopes for Australian politicians and of the political system itself. Soon after I joined politics in Australia, my belief in corruption-free, selfless politician did come crashing down. And I've seen the worst of it in New South Wales politics. In my first year in the New South Wales Parliament, a staggering 10 state Liberal MPs resigned from the party or from their positions under the shadow of corruption. And I really was shattered by these revelations, especially since I was hoping for things to be quite different in Australia. But the reality is that power corrupts no matter where you are. And that's why we need strong systems to hold power to account. New South Wales politics is notorious for its corruption scandals and dirty deals, many of which have only seen the light of day and perpetrators held to account because of the existence of a strong independent commission against corruption in New South Wales and because of brave whistleblowers, investigators and journalists who act in the public interest. But corruption is not confined within the borders of New South Wales. The longer I spend in politics, the more I see the omnipresence of corruption. Even worse, it is often denied, covered up, and defended. Some of the outright corruption is, of course, largely legal. The very concept of political donations is about buying influence and purchasing favor. Political donations are dangerous because they distort political decision-making, favoring vested interests above good policy. This ultimately results in the abuse of power and of taxpayers' money. Political donations and the wider capture 
of both parties by fossil fuel interests is perhaps the most egregious example in recent years. The fossil fuel industry is a substantial donor to both the major parties through direct contributions and through industry associations. An ACF analysis of the 2020-2021 donations receipts, a non-federal election year, revealed the coalition received $1.3 million and the ALP received nearly $800,000 from fossil fuel companies, both significantly higher sums than the previous year. Donations from the fossil fuel lobby and the coalition so beholden to them that embarrassingly, Australia was ranked dead last out of 193 countries for lack of action on climate last year. And while Labour is definitely better than the coalition on climate, their refusal to put an end to coal and gas, effectively a refusal to stop pouring fuel over fire, as well as a refusal to rule out giving public money to these industries, is a pretty clear reflection that they too are in the pockets of dirty, morally bankrupt fossil fuel corporations. Political donations serve to protect other industries whose social licenses are under threat. Donations to the Liberals, Nationals and the Labour Party from betting companies, for instance, went some way to ensuring that the cruelty of horse racing and greyhound racing goes on unfettered. Then there's the use of public money to shore up a political party's chances of winning elections. We are all familiar with the sports roads, the car park roads, the regional grants roads. This immoral and corrupt pork barreling, with little recrim recrimination from governments, has become just an accepted part of Australian politics, with some politicians excusing or even openly defending it. But we know pork barreling wastes taxpayers' money undermines public trust in political leaders and institutions and does promote a corrupt culture. When ministers leave parliament, this is another way that corruption festers. When ministers leave parliament, they often swing straight into lucrative positions in companies they once regulated, or they swing right back into politics as lobbyists and are paid obscene amounts of money by corporations to influence decisions using their well-established political networks. This revolving door has become normalized across a range of industries, particularly in the fossil fuel industry and in the fields of defense and security, where former officials and public figures move seamlessly into highly paid positions without any apparent concern about conflicts of interest. And I must say that I remain really astounded by the depth and breadth of this corruption. It is so normalized that it goes on right under our noses. If it ever gets brought to light, there have, a, there have been repercussions, resignations, and even jail for some, but so much of it is sanctioned by our lax laws and the well-established web of privileged connections that no one is held accountable for much of it. So it is no wonder that public trust in politics and politicians is low. And it is our job to re-establish that trust. An independent corruption watchdog at the federal level is a big step towards this. And I commend the government for acting quickly on this much needed reform after coming into power. Admittedly, after many, many years of hard campaigning by the Greens. But there is so much more to do Let's ban dirty donations from industries like gambling, fossil fuels, alcohol, and tobacco. Let's stop the revolving door between politics and industry lobbyists. Let's end pork barreling. Because after all, corruption watchdog is only as powerful as the rules that define corruption. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I am pleased to continue to contribute to this debate today on the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill. Author William Gaddis famously said, power doesn't corrupt people, people corrupt power. Establishing a Federal Corruption Commission is our chance to show Australians that people who break the law must face the law. We all agree corruption is wrong and should be stamped out. Indeed, the Coalition introduced Australia's first ICAC in 1988 
However, we should take the time we need and the care we need to get this right, because this commission, once established, will have extraordinary powers. In fact, these powers will be the same as a royal commission, which is why it's so important we get it right. The proposed National Anti-Corruption Commission applies to a vast range of people within Australia, not just parliamentarians and public servants. This commission also covers our defence forces, federal police, the NDIS and aged care workers and any contractor or subcontractor who exercises power under Commonwealth law. What it doesn't cover, however, is union officials who are exercising power under the Commonwealth law. While there is much that is good in this bill, it isn't perfect. Coalition members and senators have engaged at length with the legislation which has helped to shape what we are debating here today. But other aspects discussed by my colleagues during the preparation and writing stage of the bill have not been included. The Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation put forward six consensus recommendations. Coalition committee members presented many additional comments to ensure this bill gets the balance right between stamping out corruption and protecting the rights of the everyday people brought before the body. The Senate Committee on Scrutiny of Bills also suggested extensive recommendations, which highlighted members' concerns around definitions lacking specificity and how coercive powers could be used improperly and without adequate safeguards. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights noted its concerns about how gag orders could be used and their potential impact on the mental health of people brought before the Commission, as well as the broad use of contempt offences. Additionally, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Inquiry into the next proposed telecommunications surveillance has not yet concluded. So at this point, we do not even understand all the implications that will arise from this bill. The Coalition has approached engaging with this bill, as I said, in good faith within Parliament and through the various committee processes, but we still have concerns over some of the measures contained in the bill. To this end, the Coalition proposes amendments that work to balance the extraordinary powers that the NAC will have with fairness and reason. We propose to close a loophole that allows the unions to be above these anti-corruption measures. While the Labor government talks itself up about integrity, allowing the union bosses a free pass when it comes to corruption is, frankly, corrupt. I don't see how someone like CFMMEU Victorian Secretary John Setka should have different standards to adhere to than, say, the NDIS workers who look after the needs of the constituents in my home state of Tasmania. If this legislation is good enough for our defence forces and federal police to be guided by, it's more than good enough for the likes of the union officials who are threatening subcontractors on building sites. We want this bill to have adequate protections for all within its purview, as do experts in this field, like the Law Council of Australia, the Queensland Council of Civil Liberties, the South Australian Bar Association, Australia Institute and the Victorian In Inspectorate. These organisations support the Coalition's efforts to balance the powers in this bill, such as sharing the power to commence a public hearing into a person or organisation between a commissioner and a deputy commissioner. Spreading the power between more than a single official is good governance. And we think it should be compulsory, not optional, for the commissioner to consider certain factors before commencing an investigation. These factors should include considering whether confidential information is involved, whether a person's reputation would be unfairly prejudiced, and whether someone giving evidence is vulnerable, for example, being under direct control of another, when determining whether public hearing should be held. We already know the damage being called by, before a corruption commission can do to someone's reputation. We've seen it across the country, whether they are guilty of corruption or not. We can do better than this. Further, and as highlighted earlier by Senator Henderson, the Commission proposed in this bill has the power to impose gag orders on those appearing before the body to stop them disclosing that they appeared. In the interest of promoting the health and well-being of the people who appear before the Commission, particularly mental health, there should be limited exceptions to this order. These could include the ability to disclose information to an immediate family member, as long as they are not a person of interest in the case or a medical or mental health professional. We need to ensure those who appear before the Commission are not left without a support system and feeling they have nowhere to turn. 
We also proposed a further amendment regarding the repeal of privilege against self-incrimination and legal professional privilege for those who appear. We want to ensure this only comes into effect when absolutely necessary, because the removal of this privilege significantly impacts fundamental rights. The Commission's decision should all be reviewed under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Again, this is good governance, but there are significant aspects in this bill that are not subject to review. Commission investigations cannot go indefinite on indefinitely, so we propose a 12-month time limit on investigations. The Coalition also believes the Commission should only commence an inquiry into matters that happened before it was established if it is in the public interest to do so. Otherwise, we are opening up the opportunity for a never-ending line of unfounded witch hunts. Finally, if we are talking about integrity, we must consider how important bipartisanship is when forming a new body like the proposed NAC. We suggest a three-quarter majority of the parliamentary committee be required for all appointments of commissioner and inspector. Keep in mind that such a body much, must, much, must be supported by all sides of government. Without this support, the public we represent will have no faith in the NAC. The changes will make the proposed NAC a fairer and more just body, which is exactly what is needed when making decisions around corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is a momentous moment to have a National Anti-Corruption Commission being legislated in Australia. Uh, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for his leadership on this, the way that he has engaged uh, from very early on after the election on the principles for the NAC and uh, as more details have been added, his further engagement. I also want to acknowledge the Greens who first introduced the Federal Integrity Commission Bill to the Senate in 2010. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Senator Shoebridge and his work through the committee stages and the way that he's been pushing to ensure that we get the very best possible knack we can. I'd like to acknowledge the former and current mem members for INDI, Kathy McGowan and Helen Haynes, and their unwavering work to both represent their community and to push for more transparency, more integrity uh, and ultimately more accountability for the people who make big decisions that affect all Australians. I'd also like to acknowledge the member for Clark, Andrew Wilkie, uh, a whistleblower himself who has lived experience of, of what whistleblowers face when they do come forward with information that is in the public. Uh, interest, and he has consistently talked about the need for more accountability and transparency. Clearly, in, uh, integrity infrastructure in Australia is far from perfect. Recent <coughs> examples of questionable spending decisions that we've seen in the news and that Australians have been concerned about, the commuter car parks, sports rorts, uh, security contractors and offshore detention centres and water purchases, to name just a few. While members in our communities across the country are struggling, we're seeing decisions on how to spend public money made without transparency or accountability. Communities across this country deserve a strong federal integrity body. They deserve a world-class and world-leading Knack. Integrity was a key issue at the recent election. Door knocking, meeting people across the ACT for politics in the park. Integrity came up again and again. People want to have faith in decision makers. They want to have faith in politicians and the political processes and the public service that are making all these decisions that affect uh, every part of our lives. And it's not just here in the ACT, across the country, Australians overwhelmingly support a strong integrity commission. Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index shows Australia slipped four places from 14th to 18th internationally between 2020 and 2021. Uh, corruption is clearly not new, uh, nor is the need for an integrity 
Commission. Uh, in the face of uh, people seeing what, what they perceive as a widening gulf between them and elected representatives, this is urgent. New South Wales uh, established their ICAC in 1988, and the federal uh, jurisdiction will be the last to establish an equivalent body in Australia. Uh, the delay we've seen has created urgency, but urgency is no excuse for getting parts of this bill wrong. As many before me have highlighted, I would, would like to stress the importance of having public hearings when it's in the public interest for them to take place. Uh, public hearings are an important part of uh, transparency and, and integrity. They encourage new witnesses to come forward. They offer a strong deterrence and they increase public trust. People can see that there is a process underway. Uh, the uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission fact sheet from Labor at the recent election sets out what the now government promised uh, Australians before the election. And uh, there's a number of dot points, uh, all of them powerful and good. One of them does speak to public hearings. And it explains that the NAC will have the power to hold public hearings where the Commission determines it is in the public, in public interest to do so. What did it say? The NAC will have the power to hold public hearings where the Commission determines it is in the public interest to do so. Exceptional circumstances is too high a threshold. To, to put this in, in, in context, in Victoria, where the IBAC has a exceptional circumstances clause, between 2012 and 2021, the Victorian IBAC held just five public hearings. In New South Wales, where they're not limited by exceptional circumstances, they held 45 public hear hearings. If, if exceptional circumstances do not exist, there, there, will, there will be no public hearing, even if it is in the public interest for there to be one. I really don't understand why we are putting the private interests of politicians and officials over the public interest in transparency and accountability. We are now in a situation where Australians have voted for more transparency. The now Labor government promised a na National Anti-Corruption Commission, which we are seeing, but crucially, on a, on, a, on a very crucial element about giving an independent commission against corruption the ability to decide for itself if it's in the public interest to have public hearings, the government is, is, is ham hamstringing them due to a deal with the op now opposition. We've got uh, Attorney General Mark Dreyfus doing a deal with the leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, to stitch this up, which provides more protections for politicians that aren't afforded to people in our community when, when they are found um, you know, corrupt. I understand the desire for consensus, but I, I really believe on this point Integrity is too important. We have to get this right. We have to ensure that an independent commission can decide for itself when it's in the public interest and not add this really high hurdle for them to get over. And many integrity experts, as we heard during the committee process, agree that exceptional circumstances should be removed. The, the National Integrity Committee, the Accountability Roundtable, the Centre for Public in Integrity, Transparency International, leading academics like Professor Anne Toomey have also raised concerns. She says that exceptional circumstances is a very high hurdle. It can confidently be predicted that almost all hearings 
will be in private. As pointed out earlier, we even heard from the Victorian IBAC Commissioner, the Honourable Robert Redlick AM. The NAC must be permitted to hold public examinations without a requirement for exceptional circumstances, so long as there is specific provision that the Commissioner cannot call a witness unless satisfied that is, there is no unreasonable damage to reputation and there will be no damage to the witness's welfare. In surveying people in the ACT about the NAC and what they would like to see, I received a response from Laurie Dunn. Laurie was a public servant for more than 30 years and describes declining standards of integrity and erosion of community trust in politicians and the political process across his 30-year career. To quote Laurie Dunn, a federal anti-corruption commission is essential if we have any hope of re-establishing trust in the federal political process. The current model proposed is acceptable except in relation to public hearings. This should be based on a public interest test and not on an exceptions basis. Corruption thrives when no one is looking. I support an amendment to remove exceptional circumstances. I also believe that parliamentary oversight of the Commission should be strengthened. I note that there are a number of amendments that, that speak to that. To have an independent NAC, we need an impartial parliamentary committee. Currently, as it stands, the government chair will have the casting vote on the Joint Standing Committee on the NAC, which I think means it will be less effective ensuring that the right commissioner is appointed. A, a really important job and clearly important that the government of the day cannot just put who they want if the rest of the parliament doesn't think that they are the best person for the job. There are other concerns which, which I will uh, raise in the committee stage and move amendments. Um, as Helen Haynes moved in the House, I believe the def definition of corruption should include pork <coughs> barrelling. Uh, third parties should be able to be uh, investigated where they act to corrupt public officials who have no knowledge of the attempt, be that through, through tenders or the way that they present uh, in information. And safeguards uh, need to be in there to ensure that the NAC is adequately resourced. There needs to be real transparency around what the NAC is requesting to perform optimally and what is being given to them. As the Attorney General has said, whistleblower protections will be dealt with separately, but I really want to highlight just how crucial this is. Whistleblower protections are fundamental to ensuring integrity. And I really welcome whistleblower reforms to be introduced at the end of this week. And I call on the government to act as quickly as possible to establish a whistleblower protection commissioner and provide whistleblowers with the protection they deserve. There should be really clear processes and pathways for people in the public service, in the, the, the private sector, to come forward with information that may well be politically inconvenient, may be frankly embarrassing for, for Australians, but is crucial if we are to continue to improve the, the open democracy, democracy we have and all the benefits of living in such a system. Uh, this National Anti-Corruption Commission is a huge step in the right direction. Australians have wanted it for some time and I really welcome the introduction of this legislation. Clearly there's more work to be done. This is uh, a start. This is ideally a safety net that doesn't get used much. There is much work to do in terms of cultural change and, and, and uh, driving the right behaviours. And there's clearly more work to be done in, to restore public trust in government. We need whistleblower law reform. We need uh, electoral law reform, uh, truth in political advertising laws. And uh, I urge the government to amend uh, the bill to strengthen this and make this a world leader.
anti-corruption commission, a uh, anti-corruption commission that Australians have asked for and deserve. Thank you, Senator Dan Pocock. Senator White. Acting De Deputy President, as the chair of the Joint uh, Select Committee, which considered and reported on the National Anti-Corruption Commission bills, I've undertaken close consideration of the provisions of the legislation. This work was assisted by the contributions of more than 100 organisations and individuals. The committee heard a wide range of views about certain elements of the proposed National Anti-Corruption Commission, including from unions, civil society, organisations, government departments and academics. What was clear through their written submissions and their testimony is that this legislation has broad-based support in the community. This support was ultimately reflected in the committee's deliberations. The final report tabled contained no dissent about the core aspects of the legislation and the need for a robust and transparent National Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, transparency and accountability formed a key issue in the last election. Over the last decade, Australians' faith in parliamentarians and public officials has been repeatedly undermined by decision-making that failed to prioritise the needs of the community, a point I also made in my first speech. As, as, at a time when the actions of governments are critical to navigating a difficult set of global and local challenges, it's crucial that we restore the public's trust in their elected representatives and the institutions which deliver public services. I believe that the creation of the NAC is a critical piece of the integrity framework which this government is improving across the board. It's the most important integrity reform in decades. The Attorney-General and the government should be commended for prioritising its introduction and subjecting the legislation to scrutiny through the Joint Select Committee. The National Anti-Corruption Commission will, be a, will have sweeping powers to compel individuals to attend hearings and produce documents. Legal privileges, including the privilege against self-incrimination and legal professional privilege, will not provide a basis for a person to refuse to answer the Commission's questions. These measures are important in ensuring that the secrecy and invasive nature of serious and systemic corruption can be pierced. Of course, not everyone who is right. called as a witness will be implicated in the corruption issue, issues. As a, has been the experience of state and territory integrity bodies, it's often the case that a wide range of individuals may um, have knowledge that informs the Commission's investigations. The Joint Select Committee heard that the provisions of the NAC bills were put which prohibited the disclosure of information about attendance at a hearing could unduly impact persons who were called to give evidence. We, re we re therefore recommended that the legislation be amended to allow persons to disclose information about their engagement with the National Anti-Corruption Commission to a mental health professional or other medical practitioner. I'm pleased that the government has proposed amendments to this effect. Several of the witnesses who provided evidence uh, to the committee considered that it was also important that exonerated persons, those investigated but ultimately found not to, be, not to have engaged in serious or systemic corrupt conduct, be notified of that outcome. The committee also therefore recommended that the commissioner be required to notify such individuals where such a conclusion is reached, and the government's amendments reflect this. Anyone can refer a matter to the Commission and he heads of public agencies will have ob obligations to do so as well. The Commissioner can also in investigate matters on the of their own motion, a power which the committee recommended be made more explicit in the legislation and is now enshrined in section 40, 40 subsection 2. A key feature of state and territory based in integrity agencies is the existence of an inspector whose role is to oversee cor corruption commission's work. Different models exist which define the scope of the inspector's role. The committee considered these examples and ultimately recommended that in addition to investigating corruption within the, the National Anti-Corruption Commission and a reactive complaint review function, the inspector should also be tasked with a proactive audit function to look at the NAC's use of coercive powers. This approach is similar to that in the Victorian jurisdiction. The committee heard evidence that this oversight function ensures that the Victorian IBAC is undertaking investigations appropriately. The inspector will ultimately form one part of a broader suite of oversight bodies, including the Commonwealth Ombudsman and a Parliamentary Committee. The government's amendments enhance the power of the inspector regarding witness summonses and arrest warrants. The committee also heard evidence from a number of media organisations, including Australia's Right to Know and the Media and Entertainment and Arts Alliance. The bill contains strong protections for journalist sources, but these 
organisations identified that such protection needed to extend to persons assisting a journalist in their work as a journalist in addition to their employer. The government has amended the bill to ensure any individual who assists a journalist is covered by the protection in Clause 31, including those employed by the same news organisation as the journalist. The government has also taken on board the feedback that the committee received about the power to issue warrants. I welcome the amendment which requires surveillance and interception warrants to be issued by eligible judges of federal superior courts. At its core, the NAC legislation strikes the right balance between giving the Commission significant powers to identify and investigate corruption, while at the same time having due regard to the reputational damage that is, that is a necessary consequence of a corruption investigation. The Commission is empowered to hold public hearings, unlike in some jurisdictions, including South Australia and the Northern Territory, where hearings must be held in private. While the test for public hearing, hearings has been the subject of much debate, I consider that the exceptional circumstances threshold and the re requirement that it must be in the public interest to hold a public hearing will the, give the Commissioner the necessary direction, uh, discretion sorry, to undertake investigations appropriately and transparently. I am confident that when the, the, the National Anti-Corruption Commission commences operations, the public will see that it is an institution with serious teeth and that it has the necessary powers to ensure that serious and systemic cor corrupt conduct at the national level is uncovered. The existence of the National Anti-Corruption Commission is also likely to foster a culture of greater accountability by setting standards of behaviour through its education and preventative functions. The government is restoring public confidence in the parliament and public officials through the introduction of the National Anti-Corruption Commission and a broad integrity reform program, which includes offering greater protections for whistleblowers. I commend this legislation to the Senate. Thank you, Senator White. Uh, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in favour of this very important bill, the An National <coughs> Anti-Corruption Commission Bill. During my election campaign, I spoke with thousands of South Australians across the state, and two issues were most often raised, a need for urgent action on climate change and a lack of trust in politicians and political institutions. South Australians are sick of seeing politicians making decisions based on corporate or personal interest instead of for the benefit of the people who elected them. This is undermining political integrity and causing a crisis in our democracy. We need a national anti-corruption commission, a strong anti-corruption commission, with teeth, serious teeth, as we just heard Senator White say. We need it to restore the health of our democracy and the future of our country. The South Australian community and all Australians must be able to trust our elected representatives, but they can only do this if there is a truly independent, accountable and empowered commission that can get to the bottom of integrity matters, including pork barrelling and dodgy donations. The Greens have strongly advocated for a federal corruption watchdog for over a decade. I thank my colleague, Senator Larissa Waters, for introducing landmark legislation to establish a National Anti-Corruption Commission last year, passed in the Senate but not in the House. Alongside Senator Waters, I note the important advocacy of former senators Bob Brown and Christine Milne, and my colleagues, Senator David Shoebridge and Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, who have all pushed to achieve action in this space. The South Australian community and I are glad to finally see a substantial move to establish and restore integrity in politics. This bill represents a first important good step. It creates a national commission with power to investigate and report on serious or systemic corruption in the federal public sector, including parliament and ministers. The commission will be able to refer evidence of criminal corrupt conduct for prosecution and undertake education and prevention activities. The Greens welcome the establishment and powers of the Commission generally and particularly support its retrospective capacity. However, we have some concerns with the final model that my colleagues will seek to address through amendments. A key concern includes that the bar for public hearings is too high and should not be limited to extraordinary circumstances. Everyday Australians deserve transparency. There are many circumstances where public hearings are appropriate, as so many experts have pointed out. 
Concern about this issue is shared by many South Australians and was a recurring theme among stakeholders who submitted evidence to the inquiry into the bill. We need to go further than this bill permits. While this bill represents a long overdue first step, it is not a silver bullet to restoring democracy. The government must go further to rebuild South Australians and Australians' faith in our political institutions, starting with getting corporate money out of politics. Big corporations and billionaires wield too much power over our parliaments and our politicians. Take, for example, the fossil fuel industry. In recent years, fossil fuel companies have donated millions of dollars to both major parties, including 670,000 to the coalition and 470,000 to Labor in 2020-21. Meanwhile, the latest State of the Climate report, released by CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology, show Australia's climate has warmed on average by 1.7 degrees since 1910. People across Australia are already feeling the impact of this warming and associated changing weather patterns. We've had floods, storms, bushfires and increasing heat waves. This is threatening our farmers, our food production, the Murray-Darling Basin and our livelihoods. Yet at the same time, the government continues to provide millions of dollars in taxpayer-funded handouts to the fossil fuel industry and continues to approve new climate change accelerating gas projects uh, and continues to invest billions of dollars of our own money uh, in fossil fuel companies through Australia's sovereign wealth fund, the ironically named Future Fund. These are signs of a captive state. Coal and gas companies are above all motivated by profit. Time and time again we've seen them prioritise profit over the protection of First Nations cultural heritage, over the health of the environment and over the future of everyday Australians and the kids to come. Just last week, my colleague in the House, Mr Andrew Wilkie, uncovered documents indicating that people in the coal industry had lied about the quality of Australian coal exports by using fraudulent testing. Until we ban political donations from fossil fuel companies and other big corporations, it is impossible to discount the influence they have over government decisions. In sum, this bill to establish a national anti-corruption commission is an important first step one that has come about based on the relentless advocacy of many, including many Greens MPs, as well as mounting community pressure that is too big for the government to ignore. But South Australians elected me with a clear mandate. They want to see politics cleaned up. We must go further to restore the community's faith in our political system. We need to ban all political donations from coal and gas companies and cap other donations to $1,000 a year. We must end the revolving door between politicians and big business by stopping ministers from taking cushy industry jobs directly after leaving parliament. We need to reform political advertising laws and we need to fund the Australian National Audit Office to audit all government programs to stop the rorting of public funds our public funds. It is essential that our elected representatives and political institutions work for the benefit of the people and not the profit of big corporations and billionaires. This bill is a first and important step along that path and it will go a long way towards reassuring Australians about the integrity of politics. We need to start there and we need to go further. Thank you. Thank you Senator Pocock. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support this bill. Shoddy governance is Australia's greatest problem and biggest threat. The absence of data in making policies and legislation. Some parties go to great lengths to avoid data and substitute instead emotion. That is partly corruption. But this bill that we are discussing today goes to real corruption illegal corruption. Initially, I thought Parliament contained the procedures for self-accountability. After two years, I realised I was wrong. Then I started participating enthusiastically in presentations and discussions in this building and outside around a National Crime and Corruption Commission. And I thank the many people who I listened to, lawyers, judges, former judges, everyday Australians concerned about corruption. 
I appreciate the conversations that I had with former Senator Bill Heffernan. I realised when I spoke out about the fact that we need to have a commission in place to provide oversight of four main groups. Federal members of parliament, federal bureaucrats and public servants, federal judges and federal police. So now I turn to the government's proposal. For too long, corruption in government has been almost impossible to deal with because current protections are totally inadequate. Each state has a body to deal with corruption at state levels of government. All the state bodies, though, face jurisdictional and evidential hurdles. Whistleblower protections, particularly for private sector whistleblowers, have failed to provide assumed protections. In recent years, many whistleblowers have had their lives and or careers publicly and privately trashed, destroyed. Some have faced criminal charges or been destroyed financially through civil actions. Integrity as an expected attribute of those in public office has been invisible and left to chance. That lack of integrity destroys trust, the people's trust in governance of this country. This bill, when passed with appropriate amendments, will go a long way towards setting up a workable scheme ensuring that integrity becomes a fundamental feature of our legislature and executive arms of government. To get this bill right, a number of issues need to be addressed through internal and external or external amendment. One thing this bill does not address is third party corrupt conduct, where the person being dealt with is an otherwise innocent public official dragged unknowingly into a circle of corruption. This is a scenario included within the jurisdictions of most state anti corruption bodies, except Tasmania and Western Australia. To be comprehensive, the bill must include this scenario to ensure that corruption, even involving innocent public officers, can still be investigated for corruption. This bill, it's important to understand, this bill is not designed to be purely or only punitive. It's much more than that. It's designed to get to the root cause of corrupt processes and practices and systems and to rectify, to eliminate and prevent corruption and to systematically do that and systematically prevent corruption. This provision will assist in identifying relationships vulnerable to abuse and exploitation so that processes may be introduced to provide effective risk management and oversight and accountability. This will be an alternative to relying on the ability to satisfy the restrictive requirements of proving crime beyond reasonable doubt. That's highly restrictive. We need better than that. Another power that should be clarified in the bill is the Commission's power to commence investigations of its own volition without being reliant on external referrals from other agencies or individuals. This clarification would ensure that the source of complaints or information does not limit the full ambit of justification for investigations. Now, the issue of public hearings has challenged those in favour generally of establishing this commission. It's been suggested that holding public hearings may expose a person to vilification of their reputation when potentially otherwise there may be insufficient evidence to establish an offence. People are worried that this will be used as a mechanism to turn into unjustifiable political witch hunts, as we've seen in some of the states. Previously, this was one of my concerns and was the reason for my rejection in its earlier form. To address this, the bill indicates that hearings may be held in private unless the commissioner is satisfied that exceptional circumstances, exceptional circumstances, as it says in the bill, justify holding the hearing in public and it's in the public interest to do so. The phrase exceptional circumstances, if included in the bill, would make it virtually impossible to hold public hearings as it will require a court to determine whether circumstances are in fact exceptional. That's a lawyer fest for sure. The removal of the requirement of exceptional circumstances is essential. And there are proposed amendments before the Senate that would fix this problem. I support these amendments. It would be appropriate that if a public hearing is held, the commissioner or a deputy commissioner should be presiding because they are legally qualified to deal with the more obvious legal issues. Another concern raised with me is the composition of the proposed parliamentary joint committee, where the chair is required to be a member of the government. Now, this raises questions on the independence of the joint committee 
And a better solution may be that the chair should not be a member of a political party forming government, or should at least be a person enjoying bipartisan support of the committee. It's important that an extensive whistleblower protection authority be established to ensure protection for genuine disclosures. The government assures me that the introduction of such an authority is imminent and an essential supportive element of this bill's operation. Next, I raise what um, Senator Bill Heffernan has raised with me in extensive discussions and also personal discussions and also um, senior judges and practitioners of the law. It's important that an extent, it's an, what's missing from this bill is the jurisdiction to overview the misconduct and actions of the judiciary. This option is desperately needed, and there is information showing that this jurisdiction has been overlooked for far too long. It needs to be included. It must be included. It would be welcome to think that our judges are all free from human weaknesses, but they're human. In practice, that's not a realistic conclusion that they are free from human weaknesses. Judges are human and susceptible to the human frailties that may lead to misconduct in their offices. We know that. The judiciary must have a mechanism that provides independent review of the conduct of its members. I look forward to the development of a bill to cover judges and senior police and associated amendments to strengthen the safeguards designed to protect our society from evildoers hiding behind public office, a bill the government has flagged with us. The Australian public deserves protection and reassurance. The people deserve integrity. To be effective, government must be trusted. We do not have trust in governance at the moment, but that's what we need. We have one flag above this building, one flag for the nation. We are one community, we are one nation, and we support the integrity of our political representatives and public officers whose duty is one of service to the people. Our duty is of service to the people. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Sir Roberts. Sir, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to rise to speak in support of the National Anti-Corruption <coughs> Commission Bill 2022 and the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. This is something that the Greens have been campaigning for for a very, very long time. And we welcome the adoption of that proposal by this parliament. I want to particularly thank the tireless work of my colleague, Senator Waters, in campaigning for a National Anti-Corruption Commission, a watchdog with teeth. Her bill establishing a federal anti-corruption body was the first one to pass one of our Houses of Parliament, and it sets an important precedent for the bill that is before us today. The Greens, as well as pushing for a national anti-corruption body, have been pushing for greater scrutiny and accountability across the parliament on integrity, transparency and appropriate expenditure of government funds, which is why we will continue to push for political donations reform. We will continue to push for greater transparency and stronger limits on donations so that fossil fuel donations can't buy more fossil fuel subsidies and destructive in industries like gambling can't buy policy outcomes that reap them profits and increase misery for so many for so long. It's also why, in my role at various points as Green spokesperson for sport and for infrastructure, that I pushed for greater transparency around the community sports infrastructure program, the so-called sports rorts, and around the Urban Congestion Fund. And let me note that in talking about this tonight, I'm not in any way wanting to preempt the important work of the NAC, but simply to say that we Greens think that it's important because the last parliament showed both the power of the Senate in scrutinising these programs, but also the limitations. As deputy chair of the Joint Select Committee on the Administration of Sports Grants, I saw firsthand the important evidence that the committee exposed. The committee found, and I'm quoting, overwhelming evidence shows that Senator Mackenzie and her office, in consultation with the sport Prime Minister's office, used the Community Sports Infrastructure Grant Program as a vehicle for gaining political advantage for coalition candidates in the 2019 federal election by favouring applicants located in marginal and targeted electorates. The evidence available to the committee indicates clearly 
that the Prime Minister's office and likely the Prime Minister were aware of the use of electorate information to identify projects in marginal and targeted electorates well before the first grant recipient was announced. And we saw through that inquiry that despite attempts by former Prime Minister Scott Morrison to place all the blame on then Minister Mackenzie, the reality was that his office was very aware of the decision-making process, if not deeply involved in it. And the committee also heard clear evidence about the impact of that decision-making process. We heard from community groups across the country who had spent hours, days, weeks preparing their applications, only to find that their intense work didn't matter as much as the postcode lottery as to whether they fell in a marginal electorate. And these were groups that, after the department had judged their application, they were right there at the top of the list in terms of how appropriate it was that they should be getting grant funding. They scored extremely highly but missed out because of that postcode lottery, because of the favouring of marginal and targeted electorates. And I know from my time in local government as a councillor and mayor how heartbreaking it can be to see your community missing out on crucial infrastructure because you're a safe seat. Nobody's throwing large S and dollars at you. You're a safe seat, taken for granted by one party and ignored by the other. And importantly, during the sports rights inquiry, there was information that we were not able to obtain through the Senate process, because on crucial points, Conservative crossbenchers voted with the Liberal National Party government to deny access to critical information. And some of that information we are still waiting on for the Information Commissioner to process long overdue freedom of information appeals. So, as I said, we showed the power of the Senate but also the limitations and why we need to have an anti-corruption commission that won't be limited by those limitations that we have here in the Senate. And as the Select Committee noted in its final report, the committee has faced significant obstruction in its attempts to gather evidence that would explain who was involved and responsible for grant decisions, including the extent of involvement of the Prime Minister and others. What were the reasons for decisions and whether those decisions were made in accordance with the law? I mean, that was important work by that committee, but my experience and that experience really highlighted and underlined the importance of an anti-corruption body and how desperately we need one. So I commend this bill and echo the support of my colleagues for this important reform. It has been a long time coming and we are glad to see it finally being done. Uh, that was you, Senator Minister. Well, this is um, uh, a very significant uh, development uh, in uh, in the chamber now. The reaching the conclusion uh, of uh, the second reading debate. Now, I do remember um, the uh, the last governments being dragged kicking and screaming to the conclusion that uh, that it should uh, introduce. A Federal Integrity Commission, and I remember how long it took to drag the government uh, to that conclusion. It took uh, a series of uh, absolutely extraordinary perversions of uh, the role of ministers uh, in public office. Uh, it took it took the uh, sports rorts affair, uh, where the government uh, used public monies. Uh, used grant monies in a way that was clearly, shamelessly political. Uh, it used public monies in a way that was, uh, that was uh, uh, utterly in the partisan interest. Uh, there, were, there were other examples over the course of the Morrison period. Of course, it fit, it fit with the Prime Minister who centralised power in his office to the extent that he had cabinet committees of one uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure that, uh, that information was kept uh, secret, uh, covered up, 
an extraordinary development. At no time in the history of Federation did we ever have cabinet committees that consisted of one. We had a Prime Minister who engaged in conduct where, in order to uh, pervert the processes of government, he had himself appointed secretly to at least five ministerial positions. Um, so no wonder there is out there in the community a deep distrust of political institutions. Uh, and at this period, uh, more than any other period in our history, we need to take steps in terms of our own conduct as parliamentarians and as public officials, but also in terms of the framework that we set out to deliver uh, a, a Federal Integrity Commission uh, that supports the proper administration of public affairs uh, in this country and assist to restore, uh, assist to restore uh, confidence from the public in the operations of this parliament and in the operations of the Commonwealth Government. Uh, now, the last government promised to deliver a commission. Uh, in fact, some of the, some of the aspects of the uh, bill that they are currently opposing, uh, they proposed themselves uh, the last time around. And I'm sure that in the uh, committee stage tomorrow we'll hear much more, much more about that. Um, what, um, what the last government patently failed to do was to actually bring legislation before the parliament. What the last government failed to do was to deliver on the commitment uh, that they had made to the Australian people to deliver, to deliver the, uh, the legislation that they had made a commitment to do. It was a central issue. It was a central issue uh, in the last election. Uh, and whether members of the House of Representatives were returned to the parliament uh, on the Labor side, uh, or in some of the electorates where members were returned who were independents, one of the things, one of the factors that drove uh, voters was a requirement that, uh, that, uh, the, that, that they knew that they could have confidence uh, that a new Albanese Labor government would, uh, would deliver and would implement uh, an integrity commission uh, that would in implement an integrity commission with teeth and would implement an integrity commission that would do its job. Uh, and, and what we're what we're seeing today is a government that's done two things. It's delivered upon its commitment. It's delivered upon the commitment that it made, but it's also a government that's resolved to work across the parliament with goodwill and try and make sure that working across the parliament that we are delivering a national anti-corruption commission that is fit for purpose and has broad support, uh, is durable, effective uh, and can do its job. Now, some some political commentators, some members of the public have asked questions, some of them very well motivated, about what kind of matters the Commission will uh, investigate. What kind of hearings will it, will it, uh, will it, what, what kind of hearings will it conduct? And of course, and of course, uh, those, those matters will be guided by two things, as my friend from the Greens, Mr. Senator Shoebridge, has indicated. He's got some views. But it will, be, uh, it will be delivered by two things. One is the framework, but the second, most important, is the independence of the Commissioner himself. Uh, if you'll Order. give me a moment, uh, President, I'll just consult. <laughs> <laughs> the delights of my week. Uh, this, <laughs> this, this opportunity to contribute unsolicited to this, uh, to this debate. 
And I'm sure, I'm sure the Senate's been, been delighted uh, to get the benefit of my views on this over the course of the last nine minutes. I understand that there are now other senators who may wish to contribute, and on that basis, I'll happily take my seat. <laughs> now, uh, the, the minister has summed up, but, but I will go to uh, uh, Senator, Senator Lambie if, uh, if uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, I'll go to Senator Lambie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Do I need to request leave to speak? Uh, you, well, you've, you've got leave. Go for it. Thank you very much. Imagine that. Speaker's list falling and uh, wouldn't have anything to do with those exceptional circumstances. I thought all 76 of us would be running in here, happy to speak about this, throwing it out there, see how great it is, how disappointing. I can tell you this bill has been a long time coming. Thank you, Helen Haynes. What a wonderful job you've done. And it is far from perfect. But when Senator Tyrrell and I had a look at it, we said to each other, it's not perfect, it could be better. But is there any way in the world we'd vote it down? It's not a question that even needs asking, because that's the thing about this bill, and it's the thing about being in the crossbench. Most of the time, we don't get to decide between the perfect and the imperfect. We deal in shades of grey, I can assure you. Fifty shades of grey is no shame to what dealing with shades of grey in here looks like. There's a whole lot of grey here, and this isn't everything it could be. You could say it's not everything it should be. But it's something, and that's a hell of a lot more than what we'd have if we voted this down. Because governments don't like changing their own bills if they can avoid it, even if it means making them better. And when you've got an opposition that's shivering in their boots about, this, what, about what this bill would end up looking like if the crossbench had had their way with it, you'd have a recipe for a free kick. That's what we have here. The Liberals and Nationals don't want a strong National Anti-Corruption Commission because they don't want a strong National Anti-Corruption Commission coming after them. And that's what's happening here. They're so terrified that they're going to vote to defang this thing before it even gets out of the kennel. That's why they're voting with the government to make it harder for the Commission to do anything. This is what the public needs to understand about this Anti-Corruption Commission. We only hear about Anti-Corruption Commissions when they're in the process of busting corrupt politicians and bureaucrats. And if you're corrupt, you should be busted. It's good that state anti-corruption commissions are onto them. But actually, the real value in these commissions isn't what they do to politicians, it's what they do to the public. You see, it's what the public thinks about politicians that matters to politicians. And you can say, of course it is. They're all as bad as each other. But politicians care about what the public thinks in good times and in bad. And believe it or not, you should care as well. Because whenever there's a big problem, one that requires politicians to fix, it's hard to do. It's hard to do that when the public thinks politicians are all a pack of so-and-sos. If nobody trusts politicians, but we're relying on politicians to fix things, what do we do when one of them comes up with a fix? We, sound, we say, <laughs> sounds way too good to be true here, we say, what's in it for them? We say they can't be trusted, so we shouldn't support it. If you can't trust politicians, you don't get solutions from politicians, because politicians can't do anything if you don't trust them to get the job done. There's a certain degree of trust that, that's required to make big reforms. You need to trust that. When things look a bit uncertain, there's a plan in place, because sometimes reforms break things. Sometimes you have to break a few things to get to a better place. Life was never meant to be easy. Welcome to the real world. There's always that bit, that bit where mid-jump, when you're not rising, you're not falling, you're just hanging mid-air in standstill, and it's not, it's not clear whether you're going to land it. It's right then that you need the confidence that comes from knowing that you're in good hands. So politicians rely on that trust when they want to make a big change. It's the trust that made the gun buyback possible, the GST, the NDIS, the Price and Income Accord. You don't get big changes without trust that the people making those changes have your best interests at heart. And that's what we have lost like a trickle out of the bottom of a leaky bucket, slow and steady. Slowly but surely, it's drained out of this place and the people who sit in it. People think we're all corrupt, by the way. 
They think we're all up to our necks in the gravy train and we're just lapping up the donations and the dodgy deals. And sometimes they have a great point. But most people aren't crooks. Most people here, most people are just here to try and have an honest crack at making people's lives better. And when we lose trust in them, my, my word, we lose out ourselves. That's why we need an anti-corruption, that's why we need anti-corruption commissions. Because just knowing there's a cop on the beat is supposed to make us safer, even if we never need them. And by the way, they are a deterrent to make you think twice. Seeing them haul in a bad politician every now and then reminds us that they're out there doing their job. But the rest of the time, we've got to have confidence that if there's something dodgy going on, it'll be sniffed out and caught and punished. That's what the point of an anti-corruption commission is supposed to be. Not just putting bad politicians up in the docks, but actually reassuring the rest of us that the ones who aren't doing anything wrong are actually doing a decent job and giving it a go. Any anti-corruption commission which is focused just on catching dodgy politicians misses the point. Because if all we see is a conga line of dodgy pollies getting hauled into the National Anti-Corruption Commission, we don't have any confidence that politicians are in it for the right reason at all. That's what, hap that's what can happen as well. After a while, the public loses track of which politicians corrupt and which one isn't. And after a while, the whole brand just goes sour. Just being in the same building, just being in the same building, tars all of us with the same brush. So a really important part of the anti-corruption commission has to be the ability for the commission to promote trust. It has to have a role to play in putting itself out of business, because we all know we need a federal ICAC, and what we want is a is a world where we where we'd never need one. It'd be a perfect world, wouldn't it? That might be hard to imagine. Even I find it difficult. Believe me, you, me. But that's what we want. That's the position we want to be in. We want a parliament filled with politicians who aren't afraid of an anti-corruption commission because they have, would you guess it, absolutely nothing to hide. Absolutely nothing to hide. And my word, I think we need to be brutally honest with ourselves. We are miles away from that when it comes to public trust. We've got a parliament where the two major parties are terrified of one. They've both been effectively bullied into supporting one by the public who are sick and tired of both of them. And now they've got the chance to actually deliver it. So what do they do? A little deal behind closed doors, not helping with trust, to make the NAC do its business behind closed doors as well. Seriously, not off to a good start. Because you know why they're worried about their reputations, apparently, and I don't know why if they've got nothing to hide. Here's an idea. If you're worried about what sort of damage to your reputation a public hearing might do, maybe make sure you don't give the knack a reason to pull you in front of it in the first place. There's a plan of attack. How about that? So we've got the Crossbench Bank and in Backing and Integrity Commission. That works. And we've got the major parties voting together to prevent it. And in spite of that, I'm going to vote for it because I'll take a bad knack over what we've had in the past few years. We've had the former Prime Minister put his former Chief, uh, Chief of Staff in charge of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, then ask his old Chief of Staff to investigate any accusation of corruption that's hanging around the necks of his ministers. Well, I think we need a better setup than that. We need a better anti-corruption system that just having the Prime Minister's former staffer doing a little report to how everything's fine and dandy, nothing to see here. And a flawed knack is better than no knack. It's the knack that's been knackered, let's be honest. But it can be fixed. It'll have to wait to be fixed. But you can build a foundation, at least we've got that. And you have to start somewhere. And I want to start here. We've got two major parties with the most fear, of fear from a knack who are both voting to make it a bit less frightening, to remove its fangs, as I've already said. I'm not sure it's quite the jaws that the AG promised, but anyway. So I'm telling you now, 
That won't last. It'll get stronger. That's my prediction. And we'll get a decent knack sooner or later because the public do not trust you. And the public will demand it be strengthened. As simple as that. While you're hiding behind closed doors, that will not satisfy the appetite of the Australian public. It will not satisfy it at all. It won't even get to the entree. And you will promise to strengthen it because you'll have no choice, because you'll need their votes. This is how we work. It's going to be a very, very slow process here. But we will get there. I just know it. Cute little arguments like the one you've done on this are not helping the situation. I'll be brutally honest with you. It has not helped reinstate public trust, nor throwing things behind closed doors when politicians are being corrupt will help the situation either. As a matter of fact, to build trust in the public, and you, because apparently none of us have got anything to hide in here, what is the problem? Can't you defend yourselves? Seriously. It has got to this. Anyway, so Senator Tyrrell and I, we took a look at the amendments and we'll back the ones that make sense. But I can tell you at the end of this debate, when we're asked to vote yes or no, we'll vote yes. No matter if all the amendments get up or none of them get up, we'll vote yes. Because we are done talking about this. And seriously, at least there's a foundation there. The only thing left remaining is you'll, build, you'll need to build the house that goes on it, roof, chimney and all. Because only then, only then, Will public trust return to politicians? Only then will that happen. I can only hope that the NAC uses their ability when it says in exceptional circumstances should it be in public, that everything should be exceptional circumstances. Because there is, if there is corruption here, I can assure you exceptional circumstances need to be used to play it out in the public arena because it needs to be used as a deterrent and people need to be held responsible for their actions. That is grassroots. That is the Australian way. That is the way things should be done. So as much as we are grateful to get something which is better than nothing, I can tell you now, it is a long way off being satisfactory. And once again, I look very, very forward to who those commissioners are and hoping and putting trust in them that they know what I do, to build back public trust and reputation of politicians, those who deserve to be hauled out in front and through the knack, deserve to be pulled in. And that should be played out in the public arena because that is in the public interest. That is in the public interest to build public trust back in this country of politicians. And that's where I want to see it going. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. I rose to speak on the National Corruption Commission Bill. For too long, politicians have done dodgy things in this place and gotten away with it. Politicians have raked in money from private businesses while serving as ministers. Politicians and their families have benefit, benefited from insider knowledge for their own gain. Politicians have given jobs to their mates, who later make decisions in their favour, and politicians have pork-barrelled marginal communities for votes. Politicians have thrown whistleblowers under the bus to protect their own behinds. And these things don't pass the pub test. Not only that, but they could be corrupt conduct. The people who are deciding the future of this country could be engaging in conduct that benefits themselves and their mates rather than the country. It's risky business. It's not in the national interest. Of course, we have to do something to change this. Until now, we haven't held people who work in the federal public sector to account for what could be corrupt conduct. Well, time's up. One of the messages that the voters of Australia sent in May was to establish a national anti-corruption commission. The voters of Australia wanted their elected representatives to establish a strong and transparent integrity body. Why? Because the voters of Australia want to know when their elected representatives are doing dodgy things. 
They don't want their elected representatives to get away with it anymore. The voters of Australia also wanted to know when the public servants who work for the government of the day are doing dodgy things. That's hard-earned taxpayer dollars that public officials could be misusing. Engaging in corrupt conduct doesn't cut the mustard in the voters' workplace. Why should we be any different? I'm happy this government is acting on the message the electorates have sent. I'm happy this government has moved quickly to introduce this legislation. The National Anti-Corruption Commission the government has proposed looks pretty good, <coughs> but I think it could be better. There are a few things I'd like to see changed. One of those things is the fact that hearings would be held in public only in exceptional circumstances. What does that even mean? The bill doesn't define it. And at the moment, the bill says that public hearings will only be held if the commissioner thinks there are exceptional circumstances to justify it, and it's in the public interest. You know what? I don't think that's good enough. What's there to hide? Like I said before, the voters of Australia want to know when their elected representatives and the public servants that carry out their work are doing dodgy things. How are they going to know if this how are they going to know this if a hearing is held in private? Don't get me wrong, I don't think all hearings should be public. Sometimes it's appropriate to have private hearings, like when a person has been charged with an offence or when a person is likely to incriminate themselves or if giving evidence in public would prejudice a fair trial, or where there'd be undue damage to a person's career or reputation. That all makes sense. But the bar for public hearings that the bill sets at the moment is way too high. Dr Anne Twomey told the Joint Select Committee on National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation that under the bill in its current form, almost all hearings will be in private. I'm pretty sure that wasn't what people voted for. I reckon that's more like what the coalition promised, and I don't see them in government anymore. What the government has forgotten is that people voted for an integrity body that was open, transparent and that had teeth. That's why we put forward some amendments to remove the high exceptional circumstances bar. We aren't moving our amendments because the Greens have their own, which, is, which are similar, and we support it. The Greens have done a lot of work on this issue, and they've put forward some other amendments. Their amendments would make the Commission stronger and more transparent. One of their amendments is to specify that the Commission be independent, and that's a bit of a no-brainer. I'm happy to support amendments like this. Senator Pocock has also put forward some amendments that strengthen the Commission, and this is what people voted for. We support those as well. Finally, I just want to say that I'm happy to be a part of a parliament that is doing something about corruption in the federal public sector. I may be a new senator, but I've been around Parliament House for a while now, and I've seen some questionable things that should have gone under the microscope, some things that were pretty obvious too. The establishment of an integrity body was one of my priorities going into this election, and I'm proud to be part of a parliament that's doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell, Minister. Um, thank you, President, and I thank all senators for their contribution uh, to the debate on these bills. Uh, a number of senators have made the point that they are supportive of this legislation um, and supportive of the establishment of a national anti-corruption commission, regardless of views they may, may hold about particular amendments that have been uh, foreshadowed in this debate. Uh, and I welcome the fact that there is such a broad level of support for a National Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, I don't think that there's any doubt that this is something the Australian public has been wanting to see happen for a very long time. And it is unfortunate that it has taken as long as it has uh, to see a government prepared to step up and introduce legislation into a parliament uh, that will establish a strong National Anti-Corruption Commission to deliver on that community expectation of the way we conduct politics. Uh, there have been too many events in recent years uh, that have not passed the pub test uh, as far as the community is concerned, and the fact that we haven't had a National Anti-Corruption Commission uh, has allowed bad behaviour, wrong behaviour and indeed corrupt behaviour to go on for far too long at the national level in this country. So I'm pleased to be part of a government that is finally stepping up to the plate 
uh, and delivering a strong national anti-corruption commission in response to that community sentiment. So, as I say, the government is pleased to support the passage of the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. This legislation will establish a powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission. These bills incorporate the design principles that the government announced before the election, which were developed with some of Australia's leading integrity advocates. And I really want to pay tribute uh, to the people who have been advocating this cause, establishing a National Anti-Corruption Commission for so long. Uh, people like uh, Professor Anne Toomey, uh, who recognises that, in her words, this bill appears to be well considered and applies appropriate powers and protections. People like the Accountability Roundtable, who says that this bill creates the NAC, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, an important proactive reform of existing integrity mechanisms worthy of widespread support. Uh, people like Transpar or groups like Transparency International Australia, who congratulates the government on proposing a definition of corrupt conduct to define the Commission's investigative jurisdiction, which is simpler, broader, more flexible and less technical than most previous Australian precedents. Uh, and there are so many more that I could name who have been campaigning for the establishment of a National Anti-Corruption Commission for many years. And again, I pay tribute to their efforts. The Commission will operate independently of government and have broad jurisdiction to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct across the Commonwealth public sector. It will have the power to investigate ministers, parliamentarians and their staff, statutory office holders, employees of all government entities and contractors. It will have discretion to commence inquiries on its own initiative or in response to referrals from anyone, including members of the public and whistleblowers. Referrals can be anonymous. It will be able to investigate both criminal and non-criminal corrupt conduct and conduct occurring before or after its establishment. It will have the power to hold public hearings. It will also have a mandate to prevent corruption and educate Australians about corruption. And in a number of respects, the model that the government is putting forward for a National Anti-Corruption Commission go well beyond any other proposal we have seen from a federal government in our country. Uh, having much wider power as to the range of people whose behaviour can be investigated, much wider power to initiate inquiries on its own initiative. Uh, I always thought it was farcical um, that the proposal we saw from the former government um, would only allow investigations of matters referred to a commission by the government of the day, because as if any government would refer matters that it didn't want investigated to an anti-corruption commission. And it's important, therefore, that the model that we're putting forward and that this parliament will support allows the National Anti-Corruption Commission to commence inquiries on its own initiative. Uh, a parliamentary joint committee will oversee the commission and will be empowered to require the commission to provide information about its performance. These bills have been further refined with the benefit of the public inquiry and unanimous report of the Joint Select Committee on National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation. And on that note, I'd like to thank the Chair, Senator Linda White, the Deputy Chair, the Member for Indi, Dr Helen Hames, uh, members of the committee and all those who made submissions and gave evidence to the committee's inquiry. Uh, not having played a role in that inquiry myself, um, I was really impressed uh, that that Joint Select Committee was able to come to unanimous recommendations, uh, given it did span all sides of this parliament, uh, whether it be the major parties or independents as well. And for such a contentious issue um, that has not been acted on prior, previously in this parliament, for that committee to come to a unanimous report, I think, uh, was a tremendous effort. And again, I commend the members of the committee for the work that they did there. The committee has made six unanimous recommendations, which the government welcomes, and we have moved amendments to implement those recommendations. 
uh, the House of Representatives has passed this bill with those amendments. The National Anti-Corruption Commission will operate independently of government and have broad jurisdiction to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct across the Commonwealth public sector. It will have the power, as I've said, to investigate ministers, parliamentarians and their staff, statutory office holders, employees of all government entities and contractors. Uh, and as I say, it goes further than any model we have seen previously in having discretion to commence inquiries on its own initiative or in response to referrals from anyone. It will be able to investigate both criminal and non-criminal corrupt conduct and conduct occurring before or after its establishment. And this is something that has attracted some uh, public debate, whether it was right to have a corruption commission uh, with retrospective powers. And I think it is important that a national anti-corruption commission does so, just as it's important that a national anti-corruption commission has the power to commence inquiries on its own initiative, to not be constrained by the government of the day as to what it can investigate. Uh, but to be truly independent of government and have the capacity to make its own decisions about what it would investigate. And equally, it is important that we have a National Anti-Corruption Commission that has retrospective powers uh, to look at things that have occurred in the past, as well as right now and, the, and in the future. The whole principle of this National Anti-Corruption Commission is that it operates independently of government. It shouldn't be tied by the government of the day as to what it can and can't investigate or who it can and can't investigate, or the time period that it can and can't investigate. The important principle that underpins this National Anti-Corruption Commission is that it will have the power to investigate serious and systemic corrupt conduct. Uh, that's the linchpin. Uh, if behaviour in the Commission's view amounts to that, then it should have the power to investigate, regardless of who it involves, uh, provided they're obviously connected to the Commonwealth, uh, regardless of when it occurred, uh, and regardless of people like whether it's investigating it or not. Um, so we've been asked, uh, and I've certainly heard the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, asked many times in the media whether the Commission should investigate this or should investigate that, and he's rightly made the point that these are all matters for the Independent Anti-Corruption Commission. Establishing this Anti-Corruption Commission is a very important step in trying to restore public confidence in our system of government uh, and, in, and in what happens in this building. And I think we all know, and even members of the opposition will acknowledge privately, um, that public trust in politics and public trust in the Australian government was eroded over the last few years by a series of scandals that we saw with no public agency in existence at a federal government with the capacity to investigate those matters. So the very worst thing that we could do now that this parliament is finally creating a National Anti-Corruption Commission is tie its hands as to the type of conduct which could be investigated, the people who could be investigated or the time period uh, that could be investigated. So leaving these things open uh, for the Commission to make its own mind up uh, are important in themselves as ways of maintaining and rebuilding public confidence in how politics works in this country and how governments work in this country. Uh, the bill will ensure uh, appropriate oversight of the Commission by a parliamentary joint committee and an inspector. The parliamentary joint committee will be empowered to require the Commission to provide information about its work. The committee will also be responsible for approving the appointments of the Commissioner, the Deputy Commissioners and the Inspector. The Inspector will deal with any corruption issues arising in the Commission and complaints about the Commission and will review and determine the extent of compliance with the law by the Commission when exercising the, pa the power to issue a summons or, a West warrant, or, or an arrest warrant. Um, I know uh, from the activities of state anti-corruption commissions that they do have very extensive powers, and that is only right. Um, these are important issues that we need a strong independent commission to have the power to properly investigate. Uh, but it is important that those powers themselves aren't misused by an anti-corruption commission, and that's why this bill also provides for the position of an inspector uh, who will have the ability um, to review at the activities of the commission and ensure that it's not overstepping its boundaries th themselves. 
Um, the legislation ensures that there are appropriate safeguards against undue reputational damage and provides robust protections for whistleblowers, journalists and persons assisting a journalist. Uh, it is, in, of course, important that people who want to make complaints to a uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission um, do have protection uh, for doing so, uh, but equally um, that there are safeguards against undue reputational damage when it comes to um, the publication of information uh, concerning the Commission's activities. The government has committed substantial funding of $262 million over four years for this Commission. And this funding will ensure the Commission has the staff, capabilities and capacity to perform its important functions. The National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill makes consequential amendments to the Commonwealth Statute Book to support the establishment of the Commission. The Consequential Bill will ensure the Commission has key investigative powers and has the ability to share and receive information for the purpose of carrying out its functions. The Consequential Bill will also repeal the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act 2006 and provide transitional arrangements for the continuation of investigations and inquiries being conducted by the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity following the establishment of the Commission. Australians rightly expect honesty, accountability and integrity in government. And as I say, sadly, those qualities have been lacking from Australian politics and the Commonwealth Government for far too long. It's time that we restored honesty in politics. It's time that we restored accountability in Australian politics. And it's time that we restored integrity in Australian politics. And this bill, creating a National Anti-Corruption Commission, will go a long way towards that. The National Anti-Corruption Commission will form an essential part of Australia's broader integrity framework. We have established robust codes of conduct for ministers and ministerial staff, and we are working across the parliament to implement the Set the Standard report from Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. We are committed to enhancing transparency and integrity of political donations. The government is developing reforms to the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Rule 2014 to require agencies to take measures to prevent, detect and deal with corruption, which will complement the establishment of the Commission. The, the Attorney-General has also announced that the government will be introducing priority reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 to improve whistleblower protections, with the aim of having these reforms in place when the Commission commences operation. With these bills to establish powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission, the government is delivering on its promise to tackle corruption and restore trust and integrity to public institutions. As I say, there have been too many scandals, there have been too many rorts, there have been too many things that Australians have just shaken their head at uh, when it comes to the use of Commonwealth funds and the behaviour of certain Commonwealth officials. This bill, the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill, is the start of turning that tawdry episode in Australian politics around. I commend the bill to the House, to the Thank Chamber. Thank you, Minister. The debate on the second reading of the bills has concluded. The vote on the second reading will take place tomorrow. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again at midday tomorrow. <laughs>